as soon as possible. Um, I'll just get that up. So, okay, so someone asked, what's it like day to day at Hartford? Would you like to take this? Raya, do you want to take this? Um, yeah, so I think one of the things I really loved about Hartford as a fresher was the fact that with this um, relatively small central campus, although there's a lot of people like day to day in Hartford, you see a lot of people, even if you're not kind of going out of your room. So even if I was just spending the day just kind of going to my lectures and then going back to my room to do some work, I would still be like bumping into people in the quad and being able to like talk to other people um, and have a little bit of interaction. I think that kind of really helps Hartford have quite a friendly feel to it. Perfect. Does anyone else have anything to add? I'll add something. <laughs> Um, so I think it's just a really chill place. I think obviously when we come to uni, you know, come to study and we've also come to find ourselves or whatever. But also it's just a, it's just a really nice place to like just get to know like a nice group of people who are in the same position as you. And um, I think it's very inclusive as well. Like when I came in, I was just like, oh, this is not like what I expected. But yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Annie. Okay, so the second question is, do most people spend, do people spend most of their time studying? Imogen, do you want to answer this? Yeah, um, I would say that, yes, it is probably like most of the time, because that is like what you come to university for, and there is a lot of work at Oxford, but it definitely doesn't mean that there isn't time for other things. I think that like people would definitely say like, you kind of work hard, play hard at Oxford. There's, you know, you might spend a lot of the day doing work, but then, um, you know, in the evening, people will usually meet up. There's a lot of clubs and societies at Oxford to get involved in kind of sport, art, politics, all sorts of things. Um, and yeah, it's also quite possible to, you know, do things at the weekend. People go home or people go visit other places around. So you might be spending quite a lot of time you know, on your studies, but there's definitely a lot of time for getting involved in other things as well. Perfect, thank you. Lizzie, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, if you're at sick form, then you're probably spending more time working than you are doing other things. So it's not really like a huge difference in that way. You know, it's just you're going to university to go study. So most people go study. Um, but that really, as, um, as Imogen said, that doesn't mean that we're only studying. And, you know, I think a lot of Oxford is very, or, you know, pre-pandemic anyway, I don't quite know what it's going to be like now, but um, it's very friendly, very um, it's sort of active, very busy. Um, and there's always lots to do, which is outside of your degree. So, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. And also lots of people do sports at university. So you can either do sports within your college, which is quite um, like relaxed, quite chill. There's only maybe like two sessions a week where you practice maybe a match. But you can also go to university level and that's quite intense with the sports playing. Like some people, they train like every day each week, maybe five times a week. And those people are doing that. They're even like medics doing that. And they manage to find time between fitting that in whilst also fitting their work in, whilst also being able to socialise. So I know you kind of, you spend time studying but as everyone said it's all balanced and like everyone finds their own wavelength and you can like you can enjoy your time at Oxford and not just be studying the whole time okay perfect so another question what makes Hartford stand out from the crowd anyone to answer this Any? um where do I start uh I'd say it probably well, it doesn't really make it stand out because no one knows it. But like I said, they um, with the bridge is we've got the bridge of size, and um, basically it's just this really nice bridge in front of college, and it's really nice. That's what makes it hard to stand out. I think also it's so centrally located. Like you've got the Bodleian Library, which has loads of reading rooms in there. You've got the Radcliffe Camera, which is another library, and like you've got access to basically the entirety of the centre of Oxford, just at your footsteps when you're a fresher. So um, I'd say, yeah, that's what makes Hartford stands out. Anyone else have anything to add to that? I agree with what Anita's saying. 
Uh, I'd like to uh, add that I think Hartford has also a college cap, which I really like. We have Simpkin. He's so kind of varying levels of friendliness, but um, he's often hanging out in the library. It's just quite nice when you're, you know, in the midst of doing some work and then Simpkin comes and sits on the chair next to you or something like that. I think that's a nice, nice aspect of Hartford. Everyone likes Simpkin. Is it right if I add something else? Yeah, go for it. I, I just also wanted to say like, so the students are nice and the academic staff are nice, but also all the other staff that work within the college are just lovely. And like, you can just get to, I don't know, like for example, the porters, like they're there to like keep the college safe and like um, to help with all the organization of the college without them, like it wouldn't really run. And they're just like the loveliest people. So like, um, I just think also, um, the people that also like work around the college, not just like the students or like the people that teach you are also just lovely. Perfect. Is any, are you ready to move on? Um, okay, so. So there's a question here saying, do students from the same country tend to group up or is there a broad mix of cultures in a group of friends? Um. So I have a big group of friends with a lot of international and European students in and I would say because a lot of them tend to do the same sort of subjects, I don't, I don't quite know why, but um, loads of the Romanian um, Romanians in Hartford do computer science and so they spend more time together because they're working together and I think a lot of them do sort of, you know, they have Romanian society events and they do like tend to know other Romanians in the university and um, maybe spend more time together because of that. But I don't think there's any, like, there's not big segregations and no one talks. And I think one of the best things about being at Oxford for me has been meeting people from so many different backgrounds, from so many different countries, um, and just getting to know all these sort of new cultures um, through my friends. And I think that's been really, really fun to do. And yeah, I don't think there's a, you know, there's not a, like, oh, only um, Eastern Europeans go hang out here, only um, Chinese students go hang out here. You know, it, it, everything that does get really mixed and it's very exciting and fun. Perfect, thank you, Lizzie. Does anyone have anything to add? Or should we move on to the next question? Okay. I might add something. Yeah, go for um, it. Sorry, I keep adding, I'll, I'll stop adding adding no, things. To honestly, like, go things for it, the, the floor is yours. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'd like to add on to what Lizzie said in the fact that like there are loads of communities where you can um, also find like-minded people from other colleges. Because when I first, like when people first come to Hartford, there's in your year, there's like what, a hundred and is of the order of like 100, 130, that might be right, um, students that come in um, to the college each year. I can't remember now. Um, and, um, and like, there's, it's such a diverse like range of people. So like, um, sometimes you might not actually find someone, but there are so many other university um, societies where like, you can like, you can like find like-minded people if you can't find them within your college. I'm not just saying about Hartford, I'm just saying in general, because some colleges are more diverse than others. Um, and I, I just say that Hartford is such like, such a small tight knit group. Well, it's a large cohort, but like, it's a, like a small location. So we all really like get to know each other really well. So I don't think there's like any segregation by like people coming from different countries. I think it's all very like cohesive. Yeah, I'd also add to that Hartford in, in first year, everyone lives on main site. And because main site is quite small, it, like space speaking, you kind of have to see everyone in your year, like basically every day, every other day. Like there is no way for people to kind of get lost in Hartford, which maybe some of the bigger universities have. So I know some, no, not big universities, some of the bigger colleges have, where maybe they're a massive campus and some people in one building don't see others in another. So for first year, you kind of see everyone and you can kind of get to know everyone, say hi to them. And it's just quite a nice environment to meet loads of new people. Um, so yeah, we'll move on to the next question. There's one saying, generally speaking, what's the food like at Hartford? Freya, do you want to take this one? 
Um, so I think the food has like a lot of options, um, which is quite nice because I'm quite a picky eater. So it means there's always something that I can like enjoy to eat. Um, they always try to have a vegetarian or vegan option, which is another really good point because that tends to be a little bit cheaper. So some people like it. Um, and it also just kind of means that more people can enjoy the food. Uh, they kind of have breakfast, lunch, dinner um, through like Monday and Friday. And then um, on Saturdays and Sundays, they have kind of like a brunch, which honestly, the vast majority of the first years go to. We're all big fans of the brunch um, whilst we're right there in the main hall. Um, and I think like meal times are just a really nice time to kind of meet other people and also kind of get a like proper healthy meal. So I do, I quite enjoy going to hall. Imogen, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, um, like uh, Freya said, there's a lot of options. I'm vegetarian and sometimes vegetarian options can be a bit hit and miss, but they are pretty good actually at Hartford. And as there's, so there's a hall at main site where most, because the first years are living there, most of the first years eat there. Um, but there's also another canteen at a kind of second year accommodation in further south in Oxford, where a lot of second and third years um, go. So they have evening meal and breakfast on weekdays, whereas they also have lunch at college. So there's kind of a lot of options for, for getting food. That's good. Perfect. Okay, next question. So um, Christy asks, what is the dorm slash living situation like at Hartford? Also, the college cat sounds adorable. He is very cute. <laughs> um, so yeah, the living situation like at Hartford, who would like to take this on like where you live first, second and third year or fourth year? Lizzie? Uh, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, so we're all in sort of in the centre. Oh, sorry. First year, we're all in this, our big central site. Um, and the rooms vary quite a lot, but sometimes you could... It depends on luck, basically. I got a really nice big room with massive windows and it was amazing. Um, and some of the rooms are just kind of small, so it, it does depend. And then for, we're in college accommodation all through our degree, which is really good because we don't have to worry about the private sector renting and um, trying to work that out. Um, I think that's quite stressful generally. Um, but then we will, in the second and third and fourth years, we will ballot normally with a group of friends. So our names are put on a list and then we go and choose um, rooms that the college owns. And there's a big range. So whether you want to be um, to the north or south of Oxford, or if you want to have um, bigger kitchens or en suites or things like that. Um, and the accommodation at Hartford is generally very cheap in terms of the rest of the university. Um, and there are lots of bursaries as well. So I think people from low income backgrounds get a thousand pounds off their rent, I think that is. Um, so college accommodation is generally very good. Um, and we get lots of nice furniture. Um, yeah, I, I very much liked my room last year and I'm hoping I'll get a nice room this year as well, but we'll see. Perfect. I'd also add to that, um, that with the living situation, everyone pays a flat out rent, so we don't have banded. So it's kind of like everyone goes in and each room costs the same. So there's no, it doesn't affect where you live, how much you want to spend on accommodation. Everyone pays the same and it's quite, it's very equal like that, which I really appreciate and lots of people appreciate because it means you can go in first year and like when you go to second year, you don't have to decide which band you want to live in or anything. And um, it means in second and third year, you might be able to get an ensuite because in one of our campuses called Folly Bridge, that's south of the river, every room comes with an ensuite, which is very nice. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I'd like to add as well. I mean, just um, to add on to that as well, I think it's really good, in, especially in first year, when you're meeting new people. You know, your neighbours could be from Eton or they could be from a local comprehensive and there is no differential and there's no difference between us. And I think that's really nice just as an equaliser right from the start is that no one is automatically put into a category based on how much they can afford. Um, and I don't know what the experience is like at other colleges where people have had that like distinction right from the start um, with different priced rooms. But I really liked it in Hartford where everyone was on an equal footing right from the beginning. 
Perfect. Okay, we've got two questions here which kind of merge into one. So the first one is, hi, being an international student, could you please tell me whether there is enough international community at Hartford? AKA is like there's a good enough, a good international community at Hartford. And then one's just come in from um, another person saying, is Hartford friendly for international students? Um, who'd like to take this? I'd like, off the bat, yes. <laughs> but um, Imogen, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an international student, but there definitely is a big community of international students at Oxford generally and, and definitely at Hartford as well. Um, there's international student JCR rep, so there's sort of a point of contact um, if you've got any questions or queries or something for the college to work on. Um, and yeah, I think like we said before, definitely there's a lot of mixing. I've got friends from a lot of different countries at Hartford and more generally at the university. So I think that it's definitely welcoming community for people from overseas um, and particularly at the moment as well the college are being um, are sort of kind of supporting people who need to self-isolate before they come back so if that's sort of carrying on in the future there will be support in place um, and a lot of international students are also able to stay in their accommodation or at least in Hartford accommodation over the vacations so if going back is sort of not really an option so much then the college can help out with that as well. Yeah, the um, Hartford also have an, a visiting students program and they kind of get, they live within, live in, like, in amongst the students, mainly in south of Oxford. And it's really nice because your next door neighbour you might not have met before and they come in as a visiting student and then it's kind of like inter, they mix in, they mix in with the students and it's not very like internationals versus um, UK students. Um, so yeah, this, another question is, can you go self-catered? Any, do you want to take this? Yeah, I think so you can choose whether you're going to eat catered or not on like a pay-as-you-go system so you have like your library card um and just use that so that card like gets you into the libraries but it can also pay for your things which is quite cool and um, so you just literally you just go into the canteen or the hall and you just walk in get your food and then you get your card and you just pay it and then you can top it up online so it's a really simple um simple way of doing things and um, I also like how um, you basically just get a choice for when you want to go. So you can't, you can't just, I know at some uni accommodations, for example, my sister's, um, she gets um, like catered credit um, and that pays for her accommodation, but she didn't always want to like um, get catered. So I think it's really nice at Hartford that you can just choose when you want to be catered and when you don't want to be catered and there's like no hard feelings. So, yeah. Yeah, I must admit with Hartford in first year, the kitchen situation isn't great. So if you do want to go self-catered, you have to kind of bear in mind that it might be around like 10 people sharing one kitchen at one point. I know we've just had our accommodation newly renovated and they've added in kitchens. So that's really good. Um, obviously, I haven't been to the, we haven't seen the site yet because we went here for Trinity. So the summer term of our last year, but um, it looks really nice from the photos and they are increasing the number of kitchens. And in second and third year, you can live, as I said, in Folly Bridge and also Mornock. And they all have their own kitchens. So it's like six people to a kitchen and they're really good. Own dining room tables, everything. It's amazing. Um, and also in Abingdon, New Ab, they have their own little kitchens, which is good. Um, so yeah, let's have a look. So did you pick Hartford solely based on your undergraduate study? So location wise, or did you choose it because of its atmosphere? Okay, so did you choose Hartford because it was good for your, I don't know, close to the department or because you went and it was a good atmosphere? Who wants to take this? Lizzie or Freya? Yeah, there you go. Um, I was just going to say, I almost didn't apply to Oxford and one of the kind of big pulls for me was that I just really liked the kind of atmosphere in Hartford. I felt like it had a really nice mixture of having some really like beautiful old buildings. But I think with the kind of friendly atmosphere, um, and the kind of relaxed feeling of the college, it didn't feel particularly like intimidating. And I think really the kind of like community in Hartford does come across um, in the kind of students and in the kind of atmosphere of the college. So um, it just kind of really felt like a place that I wanted to kind of live and feel supported in my studies. And that actually, my kind of gut feeling with that actually really has been true. And it has been a very like welcoming place that I felt really supported by the other students and by the kind of college itself. Does anyone want to add to that? 
Mm -hmm. so the, oh, sorry. Um, so the Hartford is right next to the Radcam Library, um, which is a big circular building. And that's also the History Faculty Library. So for me, it was very convenient to be right next door to the History Library. But I think first and foremost, I applied because when we, I visited just on a random day and the porters were so friendly, the college building seemed so nice and it just, you know, it seemed really wholesome, really welcoming. And I think the atmosphere was definitely what drew me to Hartford rather than, you know, brazen nose across the road. Um, and yeah, I think there's always, you know, Hartford is very well placed in terms of being right in the centre, but it's, I think, what really sets it apart is the community and is how welcoming it is. Amazing. So I'd, I'd say it was a bit of both for me. So I looked, I first was looking at geography and in Hartford they take in nine geographers per year. So because it was a big cohort, I thought, great geography, I'll have a lot of people to work with. And then I found Hartford, saw nine geographers and then went onto the website, like Googled what's Hartford's atmosphere like. And then it said it was a really nice place, really friendly, very kind of like, Hartford focused a lot on stu um, state school students and getting them into Hartford and like, yeah, basically improving that. And I think we've got, I think this year we're taking in 81% 81, 81 of the undergrads of freshers are from state schools this year. So, because I was from a state school, it was really nice having that, knowing that I wasn't going into this this college that would be like, oh, hi, like, which school are you from? Like, which private school are you from? I don't know. I've heard rumours that that's what some colleges do. So for me, it was definitely a, a mix of both. And also with Hartford, it's a really good location for geography department. So yeah, I was definitely a mix of both. Anyone else have anything to add or should we move on? Perfect, okay. Um, what are the music opportunities like in Hartford? Is there anyone part of the music society want to take this? Okay, so <laughs> Freya? I've done like a little bit of stuff, but um, I, my, I did the choir for a bit, but my kind of throat wasn't really up to it. Um, a lot of freshers clear, but um, there's a non-audition choir which sings in the chapel in the Sunday service and there's a rehearsal kind of on the Friday afternoon mm -hmm. um, and that's actually really lovely if you just want to kind of get more singing in um, because it is non-audition you kind of can just join in um, and that also has quite a friendly atmosphere um, and also quite a nice bonus of that is after the Sunday service there's like 30 places in a formal meal um, for free on kind of Sunday straight afterwards. So you do get the opportunity for free food, um, which is always a bonus. And then there's also an orchestra and a jazz band um, at Hartford, which are also run by the Music Society. And I think they also kind of rehearse once a week just in Hartford and then kind of do concerts at the end of term. Um, and I might be wrong, but I believe those are also non auditions. So again, it's very easy to like get involved in Hartford music, but then still the music you're making is um, at quite like a high standard so it's not intimidating if you're kind of nervous about joining but it's also um, still quite like engaging and exciting music. I also add that Hartford has at least one music room sort of like practice room so if you've got an instrument you want to bring along and practice without disturbing people around you can go there it's definitely got piano um, and you can just practice there as well. Perfect. I think around like once a term as well. Well, obviously not sure about this year, but once a term before Corona, the jazz band would do jazz and drinks in our main hall, which is really fun. So you can put tickets out. Everyone pays like five pounds maybe, and we'll go have a nice jazz evening, get dressed up, and it's really nice because it's just for Hartford students. Um, so that's really good for music opportunities. Um, so another one. Are the societies varied in Hartford? Any? Do you want to take this? I think Lisa might want to take this. I don't know. Like, um, I know she was nodding, but um, I'd say I'll, I'll keep it short. So, if like anyone has anything to add on to it, I'd say yeah. Like, um, I think, I think, but obviously there's a music society and there are all the sports societies. There's also, um, so like, there's not really an art society, but there's definitely an art community because um, we have Heart Fest. Um, every third term, so in Trinity term, the last term of the year, um, there's like a little festival. Couldn't happen this year because obviously, you know, Corona. But and then um, 
<laughs> but and then yeah I just think I just think like there's um, lots of opportunities to get involved. There's also like getting involved in actual, like the student body. So the, there's the JCR committee. He's like, um, Rebecca's the president. Um, and um, yeah, I just think there's lots of stuff to get involved with. If anyone wants to add anything. I mean, I can talk about some of the other kind of committee things. There's also the um, ENTS committee, which kind of run uh, BOPs and other events. So the BOPs are like kind of little parties that we'll have um, as kind of the college community. Um, they're often like dress up with kind of a weird theme. So we had a World Book Day themed one as our most recent one um, because it was on World Book Day. Um, and then they kind of will also run kind of later on in the year some kind of less party, more just kind of like welfare events. And then there's also the Freshers Committee, which um, is a group of students that will help run. Um, Freshers Week that I'm on this year. Um, so we kind of try and sort out the events for freshers and help welcome them into the college. And that's kind of another way to get involved in the college community. There's just kind of like a volunteer um, thing that you can do. Yeah, perfect. And also obviously all the sports. So another question just came in saying, how good is sports teams at Hartford, specifically hockey if possible? So I know, so the sports teams at Hartford are really, they're, they're like, they're really good ways of meeting new people. Um, the main ones are kind of football and rugby for the for, for guys and then netball for girls and then obviously rowing. That's a whole different story though. Rowing's kind of like its own thing. Um, they're really good. Like netball's really good. I think we're in division one for netball and rugby and football have done really well this year. There are loads of different other sports such as badminton. I know my friend organised a bit of badminton and kind of like whatever sport that comes up. It's kind of like the college base. So cuppers and all of that. That's where your colleges play against each other and it's all chill, very like relaxed. Um, if I'm completely honest with sports team in terms of hockey, we don't really have a proper hockey team, but um, there's nothing stopping anyone from making one. So I think with hockey, because it's such a big thing at university level, not many people play it at college level. So um, you kind of lots of colleges, they come together. So such as like women's football, we have Hartball, which is Hartford and Keeble joined together to create a women's football team. And so I know that Hartford used to do it with St. Peter's, I think, or another college, and they came together, played hockey, um, but then they stopped that. But I know Sophia, who's in my year, she's the sports, um, sports officer for our student committee. She was trying to put a hockey team together. But there's nothing stopping from yourself, who's asked the question, to come and set up a hockey team. Um, but hockey's really good university level as well. Um, I've heard great things. Um, yeah, so a lot of societies, a lot of sports at Hartford, it's, and also there's H HPES, which is Hartford Politics and Economic Society, and that puts on lots of talks. Um, they, they went on during lockdown as well. Will, Will Hutton, our principal that's just left, would have these conversations with a lot of people that were quite current names in, I know, mainstream media, and really interesting talks. Um, and yeah, hopefully Tom, our new, Fletcher, our new principal, Tom Fletcher, will bring some more cool people in. Um, but yeah, so any more questions, let us know. So um, here we go. What is the social life like at Hartford? Are there any interesting events taking place there? Imogen, do you want to answer this? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of things going on at Hartford. We had, um, we have, like I think some of them we mentioned before, kind of jazz and drinks events. Um, there's like a kind of, Heart fest, like Anouk mentioned, there'll be some sort of art related activities going on for a week or so then. Um, there's, um, I think we had like a Scottish dancing event or a Cayley event last term, right? I think. Um, so that was good. And um, so there's also a lot of talks going on to like, uh, Rebecca was talking sort of politics related ones, sport things. Um, Christmas formal is also very popular to get a sort of Christmas dinner meal in the hall with can candlelit dinner. Um, there's all pancake day. There's a sort of um, thing where people would like run around the quad, like um, flipping pancakes. Um, yeah, there's kind of a lot of random events going on throughout the year. Um, and if anyone can think of other ones, I've forgotten. So what if I add on to that? Yeah. Okay. Um, also, like, um, so they're like like um, events that happen like one off in the year, but they're also um, big organised parties, which are like 
we call them bops. Um, I'm, I think Freya mentioned them like a second ago and they're just really nice to like get the whole college together, have a good boogie, you know, or if you don't like dancing, you don't have to dance, obviously. But um, normally they like rent out a club. I don't know how it's going to work like until like this whole pandemic situation is over. But um, they're really fun and like you really get to know like I wouldn't have met some of the people in college without her like going to these things and just being like just having a laugh. So um, I think it's really good for like both um both like just enjoying yourself and also like also super curricular activities so like just in like enhancing yourself and educating yourself as well like with all the talks that are going on and um there's also like um lots well bef like from my experience um there were also lots of careers stuff going on so I was really interested in becoming a teacher when I first started I don't know how I don't know what I'm going to do now <laughs> god everything's all over the place but um they got like they're like brand ambassadors for like the college for like different um companies so like this was teach first and they had like a whole talk and um it was really interesting to like see my career options and they're like i can't remember what the society is called but like there's a group of students that um, get people to talk in about like future careers so like i ended up talking to this guy who um, worked at google and i was like wow that's something that i'm also really interested in so it's like a great opportunity to like just go to a talk and hear about their experiences and like how they also like furthered their career like because obviously when i came to uni i was like i don't know what i want to do i still probably don't know what i want to do who does but um it's just really nice to have like the opportunity to like also have a good time and also enhance like my ability to like look for a career as well as like we move on. Yeah. I think maybe to add to the more informal social side of things as well, um, you know, lots of people just sort of meet up and have a chat and we have the college bar called DTV um, and that is very popular in the evenings just to go and have a drink with your friends um, and people just stop in the corridors and have a chat. Um, and also people organized in our year, some cocktail nights. So we got the JCR and we made some drinks and everyone just came and had a bit of a party. So I think there's lots of ways that we have lots of very lots of big organized events, um, both socially in terms of helping careers, in terms of yeah, academic talks and things. And then we also just have a really nice friendly atmosphere. I think especially for first year where everyone's just living on site. So you just sort of wander out your room and bump into people and have a chat. Um, so in terms of just hanging out in Hartford, it's a very nice atmosphere and a very nice place to be. Perfect, thank you, Lizzie. <laughs> um, okay, so next question is, how can I choose a college when I can't go and visit? Um, this is a very interesting question actually, because obviously the open days would be in person at the moment, but they're online. Um, our, develop, our access team have been working really hard to make videos for Hartford. So I'd say that I've watched them and they're really good. So there's pre-recorded videos on Meet the Tutors, college, a college tour um, on food and accommodation, also mock tutorials and how we can, kind of, how we can support you. And um, within, within all of those categories, there are some pre-recorded videos which you can look over and try and get the sense of what Hartford's like. Um, I know Anut, didn't you say that when you that were deciding Hartford, there's like a, there's, on the internet, it's kind of like, what college do you want? And you can go through that little clicking, like clicking through things. Um, and then it just pops out a random college or maybe a list with what's the best or I don't know. So how can I choose a college? There are those avenues um, or a lot of, I think the location of your college is really good to think about. So Hartford's so central and we also provide accommodation for second and third year. I mean, you can stay central, whereas for some colleges I know they're, central in first year but then second year they have to find their own place and that means it puts them quite far out of Oxford so I think definitely look at that um, I personally looked at how many people do my course in my college because it's quite nice because you do all your work within those that group of you so if there's two of you I know if you both are stuck it's quite tricky but if there's nine of you hopefully one of you will be able to help each other out and um, is there anyone else that wants to add into that Yeah, I think I'd just add that um, most, basically most people do end up kind of not really liking their college because um, also you don't have to pick a college. Some people do make an open application or you might pick a college, but actually end up receiving an offer from a different college. So I think it's not something to sort of really 
stress too much about obviously you want to think about maybe some logistic logistical things like Rebecca said or things that you think look nice or appeal to you about a college but I wouldn't get too worried about not having been able to visit this year um you might have you might apply to Hartford but get an offer from somewhere else anyway um and I think people are generally really happy with whatever college they go to although obviously Hartford is a good choice but um yeah I think don't get too worried about it I think Imogen's right in that respect um like sometimes you just don't have control over these things and like I don't I don't know personally anyone who like properly hates their college like I just I don't think that's very common and also I'd like to say when I went to the open day I I just didn't think about going to colleges so I just like I didn't know what subject I wanted to do like I had like no clue I just hopped on and I was just like yeah so I ended up coming home like wait what college do I apply to so like honestly like it's okay if you can't like see them physically I still like well safe bet is Hartford um I'm not gonna lie but um I also think that um if you do like start thinking about your college and I wish I did to be fair because well obviously I don't wish I did because I love it here but um sometimes I do wish like oh what if I looked into things and then like it would have been less stressful but um if you do want to like look into things I think also um if you have a preference on like um how many tutors you want or if you have a preference on how far away you are from things if you don't like riding a bike then um, I think it's also good to look at that stuff and just type, there are loads of forums online. Like I wouldn't trust everything that they say, like take it with a pinch of salt, but um, going on the like university website and there's like a whole list of colleges and it could be a bit daunting, but just like going through a few and just like picking one that looks nice might be a good starting point. But, yeah. I think maybe it might be worth saying as well that about a third of people who get an offer get an offer from a different college than the one that they applied to so it's not worth going like I need to be at this college and if I'm not at this college I'm going to be miserable you know it's you know as um as Imogen was saying just sort of don't overthink it um go for one that you think looks nice and ticks some of your boxes but don't um base all your sort of happiness in Oxford like Oxford dreams on the particular college because it's very flexible and ends up changing it. No, yeah, I agree with everything that everyone said. And also, maybe I'm being a bit um, naive, but for me in Oxford, I didn't actually visit Oxford, did, didn't do an open day, kind of just saw Hartford on a screen and was like, yep, sure, I'll go for that. And maybe it was, I felt like it was a bit of fate, like, I know, I just, I came here, loved it, I'm now, like, absolutely loving college, ended up here, just, I don't know, I don't know whether it was kind of like, not if it's meant to be, it's meant to be, but as everyone's saying that it's kind of like you go where you go you love it and just don't stress that there is a perfect college that's screaming your name like and if you don't go to that college then it's going to be like the worst experience of your life it's it's really good um okay moving on Ooh, a lot of questions coming in um so does Hartford have a political bias I'd say no um I don't think any colleges are really very this, we are a college and we have this political bias, but do, does anyone agree with me? I know, disagree with me? Well, I don't know about our new principal, um, but like our previous principal was like, did have his political views, but like he didn't like infringe them upon us. Like he, well, is that the right word? I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, basically, he, we're not like pushed to any political bias. I think we're a very open community and we like to have a good discussion as well. Like I've had like, a, a few interesting discussions and I'm not even like that into politics like I do a physics degree like not that physics people can't like politics but it's just like something that I'm not majorly interested in so I wouldn't say that there's a political bias. Okay perfect moving on so there's one come, just come through and um, hopefully you'll be able to answer this so someone says how important do you feel the tutor options are when picking a college so the tutors you'll be kind of doing the work with since I'm applying for computer science and philosophy, Hartford and Peter Milliken is the, ob is the obvious choice. I'm also interested in UNIV. Um, so basically for you guys, how important are the tutors at your college when you pick a degree, sub when you're picking your college slash degree? Yeah. I think in my opinion, um, 
you basically the, co- the teachers in your college you work so closely with them you have like a personal relationship with them like you kind of have a rapport you see them every week every two weeks so the people you work with are the tutors that are in that college so if you are interested in Peter Milliken and you want to work with him the obvious choice would be Hartford and I'd kind of say that that's probably Hartford you're really leaning towards in that regard um but obviously yeah anyone else if you'd like to add Please add now. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah. Because like for me and with geography, the tutors that I've that are in Hartford, I've worked with them all through first year, mainly second year, they kind of do your core modules. And then if you do options, you kind of get outsourced to different colleges, but you only do three options, whereas you're working with the tutors in your college for however many like the whole of first year then I'd know all your core options and all of that so yeah definitely think about the tutors you'd be working with um so okay so wait I, there's a question down here okay what do you think what do you think that okay this is this is worth strangely so what do you think will make you stand out from other candidates that apply to Oxford for university slash heart for college so on a personal statement or an application, what do you reckon would make someone stand out amongst everyone else? Any? <laughs> um, I think I think when you're um, applying to a subject and like at a college, they're looking for um, like an interest and a, like a passion for the subject. Like I don't think I don't know. I don't think like being on student council is going to really change whether you're going to get in or not. I think I think showing that you have a real real good supercurricular interest in your subject, like this is gonna this sound daunt this sounded daunting to me, but like a bit of reading doesn't hurt as well. Like read something that's really current or like something that's a bit cutting edge, a bit different, and um, something that like you can really talk about in your interview might like really give you an edge. I'll, I'll keep it there. Um, sorry, if I can just jump in, I don't think there's any like particular thing that you need to do or to definitely get a place where if you don't do it, there's no chance. Um, and I think, like Anoop said, you have the interviews. Um, a lot of subjects also have the kind of admissions test and you have your personal statement and your teacher reference. So there's kind of lots of different ways that the college and the university can kind of look at you as a student. So don't feel like you need to um, kind of fill your personal statement with like everything they need to know to make sure that um, they definitely think like you're able to show your passion in more ways than just um, writing like on your personal statement. So I think, um, you know, make sure that you're showing the super curricular stuff. But again, don't worry that if you miss one little thing out, it's going to immediately change their opinion on you. Okay, perfect. So it's just, yeah, it's 9.45. I just want to add, in your personal statement, um, if, you, if you do read a book or like read an article and want to write on it, write, rather than just kind of summarising what you read and what it said, put your opinion in because that's what tutors want to see. They want to see your opinion on something, even if it's just like a little one-worded sentence like this made me think this. It just shows that you're kind of having your own opinion and you can stand for yourself rather than just, I know you can look up a summary anyway, you can be like, what's like a synopsis is on the internet within two seconds, but a personal opinion from a student that's obviously really bright and applying to a place like Oxford or Cambridge, that's the valuable thing in the personal statement. Um, yeah, so we will be back later on today, um, but we will hand over to the next set of students. Um, as you said, where this slide video is coming from, if you're on the Oxford website, just ask questions in the box down below at the bottom of the page and we'll hand over to the next students. Yeah, thank you for tuning in and yeah, see you later. <laughs>
just to let you know, we are more than happy to answer on pretty much anything because like you did, we'll have friends um, who also do similar sorts of things or at least a little bit of experience ourselves. So I'm Imogen, I'm a third year English student. Um, Tash, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tash, I'm a third year law student. Lovely, Antonia? Hi, I'm Antonia and I'm a second year geographer. Lovely, Caleb? Hi, I'm Caleb and I'm a second year biologist. And Ian. Hi, I'm Ian and I'm a third year chemist now. Kind of. <laughs> I know, we all quite believe it. It's gone so fast. Great. So let's start answering your questions. So, first, we have one of how do you organise yourself to stay on top of your work? Who would like to start with that? Good old time management. Uh, I'll go because I think I had an awful lot on last year. <laughs> so it's about figuring out what works for you. I think it's best to kind of take the first few weeks of first year as you're starting to get settled in and try different things different days. So it wasn't until I got to uni that I figured out I work so much better like the first chunk of the morning and then kind of everything goes. So I have to go and do something else and then come back to work. Um, so finding out when you're most productive is really the best like first step to organizing yourself. Also buy a diary, either use your laptop and use the um, calendar on your university outlook really well or get yourself like an academic diary and write everything down. Um, your room will have a notice board. I cover mine in post-it notes to remind me where I'm meant to be. I have my big academic calendar every year. Um, so it's honestly, it's about finding what works for you. The other thing is that the work is a lot and it's short term. So you do, you are expected to get a lot done in the eight weeks that you're there, but it's manageable. Um, so I last year was part of a few different societies, was training every day for university sport, uh, getting all my work done and working down the bar uh, once a week. So it is doable. You just have to kind of be on it and like kind of, timetable your days every day and remember to take breaks so I used to take at least one day as a weekend and just kind of chill and not do as much but yeah if anyone else has any other techniques I would say similarly yeah you take the first few weeks of first year to kind of figure out your priorities and what's important for you but also what works for you um, so I found a similar thing um, in that like I can only work properly in the morning and that I'm very productive in like the first bit of the morning and then any time after like 3 p.m. my head just is <laughs> completely gone. So I kind of use that and try to push all my work into the morning and then I spend like nearly every day between like four and six exercising or doing something else because I knew that I wasn't going to be able to work then unless that was something I really, really had to do. <laughs> Um, and I also didn't really work well in the evenings, so it meant that I would often wake up a bit earlier so that I could substitute that time that other people would be working in the evenings. Um, and yeah, you find you find patterns and things that work for you. So I also couldn't work in big chunks. I like I can't concentrate for more than like an hour at a time. So I need to be moving around in between or changing sp study space or just switching on to different tasks and stuff. But it really does fall into place when you're in charge of all of your timekeeping, you start realising what's important and yeah, you find things that work for you. Yeah, I totally agree with those two and also emphasise the need for other things. Um, because Antonia said it was about exercise and societies as well as Tash and that sort of thing is also really good because as well as actually, you know, doing your work, it's a good time to sort of let off some steam because if you're working 24 seven in the library, that is not healthy or sustainable. So you know Hartford is very much you've got to make sure you've got a nice balance and you sort of figure that out so like for my subject English you might have two essays a week or something sometimes more sometimes less so you'll figure out what it takes you each stage to write the essay and then the same with problem sheets I assume um the chemistry like how do labs fit into that um either Ian or Caleb uh, I don't mind taking this one well they'll be different between chemistry and biology anyway um Chemistry, you have them two days a week um, for like six hours. So it's quite routine um, and you don't really have a lot of sway in when you do your work with chemistry because you've you know, either got labs one day or you've got tutorials the days after and things. So 
you kind of have to work when you have the time to work not to say that you don't have any time for anything else but like you don't have as much freedom in like i'm going to work at this time of the day and then so forth you kind of just have to fit in around everything and you do have weeks when like shoots will like another subject kind of everything packs on at once and then you have like periods when you don't really have anything going on uh and it's trying to like use those periods when you don't have much going on to prepare yourself for the intense parts um and that can be a little bit of a challenge and take getting used to but it, it's fine after a, uh, a little bit so, yeah that's well. wonderful yeah um, I, um oh, sorry i was just gonna say i'd say with biology it's um so in first year for first term of first year it's one lab a week and then for the last two two terms of first year it's two labs a week but with biology, the timing works really well because you finish lectures at about 11 and then you start labs at about 12. And I think for most people that the hour gap in between, it's not really worth going back to college. So you can usually do like your pre-lab work in that hour before. And there's usually an hour, an hour gap between the finishing of the labs and then the second lecture of the day. So I always like, like, in, a, in our college, the biologists at our college, we would always stay behind after the labs and just get all of our, all of our work done straight after the labs because we knew that if we kind of like walked home straight after the labs, we'd end up like just chucking the work in a cupboard and forgetting about it. So I think the timetable for biology works really well because that little hour gap just like almost nudges you to get your work done straight after the lab, um, whatever your assignment is. Yeah. That's great. Um, so Sorry. That's one of the other really kind of mad things about Oxford that you'll realise is that um, different subjects have massively different amounts of contact hours and that will really impact how you organise your days. So like Ian says that there are days where he has like big chunks of labs and like I know that I have lectures which this year are going online so I don't even have to leave my room which is amazing. <laughs> but I have a couple of lectures a day and then like three hours of tutorials a fortnight. And then that's it. That's all I get because I do law and they just expect us to read. Whereas Ian like has to do these practicals and stuff. And um, I think it's different like for languages as well. They have tutes and classes and seminars and uh, lectures. So if you're doing a subject like law or like the humanities kind of thing, where you just kind of get free roam to go and read and <laughs> do your own thing, it's um, you have to be way more organized because no one is going to structure your day for you. <laughs> Because at least if you do the sciences, they're like, you you have to be here this big chunk of time and like you're, you're kind of more accountable. So if you're doing like a humanities subject, kind of really be on that from the start um, because it's it's quite overwhelming, I think, when you get behind. Totally. Um, yeah, just keep on top of it as much as you can, but also remember to relax is our key message. Um, so the next session we have is about accommodation. Um, it's well, do you get it for three years? So would someone just like to briefly explain how accommodation works at Hartford? I'm happy to. Um, so basically the way it works is you will get accommodation for all three years of your course, which is really lovely. It means it's nice and easy. You don't really have to worry about whether you're gonna have to like house hunt or things like that. So basically the way it works is you are in college for the first year. Um, with all the other first years and then in second and third year we have a thing called a ballot so basically you'll have a group of like five or six friends depending on how big the ballot is each year and then it will be randomly assorted into like a list and there's a certain number of rooms um, that we have in North Oxford which is just above college and South Oxford which is just below college that said they're about 10-15 minute walk from college so not far at all and basically once you're in your group, that will alloc allocate the order of which it goes. So, you know, third years go first, second years go like, second. So you'll be given a time slot and then you'll just take whatever room are left, um, which is quite nice. I mean, I, I think everyone would agree that there's no such thing as a really bad room at Hartford. <laughs> like they're all pretty nice and yeah, clean and tidy and, you know, large enough for you and your stuff live so it's just a matter of choosing where you want to live but I mean they try and make it as stress-free as possible the ballot which is very much appreciated if anyone wants to quickly just jump in but we've got lots more questions to go yeah just on uh, rooms they definitely get better as you go into second and third year um 
Well, actually, I've, I've seen that they've redone the accommodation in Hollywell, so you might might be winning in first year now. Um, but in second and third year, you can have your own ensuite depending on where you live. Uh, you can end up in a house with your friends because college owns some houses in, in North and South Oxford. But the really nice thing is that when you, you move out of college into second and third year, the accommodation's kind of clustered um, in South Oxford, so it's all really close. So even if you like don't end up living in the same block or same house or same like corridor as the friends you had from first year you're still like across the road around the corner so you're not like scattered completely which is the other nice thing about art accommodation yeah totally I echo that it's it still really maintains the community aspect even though you're not all under the same technical building um, which is really nice so we've got some questions about the application process so one was just, it was the application process for Hartford Hard. And one thing I'd like to say before we go into talking about the application process is the application process to Hartford isn't actually different to, particularly to the application process for the university. You'll submit your UCAS to the university um, and then it'll, that will all get passed on to the college. Um, and the college sort of comes in when it comes to your interviews and your personal statement, but any entrance exams are by the subject. So it's not anything particularly different for Hartford up before your interviews, as far as I'm aware. Um, if I'm wrong, please tell me everyone else. But yeah, so something about the application process is if you put a book, uh, if you put your opinion on a book that you've read in your personal statement, will you be pushed to talk about it at your interview? Um, for example, this person is hoping to do law and reading lots, um, but is wondering how it is to be actually quizzed on a personal like a book that you've talked about um this is probably you know perhaps more important for sort of humanities and social sciences but equally you do mention books in other subjects too so would you like to start with law tasha and then we can sort of move around a little bit uh yeah so i think it's probably important to hedge any kind of talk about applications at the moment with things would have been very different for us than if you guys are applying in a, a, a post in the middle of COVID world. Um, because once you get through the initial application, um, we all went to college to be interviewed. And I, as far as I'm aware, all the interviews are going to be like via Teams or online, or like kind of video calls this year, which is the first big different thing. Um, in terms of what I put in my personal statement though, it's more kind of, um, finding a balance between like all of the extracurricular things I did like debating and mooting and um kind of music and things like that and to show you can kind of balance that with work and also kind of displaying a genuine interest so I think the most important thing about applying to, applying to Oxford is to demonstrate that you have like a genuine passion for your subject but probably try and avoid using the words genuine passion <laughs> Uh, so I think I remember writing mine more as kind of an essay on a bit of law or a, a like legal issue that I disagreed with um, rather than like a speech about myself. Um, I think that really helped me. Um, is that different for other subjects though? I imagine it'd be very different for sciences. Um, yeah, let's with, I sorry, yeah, with chemistry, mine was very um, kind of Packed. I mean, we read it back in first year, I think. We all like shared our personal statements with each other and um, it, it didn't really make much uh, sense, to be honest. It was just a lot of chemistry crammed into a very short space of time. Um, but it was definitely the passion thing. Get that across. Um, that's like really important. And as with the books as well, um, like there is one book which almost everyone puts on their personal statement and it is a joke in the department that everyone puts it on there and people don't read it. So I do know tutors that have um, questioned people on the book before. So if you do put it on, do read it uh, or at least read bits of it um, and put those bits on your personal statement. Don't say you've read the whole thing if you're only going to read the first chapter. Um, yeah, just be truthful because it might, might come back to get you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is the ultimate advice from Ian. If you put something on your personal statement, please be prepared to talk about it. Um, even if it's like, I went to this talk, they might ask you, oh, how, how did it go? What, would, what was the most interesting thing you learned from it? Stuff like that. Um, yeah, Caleb, what would you like to say? 
Um, yeah, I'd agree with Ian about the book thing. Definitely, um, definitely don't put something on if you've only read like a bit. But what I what I found with with biology is like amongst my year, there was a big range between personal statements where some people had done theirs all about kind of the practical side of biology. Whereas my personal statement, I've written more about kind of biological theory and I've put a couple of books in there, whereas other people haven't put any books in there. So I think it ranges quite a bit for biology because it is a science and you do have labs and there's a lot of practical side to it. But we also have to write essays. So I think whether you do or don't put books in there doesn't matter too much. Um, but what I would say is if you do put a book in there, because I put a couple in, but I was never asked about them, is that don't put a book in that you just think is going to impress them. Because we had the same thing with biology where um, there was a certain book and it's like everyone who applies to biology reads this book and everyone wants to put it in their personal statement because they think it's going to make a big impression. Don't do that. If you're going to read a book, only read a book that you're really interested in. And you'll find that, you'll find that interviews that interviews often only ask you about the, the bits of the, the personal statement that they're interested in. So if you read a book that you really didn't like and then you won't write about it enthusiastically in your personal statement, you're probably not going to get asked about it anyway. So yeah, I'd say only, only put a book in your personal statement. Like if you read a book and you didn't like it that much and you don't want to write about it that much, it's not a big deal. Like don't see it as like a waste of time because you've not put it in the statement. Um, yeah. Yeah, also I'd echo podcasts are also really helpful. So if you're not big on reading or if you've listened to something which gave you lots of ideas about debate, like that is completely worthwhile putting in as well. It doesn't all have to be massive dusty books. Antonia? Um, yeah, I was going to say with geography, it's slightly similar, but also a bit different in that they look for you showing that you're interested in geography and applying like geographical thinking to basically anything that you've done. So you don't have to, so you can kind of say, so in your personal statement, like you don't have to be well-traveled or anything, but you just have to talk about your experiences and say like how this has helped you like understand your, your, like your passion or your, you know, interest in the subject. And then again, with like with interviews, they didn't really ask us much on our, on our personal statement because we had one of our interviews, we had pre-reading like a little test before the interview. And then in the other one, it was more about them asking you about things that you didn't really know about um and then applying what you what you did know to trying to figure out a problem and also books wise you're able to use books that you've read and and written about in your personal statement when you're in the interview but they they didn't ask us directly about them so I would say that it's always valuable to read well as much as you're interested in before writing your personal statement before going to interview because you're going to be able to use it to some extent um and also again with the with the personal statements and books there is a book that everyone who applies to geography reads and there's a, like another joke in the department that everyone has read it and everyone tries to put it on their personal statement so I would say don't try and aim for those books because you think that that they're going to want you to have read them read something that you're interested in and something that you find you know passion like fascinating because it will help you more than reading something that everyone else has also read Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing I think all of us talking has shown. Each subject is so different, but also within the same subject. It's the reason why it's called a personal statement. It's about you. And I think someone said to me once, the two key words are, you've got to be interested and interesting. And that's kind of what both the personal statement and the interview allows you to show. Um, so if you remember two words, I think those two words are the things that actually helped me most. Um, I mean, it's totally different for subjects. Uh, so for English, I mean, there's literally hundreds of thousands of books that you could read. So it was more focused on, at least one of my interviews was a lot more focused on the books that I put on there because I feel like it's a very unfair and impossible ask to say, oh, have you read X book from any period? So if you put stuff on your personal statement for English, it's perhaps a bit more likely. That said, you may have an unseen poetry or something like that. Um, but yeah, don't worry too much. But if you put it on your personal statement, please actually make sure you've read it. Also, I mean, for English, another thing is just try and make sure you do a little bit of reading in between the time that you've actually done your personal statement and you come up because it won't, you want to show that you're sustained interest. And even if they don't ask you about it, it's good to have like a title or a thought under your belt just in case. Um, 
Cool. So from a very academic to a slightly more fun and like society's point, we've been asked about drama societies. Um, they do exist. Um, there's a big uh, group called OWDS, Oxford University Dramatic Society. And normally, and in all circumstances, there's at least like three or four theatres I can list off the top of my head that put on student plays. Um, and there's like Cuppers, which is like a college, uh, inter-college competition, which runs for all kinds of sports as well. But it's a really fun thing to do and you don't have to work it before at all. So just to let you know that it's drama at Oxford and because I had a couple of questions come up earlier. But in that vein, would people like to talk about societies and also going out? We've been asked, um, is there an opportunity to party or is it all just studying? So would someone like to have a go at that? Sure, I can do a bit of both. So in terms of societies, there are literally, there is a society for everything. And now obviously we don't know exactly what things are going to look like next year yet. Um, and I think all of us are kind of bracing ourselves for a little bit of change. But um, if you if there's something you're interested in, likelihood is there will be a society for it whether that's like a little one inside your college or a big university one um, and especially during freshers that is the best time to get involved with everything because everyone is in the same boat and no one knows each other and don't be afraid to go to things on your own that kind of thing because there is this lovely community feel to everything in Oxford um, in terms of nights out and partying and stuff like that so colleges will have what's called bops and, and we don't know what they're going to look like this year um, but traditionally Hartford ones have been in a nightclub because we're a relatively small college and we don't have like internal space big enough. Um, and it's like a little kind of college party for just the people in college and then guests if you want to invite them you have to kind of list their names and stuff. Um, and it's uh, three or four times a term something like that. Um, and it's just this lovely kind of three times it's just this kind of chill uh, night out with just people you know and it's really like really kind of nice let go at the end of a week or middle of a week depending on at what point in term it is um on the clubbing scene in oxford again we don't know what it's going to look like anymore um it's not amazing but i come from liverpool so it's got a lot to live up to <laughs> um but it's not horrendous and i think the the important part is that especially in first year, you live right in the centre of town. So if that's your thing, you're like in the best place to do it. Um, as well as that, the college has previously had a college bar called Down the Bar, which if you're when you're in first year, it's exactly where you, you live. <laughs> We're not sure if that's reopening. I'm not sure if anyone's had any information about that yet. Um, but that's a lovely, like kind of karma social hub to chill. And there's loads of kind of, spaces for people that don't drink as well I think is the important thing that like if you want to have like a nice kind of like big social gathering that isn't alcohol based the, there used to be board game clubs and um, the JCR goes out of its way to put in lots of non-drinking events at the moment so I think uh, there is always opportunities to have fun and to, to party and to have karma chill nights like Oxford is very much what you make of it I think um so you will you'll make the time to do the things you want to do if that makes sense totally would someone like to talk a bit about sports societies and Tony I think you do rowing yeah um yeah so I rode for college in first year and um I would say that yeah it's really just up to you to like find ways to manage your time if, if those things are, if societies and going out and stuff is really important to you, then it's just, it's, you know, it's something that you can work into your timetable. Um, and like, I found that in first term, I didn't really go, like, I, I do like going out a lot, but in first term, I really didn't go out that much at all because I was just tired. But then by second term, like, I knew how to manage my time and I was able to go out a lot more and do more things. Um, so I would say there is definitely ways to manage to fit as many societies in as you you know you find important and also to do sports like with rowing we at the peak of it we were doing two water sessions a week and three or four land sessions a week and those would be in the morning either before nine or in the afternoon around five 
so it's it's manageable like you everyone was able to manage their time to do it um it's just a matter of you know figuring out a new schedule and using different times to work and yeah where was scare me how do you how do you start doing things before nine <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean <laughs> being up at four or five is not <laughs> um it's not the best experience but <laughs> wonderful anyone else want to talk about any other societies or the going out scene no no um I was going to say leading on from what Antonia said with the sports a good thing about college sports is they often like socialize together outside of the sport so like in first year I played for the football team and like we would play, we'd obviously play matches throughout the weekday and we'd play like matches between ourselves just um, on the five-a-side pitches, which is obviously great for your mental health. Um, then you also kind of bond with people from uh, second year and third year, which is a good thing because obviously as a fresher, you're getting to know people within your own year in your own time, but then you also can use sports to get to know people in other years. And I think it, it adds together well that you like, play sports with those people and then you'll also like go out and have like socials with them in the college bar and then like you might all go out in like a big group to like one of the nightclubs after and I think that kind of sometimes it can balance out the fact that the nightlife at Oxford isn't that great is if you, if you go on certain nights out like as part of like a society night out or like a, a sports club night out it can it literally can change like the whole experience so um yeah yeah, I think another thing to mention is that, again, we don't know what's going to look like this year, but previously college have kind of, or the JCR have run lots of internal events that have been really good. Like we used to do jazz and drinks uh, where the music society would put on live jazz music. Um, and I think it was like six quid or eight quid to, to get entry or something, which was battled anyway, which was great. So your battles are your like accommodation and food fees that you pay at the start of the next term um so you don't you don't know is it going out <laughs> it's next time's problem um but that's really good because it's just people from college and it's a little bit kind of fancier you get a little bit dressed up it's, it's nice and classy um but there's still wine um and it's still a really really good night I always love those but there's lots of things that college do like that and we have formals um which is kind of like a formal meal that you can go to um, again you get a little bit more dressed up you have your gown and um, that's another really kind of nice way a lot of people use that as a precursor to a night out as well which, which is always a good one yeah I, I think the great thing about it is at the university is you can start at whatever level you want you can have never done it before you can have done tons of it whether that's working for the student newspaper I'd never written an article or edited anything I was finished last year like you can do anything and I think that's a really nice thing about it so we just got some more questions um so uh, questions about how many people apply for certain subjects so all of that information just a quick thing you can all find out on the universe uh, on the college website so we have um on each subject how many people applied so whether that's physics or law or English or chemistry or whatever um all those statistics are listed on the university um so the next one we're going to go for is are the criteria for colleges the same as the criteria for the course? For example, will hearts of these students who do sports or drama is better or worse than students who don't? Um, who would like to go for this? We can quickly answer because we've got some more questions coming. Uh, I mean, as far as I'm aware, it's pretty much the same. Um, I think that I think the thing to emphasize when applying is that there's so many different things you can do um, that unless your subject requires it, unless it's like an entry requirement in the way that like, um, I think law requires essay subjects so like chemistry requires maths. Yeah, maths and uh, maths, chemistry and something else. I think additional yeah. science, but like my friend got on with economics as well. Um, so isn't, yeah. yeah. <laughs> As long as it's not like a course requirement, though, so many different things different people can do that just remember to do what you like and as much as what you like as possible and be yourself. Because as much as you're desperate to get in, what the teachers are trying to kind of vet is whether Oxford is a place where you will be happy and you will thrive. It works both ways. 
because Oxford isn't the place for everyone. It's very intense. It's it's a lot some days. And I mean, it's manageable, it is. Um, but it's a very specific type of learning. Um, so it's it's they're not trying to catch you out. They're not trying to trip you up or anything. Like it's about finding out because eventually you, the people that interview you will teach you usually. That's kind of why they're interviewing you. So just remember to be yourself. I think is the main thing. It's not about finding the one. There's no like golden ticket that'll get you in. Uh, it's about doing what you like and then demonstrating your passion through that. I think is the main bit of advice. Totally. Yeah, there was a question as well, which is, is there a specific Hartford quality that would make a candidate stand out? And I'd just like to add to Tash, it's being, your, I'd say for me, it's you've got to be yourself because, you know, try and do that as much as you can because at the end of the day, it's them who are wanting to teach you and you want to work with them. But also there was something in the other question about whether you need to do X number of extracurricular societies. And while they're really great, it's unlikely that they'll ask you much about that in your interview unless it directly relates to your subject or, or you've like linked it to how you see you know so if you do English and you're like do acting in this play maybe you discover x y and z yes they might ask you about that but if you do like a paragraph saying other like I've got grade eight flute unless you're doing music like that's wonderful and there's lots of orchestras and you can use that whilst you're here but it's unlikely that they'll ask you about that kind of thing and I'd say your interview is pretty much academic. So, you know, just focus on that um, for your interview and don't worry too much about it. So, yeah, I mean, they just want to see what kind of student you're going to be. Um, but yeah, we've got a question about life in Oxford generally. So how is life in Oxford as in the city? I've heard it's pretty safe. Um, but just wanted to make sure that you felt safe um, there. So do you guys feel safe? Because um, obviously that is a concern when you're moving from home for the first time. Was it like a big step into living in a new city? Uh, Caleb? Um, yeah, I definitely felt safe in Oxford. Um, I think the fact that like, all of like the colleges and stuff are so like big and they like kind of span across the city makes you almost feel as if like you're in a sort of safe space all the time wherever you go in Oxford because wherever you are in in the main city in like the main city centre you're never too far from a college you can always see a college in sight and obviously every college has like its own porters and its own staff there so I don't think there was ever a time even like very late at night um, where I didn't feel safe in the city and where I didn't feel like entirely comfortable um, I think it takes a bit of time to get used to um, the amount of tourists that go there, because obviously there are a lot of people who want to go and, and see the buildings. Um, and like there'll be days where like you'll step outside, especially if you're at Hartford, you're like you'll step outside the gate, and there's just like a swarm of tourists just like everywhere. But I think other than that, like they're not like a threat to your safety or anything. It's just a a thing that you have to get used to, especially if you if you come from somewhere where there's like it's not that densely populated. Hartford also has um, like a welfare taxi system. So if you're, I don't know, on a night out or just find yourself stranded somewhere in Oxford or somewhere else, uh, and you're not in a very safe position and you need to get back, then you can, do you have to call the porters for it? Or do you just, yeah, yeah. You call the porters and they'll send one out for you. Um, and then you, at some point, I think within that term or the next term, have to submit a form to explain why you needed the taxi. Uh, and if it's for a valid reason, then you don't get charged for it, do you? No, yeah, you don't. Um, and so there's always that as like a, a backup option. So you're always kind of like, they are there to, to watch out for you. Um, it can sometimes feel like porters are everywhere and like scouts cleaning rooms and everything. It feels like the college is always watching you, but it is always just, you know, so they know that you're safe and everything. Um, they are taking responsibility for you. So. Yeah, that was a really good point about the welfare tax fees. Yeah. Um, I think Caleb's point about the porters is really good as well because um, sometimes you might end up on the other side of Oxford and be a little bit lost or not feel like completely yourself or like I know I've been on the other side of Oxford and found kind of people that are a little bit worse for wear that go to a different college and not really know what to do with them and wanted to help that kind of thing and the nice thing about porters is that I haven't met one of them that wouldn't do anything they could to help a student even if you're not a student at their college. 
So all it takes is to bob into a, a college, explain the situation you're in. And even if you've lost your phone or you have no idea where you are, they'll just ring your porters. And like the porter system is really, really good. Um, and one of the most kind of influential things I think that makes me feel safe is knowing that I can just bob into a college and there is a whole team of people there that will help me. Yeah, I totally agree with that. They're really lovely. I mean, even if you have, like, if you lose your keys, you go to the porters, there's no judgment if you like left your keys in your room or something like that. It might be a joke after the fourth or fifth time, but like they're more than happy to help. I mean, I had to, once I had a bike puncture and I only noticed at like quite late at night and you know my um or like my bike lock had broken or something and I was like okay um do you have something to help with this and they're like no don't worry we'll just get you a taxi back and you don't need to worry about it they're very very concerned about your safety um something I'd also say about welfare is they do kind of help you feel safe they've got a very big welfare team in college so they've got staff they have a welfare coordinator they have the college chaplain who is also part of the welfare team but as well as that you've got students so if you don't want to talk to a member of college staff immediately you can talk to your peers so there's like trained peer supporters um, of which I am there's lots of other people there's also JCR welfare reps and they are you know the sort of student representatives and they will talk to college if there's anything else that people feel like they need to add to make people feel safe or if there's things that you need to talk about um and also, you know, they're very good at confidentiality. So if you say something to us, unless you feel like it's really, really necessary that it's passed on to someone else, we'll obviously talk to you before that happens. But it's a, uh, it's a very, it feels like a safe place to be, I'd say. Um, and they're just looking out, like people are there to look out for you. And you know, your tutors would rather you, you know, be happy and safe than you know, if there was a real like a big reason, they'd rather you be happy and safe than have absolutely every single question for problems you've done or you know a 2500 word essay if it was just slightly less like honestly it's it's a safe place to be I think Hartford has a very friendly reputation for that would you guys sort of agree or anything to counter yeah definitely Hartford definitely has one of those big kind of uh, uni-wide reputations for being really friendly and really open and really kind of like accepting um, I think one point to make though is that you as much as Hartford can do everything it can to make you feel safe, at the end of the day, you are moving from wherever you are living. And I know for me, that's kind of like a little out the way town. It's possibly not the nicest town, but it's a little town. It's not a big city into a city centre. It's not a massive city centre. It's not like the middle of London or Birmingham, but it is a city centre. And there's a degree of just be sensible and you'll be fine. Like, um, it is really sad that Oxford does have a really severe homeless problem. And I know that that was a big shock to me when I arrived in Freshers because we don't really have that here because we're just out the way. And there just aren't as many people that live here as live in Oxford. So I remember that being a big shock and it made me a little bit nervous. And it was like the first time I kind of encountered it. Um, and there will be lots of drunk people in the evenings because, or there was to start with, because you live in the city centre and there's nightclubs. And it's not to scare you at all because it's really, the community feels really secure. But also just be sensible, like charge your phone, take it with you, you know, keep an eye on your friends, keep an eye on your bags. Like all of the things that you'll have learned growing up at home, just bring them with you and you will be fine. Also, the yeah. city centre is quite populated with students uh, on like if nights out or whatever. If you do find yourself on your own, then there are clubs, basically. I mean, they're not amazing clubs, but like they are all on one street, basically. Uh, and there are always students, I know, going in and out of McDonald's or like, you know, going to one club or another. So it's not, I haven't actually been in an Oxford street when it's been empty, apart from like really early hours of the morning when everyone's asleep. But like, I don't know why anyone would be up at that time, unless you're going rowing, but. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean quite amusingly i live in york normally and comparatively oxford club scene is actually pretty good so i feel like it's a very much wet what you're used to type thing <laughs> so but yeah um something that we've had as well as hot reputation i don't know how much we can really answer this but um 
are the colleges which are known for particular things like drama or politically active or dance or subjects, what's trendy? What would you say to, so that's something that, you know, is very much comes and goes with the years and stuff like that. But when you're looking to apply for a college, what did you guys look for? So were you looking for any of those things or how did you like decide to apply? Um, I think for me, it was mainly I looked at the size of the cohort, so the number of like geography students that they take in each year um, to figure out like how big of a community it was. Um, so for Hartford, we take uh, like in our year, there are eight of us in our year, um, which makes it quite a nice community and a good group of people in order to collaborate with and talk to. And also means that we have three tutors, which is you know three experts in our subject that are within our college which is something that I really looked for in terms of having a big community um but I know that other people who go to other colleges that do geography they also find benefits from having a smaller group um so it really just depends on what you're looking for and then in terms of like extracurriculars and stuff there are I guess there are some colleges that are known for having good sports teams in particular sports and stuff so I know that Teddy Hall is known for rugby and stuff so if if after considering everything about your course that is something that would be important to you then I would say look for that but I would say look for especially with tutors wise look for tutors who are interested in things that you're you're interested in for your college and also just the size of the cohort that you know suits you. Wonderful. Caleb? Oh Oh, sorry. I was going to say just on the complete flip side to that um so (laughs) I did not do anywhere near enough research when looking at where to apply to colleges. Um, I never actually thought of getting, so I was like hedging my bets and just kind of like, oh, this will do. Um, but I wandered around Oxford and I wandered into Christchurch and I was like, nope, this is huge and terrifying and scary. Um, and I now have been to Christchurch quite a few times. I have some really good friends there from my year and that like now I know that like it's not scary so if you are like if you want to apply to Christchurch go for it but it was just too much for me when I was applying like I just wanted somewhere cozy and nice and I wandered into Hartford in the middle of summer and kids like students sat on the green there were like like flowers all around the doors it was nice and small and cozy but you still had this lovely kind of like aesthetic Oxford feel to it and I saw the bridge and I was like oh that'll do and then I looked at the course and then decided I wanted to apply that like after I decided I was going to apply um so I think there's kind of no one way of doing it I remember that even if your college um doesn't have the reputation for the sport that you love so I play rugby and we've really struggled to set up some kind of like women's rugby scene in Hartford we really fought for it but we just haven't got it um there's still like a university team that I go and play with there's still like like always going to be a university option so don't feel like if your college doesn't do it you can't do it I think that's something you can kind of get bogged down in especially in freshers to say that like 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 to stick in college uh, because it feels kind of safe and everyone's there and but there is a wider university there's hundreds or not hundreds there's a big group of other colleges that you can go and join in and and like I think that's the lovely thing about the collegiate system in, in Oxford is that there's always a university team or there's always a university society to join so yeah, I would echo. It's a great way of meeting people outside your college um, by joining societies and stuff. And also, I mean, at least for choirs, you don't actually have to be, for most college choirs, you don't actually have to be a member of that specific college to sing there. Or, you know, some other sub- some other societies have that kind of thing as well. So at Hartford College, like last year, we had people from Exeter, Keeble, so many different colleges. And it's just a different way of finding your feet and where you are, really. Um, anyone else got anything to add to like college choosing and the such? I chose Hartford because it's just got a really friendly reputation. Um, it's also really close to the chemistry department. It's like 100 meters down the road. So really <laughs> easy to get up late in the morning. Uh, well, not that late with chemistry, but, you know, have a bit more of a, a lion. Um, and it's right in the center of town. It's, although it's not well known by the students, I'd say, at other colleges, they're like, oh, where's Hartford? All the tourists know it as like the the college with the bridge. Um, So you're on all the postcards and everything, which is quite cool. Um, But yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just a great community. And it's, it's a small college, but it's got a decent sized student 
um, body, which is quite nice as well. And you know basically everyone there. So yeah, it's really nice. How did you um, get the impression that it was a really friendly college, like before you applied? Um, so I actually, because I decided I wanted to go to Oxford really last minute. Um, so I missed all the open days and everything. And I ended up just going into Oxford and I just wandered around several colleges. I'd already seen the ones that did chemistry. I was like, oh, these look nice from the website. Um, some colleges, I'm not going to name names, weren't too happy with a student, prospective student just walking in and wanting to look around. But Hartford was like, you know, they were, they were so helpful. They were like, oh, yeah, we'll show you around. They got students come and like came around the quad and everything. And I was like, well, this is really lovely. Um, and other colleges were like, eh, they don't really care. So it was like, yeah, yeah, they really care about students here. So it was kind of sold me with that. Um, and they have a really cute college town as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing I looked for in a college was somewhere that was central, pretty old, but also really friendly and welcoming. And I think you can actually get, even if you're not able to actually visit in person, given current circumstances, I think there's an awful lot you can get from their website. So you can really tell from the tone of how they talk about it. Um, and also that is usually for each college, I mean, Hartford definitely has one, is a stu alternative student prospectus. So most colleges have access reps who are all about outreach and like talking to people and showing you that Oxford's very diverse and actually you know even though you might not think it there's definitely a place for you so it's got loads of like different students talking about their um, experiences and the opportunities that they've got so I would really recommend looking at the alternative prospectus um, because there's just so much in there that you know you can find out and it's actually all written by students it's not like the college trying to say x y and z although we all we're all here today we all agree with what they put on about being friendly and whatnot but like it's a way to get it straight from the horse's mouth as such um but also something that we didn't actually like I, we didn't have because it wasn't necessary but because this is all online there is an amazing set of resources on hartford's website so you can do a tour of the college um you can like do a, a tutor session later today. There's also like, for some subjects there's mock tutorials. So you can watch a tutorial happen, which is basically like how an interview will kind of work, but just with one of you in the room with a tutor. So like, although you may not necessarily be able to get there immediately, um, there is so much on the website that we really recommend you guys take a look at um, today. But yeah. Um, yeah. Please watch the virtual tour because it was incredibly awkward trying to voice over that. So please, please watch it. Make it worth it. <laughs> yeah, they work really hard on it and there is a lot of nice anecdotes and, you know, you can just kind of get a vibe from that sort of thing and what the college has put on um, is something that I'd say. I don't know about the rest of you guys. But yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this session. Um, so we've been with you for this hour and the next set of students will be more than happy to answer all your questions. So yeah, just remember to keep slide, um, submitting your questions to the Slido chat box on the university website and keep asking because like our students are here all day. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning everyone, my name is Catherine, I am the STEM Outreach Officer at Hartford and in fact the next session we've got is Ask Admissions. So we've got a selection of the college's best um, admissions advice type people uh, and they are here to take all of your questions. So you can put your questions into the Slido chat box and we will do our best to work our way through them and answer everything you've got. But before we do that, uh, let's just do some brief introductions. Uh, David, would you like to start? So <clears throat> ah, my microphone wasn't working a minute ago, so I'm hoping that you can all hear me. Uh, my name is David Hopkin. I'm a historian, uh, Europeanist uh, at Hartford. I teach history at Hartford and in the university, um, but I'm also a senior tutor at the college, which means I'm kind of responsible for uh, all the academic provision uh, and also things to do with uh, admissions. Uh, I have some oversight of that. Um, so I, I should know 
answers. I, I'm not promising that I always will, um, but I, 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 I will try my best. Thank you, Lynn. Hi everyone, so I'm Lynn Featherstone and my role at Hartford is um, Director of Admissions um, and also Registrar. So for this purpose, I work with our admissions team with um, in respect of the kind of organisational aspects of the admissions process um, um, and in particular setting up um, the interviews. Um, I also work with other members of the academic office team, um, so for students when they're on course um, and working with them and supporting their teaching and their learning um, and all of the things that go on in the background um, for students once they're here. Um, so yeah, that's me, hello. And last but by no means least, Nathan. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Nathan Stasica. I am the Outreach and Communications Officer at Hartford, so I work alongside Catherine um, to organise and deliver our outreach programme working with schools and colleges um, and helping you guys understand what it's like to be a student at Oxford. Excellent, thank you all very much. We are going to take our first question. This one is from James, who asks, if offering four A-levels, do you ever make offers on all four? Or would a three A-level offer have a clause requiring a pass in a fourth, that kind of thing? Uh, I, I think the answer to that is yeah, it's three A-levels um, uh, and uh, there won't be one which in, is going to introduce a fourth a -level. It may There may be some particular subjects uh, that would specify a particular set of A-levels, i.e. You, know, you have to have chemistry, for example, for medicine. And if you were doing history, then yes, you would have to have an A in history. Um, but the, it wouldn't. There wouldn't be one which was introduced a fourth A level requirement. No. Yeah, just to add to that, um, all of the details are on the website, um, and so the subject pages of the web, the university website, in relation to, to A level combinations um, and and Hartford subjects don't deviate from from that information. Yeah. So the so the the offers that we make are standard across the university. They're not spe specific to the college. Excellent. Thank you. Um, a question now about some of the special circumstances we're in at the moment. Will the number of students admitted in 2021 entry be negatively affected by 2020 students deferring? Not very much. Uh, the, the number of deferrals is very low um, compared with the total number of applicants. Uh, so, uh, and we've also, um, for this year, discovered that we can in fact cope with more students. Um, so, um, so I don't think that the, that, that specific uh, outcome of the A-level, uh, how would one describe it? Um, uh, confusion uh, in the summer uh, will have any effect on admissions uh, in this coming round. I think that, that's, so that's true across the college, across the university as well. It's not specific, again, that's not a specific answer to Hartford. Looking ahead, if you've got a crystal ball in front of you, do you think there will be any opportunity for students who want to apply next October to actually come and visit the college before then? I definitely hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'd quite like to be back in college. <laughs> that would be lovely. <laughs> um, I, 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 yes, unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball and I don't know how this pandemic is going to pan out. Um, uh, I mean, the, the earlier on, I think we were probably thinking that there would be some opportunity by now um, uh, and that hasn't occurred. But, you know, fingers crossed, Oxford vaccine or anybody else's vaccine um, uh, or uh, any other development, um, and we'll be back towards normal sometime next year. Nathan, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I was just going to say, in the meantime, we have got a virtual tour, which I know Tash just mentioned on the previous one. She featured in the virtual tour. Um, so, you know, it's not the same as visiting the, visiting the college, but we've got pictures of the college. We've got students talking about the different areas and what they like about it. Um, so that is uh, a temporary kind of introduction to 
to college life and hopefully gives you a bit of a sense um, of what it's like to to live and study in a college, which is the kind of vibe that you'd pick up if you're coming around on it on an in-person open day. So definitely watch our virtual tour. It's on the uh, college tour tab on the university uh, open day website or on our website or on YouTube. So you should be able to find it. Thank you very much. We've got a couple of questions now, uh, one from Noah and one from Anonymous about joint courses. Um, so Noah asks if you can take a major in computer science and a minor econ in economics and management and Anonymous asks if you can study biology and fine arts at the same time. Sorry, I'll take this one. Um, so the the courses and the course structures are set out um, on those university subject pages. Um, and there is within the course, courses that are set out, um, more or less flexibility um, in terms of the, the topics and the modules that you can study. Um, but um, in Oxford, um, at undergraduate level, um, it's not possible to mix and match between you know, or with you know, between courses, um, and so computer science you can combine with um, philosophy, um, and in other um, colleges, but not Hartford, um, with maths. Um, but it's not possible to combine with economics and management, for example. There may be. Um, I would encourage you to look at the course outline to see the the range or the breadth of of courses that you could take within um, subject within that course um, but there's not flexibility across co courses alas I mean, yeah, and we don't have that kind of major and minor type format that you would experience in an American university the course that you're on is the course that you're on um, uh, so there are limits to the degree to which one can mix and match and you could also look at other the universities that might have more options for joint honours courses but not very many of them are going to offer something where it's so vastly different as biology and fine art doing them together um, so lots of joint honours courses at Oxford and beyond are combining subjects that are similar or that have some kind of lesson to teach the other one like computer science and philosophy um, so you're probably not going to be happy finding it's true of England together. but uh, if, if Caitlin was on the call she'd probably tell you in Scotland you can more or less mix and match anything you like but that's a Scotland has a four-year degree program and it's very different what you could also think about if you've got quite wide-ranging interests at this stage is what you're interested in doing um, academically um, and what perhaps you're interested in um, extracurricularly um, or in terms of a career after your degree. So there are a number of um, student societies, um, business economics um, and a whole range of different societies where um, any students are welcome to join. You don't have to be studying a particular subject in, in order to participate. And in many of those cases, people you know, combine the skills that they get from their academic degree with the skills they get from doing some extracurricular activity that they enjoy. So if you, for example, there's lots of people who go to Oxford, go on and get a job in theatre or acting, and we don't have a course in drama, but we do have a very big extracurricular scene in drama and theatre. So there's, there is lots of opportunity to get involved in things that are not the very specific degree that you're studying. Excellent, lovely answers. Thank you very much. Uh, back to sort of admissions process here. Question from Anonymous. Do you consider GCSE grades? How much weighting do you give to GCSE grades? And if you do, then do you differentiate between an eight and a nine GCSE grade when it comes to shortlisting candidates? I didn't know you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, there are, um, so as part of the process, um, all colleges um, have signed up to an agreement whereby different subjects will have different ways of um, looking at all the evidence um, and some will um, put more or less weight on GCSEs. So the important thing to do, I keep saying this, but go to the subject page on the university website um, for details of, of how GCSEs are factored in um, in your particular subject. Um, as a general rule, um, well, eights and nines are considered to be very high and excellent and well done. Um, and um, we are looking at your GCSE performance um, 
in the context of everything else about your application. So it's one indicating factor, but it's not the only thing we have, you know, we know about you. Um, so um, we do consider them to be important, otherwise they wouldn't be on the form and we wouldn't be looking at them. But there are other measures by which we are assessing your um, your potential to do well on the courses at Oxford. Um, and whilst there are these um, subject kind of differences, um, as a general rule, I think David might want to say some more about this, we're obviously looking more at where you're going academically than where you've come from. And so whilst GCSEs do play a part, um, actually the, the information that we have that's you know, about you now and about how we feel you will perform when you, yeah, if you're awarded a place and come to Oxford is um, arguably more, more relevant in a general sense. Yeah, so there's no kind of bar, there's no kind of, you have to have nine nines or you know, two nines even. Uh, um, there's, there's, so it, GCSEs, feed into the decision-making processes, but in the same way as all the other information that we would have about uh, any candidate. Um, and we we are looking, as you say, as, at trajectory, we are looking at, uh, and we would also be in a position to, if we had information about performance, uh, GCSE, which had been affected by particular circumstances, that would also be taken into account. So as with almost anything that we're gonna talk about, today in admission tests or uh, interviews or anything like that, none of these are critical in and of themselves. They, they, they all form part of the, the background to decision-making, but they're not, uh, they, no one factor is taken uh, in and of itself. Okay, we're going to dip back into the question about um, 2021 entry places, um, specifically with a view to medicine, because there are limited resources, there are caps on numbers for medicine. Um, so is there anything you'd like to add, particularly on that front? As regards deferred places and how that will affect people looking to, to, to start in 2021? Well, I think that the, the same print, um, principle holds that you know um that actually we're looking at a very small number relatively of deferred candidates of, you know in, in any subject um medicine is in any year really competitive it's a very popular course and of course there are you know uh, yeah, um, numbers that are determined by by external factors um as well as within the university um if you want to apply for medicine and you want to do the course and you want to become a doctor that's the course you apply for and you should go for it uh, and not worry too much about, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the numbers. Um, I would add that there are a number of other courses that touch on the, the kind of things that you learn in, in some aspects of the medicine course, um, in other science courses um, that aren't actually as um, in terms of the numbers, as, as popular or as competitive. Um, and so if what you're interested in is the academic um, and the theoretical side of um, things to do with medicine, um, then we would always encourage students to, to think about alternatives to that course. Um, so though we don't offer it at Hartford, there's a biomedical course. Um, there, there's also um, biochemistry, um, chemistry, biology um, that we do offer at Hartford. Um, and so if you're still thinking about you know, the course that you want to study in and what that means in terms of the next steps for your career, then then don't close down all your options. But if you want to be a doctor and you want to do undergraduate medicine, then that's what you apply for. And good luck. Thank you. OK, we're going more general now. How important is work experience for the selection process? I think they, so there the, the will be slightly different answers depending on subject. So medicine will be one where some degree of uh, demonstration of um, a willingness to work with human beings um, uh, is, is actually quite important. Um, by and large, though, for all you know, Oxford degrees are, are, are largely academic degrees the, the, that we're interested in your academic potential um, and that's first and foremost uh, so if you're applying to do history um, and you've worked in a museum you know that's interesting and you know, we'd definitely like to hear about that on your personal statement but that isn't going to 
that isn't going to be a major factor in the uh, admissions criteria. Um, uh, it, I suppose it works the other way around. That if What we're really looking for are people who are genuinely enthusiastic and committed to the subject that they want to study. And people who are like that, who have that sense of commitment, are quite often doing other things. They're, 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 they will be demonstrated by the fact that they are working, say, with a local museum or um, uh, uh, some kind of history outreach or something like that. Um, so it's not that that's a criteria. It isn't. Um, but it's quite likely that the two things go together, that people who are really keen on something are keen on it in several aspects of their life. I guess I'd also say it's important that if you have done work experience or volunteering or whatever it might be, and you're writing about it in your personal statement, that you actually say what you learned from it and what was interesting. Um, you know, rather than just saying, I did this thing, aren't I great? Um, you know, as David says, that's not a criteria in itself. So what did you what did you get out of the experience? Yeah. What did you learn? What skills did you pick up? What do you want to find more more out about? Uh, that's what we're interested in seeing rather than just seeing that you can list things that you've done. That's it. it's exactly how it would work in a history interview. If someone said, oh, I've worked in a museum. Think, well, that's good. But, you know, what did, what did you reflect as a consequence of that? What did that tell you about how history is constructed and portrayed for a, a particular public? Um, what kind of gaps do you see in uh, uh, the provision there? So in your local history museum, you know, might have something. Hey, I'll, I'll give you a precise example. The, 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 um, uh, I used to work in a, a local history museum and they had hundreds of wedding dresses, which is the kind of thing which people keep. But they had nothing of the work clothes which are from the past because it's the kind of thing people throw away. So it's that kind of, that kind of reflective uh, uh, response to um, experiences of that kind, which is what we're looking for. Lovely stuff. Right. Um, I'm seeing a couple of repeat questions, uh, one from James and one from Libby. If you asked your question earlier and we marked it as answered, that's because we answered it. So if you want to scroll back a little bit through the live stream, which you should be able to do if you're on the web page or on YouTube, then maybe you'll be able to catch what we said for an answer there. Um, we have a question from Ritisha asking, and I'm really sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, asking what would you be looking for in an English student? Um, if you want to talk to an English student, we've actually got one coming up next uh, on this live chat, so you can put your questions to them. Um, we also will have an English tutor in our um, tutors Q&A, which is on uh, the other bit of Slido uh, in the Meet the Tutors section. Um, so you can, you can put your questions about um, English students to students or to tutors, whichever you prefer. Um, I have a question here about personal statements. Um, specifically, are you more concerned with material that has influenced us and our comments on this, or about what we have done and more about ourselves? What do we look for in a personal statement? Okay, well, I'll give you an answer from from my experience about this. So there might be some kind of particular, as all you know, we're going to preface this with you know, that subjects may be slightly different. If you I mentioned that in medicine, you probably do need to indicate that you have had that experience of working with people in um, some kind of uh, medical scenario, um, but. Basically, I mean, a personal statement for people at Oxford is, is, again, it's not going to be the kind of thing which is going to uh, guarantee you uh, uh, a place at Oxford. Uh, it's, it, it's interesting for us, but it's not in and of itself uh, a determinative factor. It, uh, what it allows us to do is when you come to interview or where, when we see you on zoom or whatever it is uh, as a in an interview scenario there are a series of things that, that you've laid out that you are happy to talk to us about so things either experiences or things that which you've read uh the places that you've been 
uh, things which you, you, you would be able to reflect on and that we could have some kind of conversation and discussion about. So it's a kind of series of hooks. You know, the, these are the things which I, I'm absolutely happy to talk about. Um, uh, and that's you know, what we are keen to see. Now, bear in mind, of course, that personal statements have to serve more than one purpose. So you, they, if, you, if you're applying to Oxford, you're also going to be applying to other universities. So you have to think about framing your personal statement so that it, it also works for other institutions. But that's how we use them. Um, uh, when, when we're not tot totting up UCAS points or those kinds of things. We're looking for a kind of the basis of some kind of discussion about academic matters. Okay, thank you. Um, one quick fire question here. I know we've only got a few minutes till we are handing over to the next group. Um, so, do PPE applicants have to take an additional admissions test prior to the interviews in additional, uh, additionally to the TSA? No, there's a, the TSA um, and the important thing there to remember is to sign up for it. So follow the information that's on the relevant pages of the university website. Um, and also to note that the, the date of the TSA has changed from what was previously advertised this year. Um, so just double check if you're applying for PPE or any of the courses that do the TSA that you've got the right date and you have to apply before the UCAS deadline of the 15th of October. Lovely stuff. And last question, I reckon here. Um, what would make a candidate stand out in an interview? That's a, that's a very subject specific question. Um, I'm not sure that there is a general answer that one can give there. Uh, but I think across the board, uh, what we're looking for uh, in an interview scenario is that kind of you know, evidence of that enthusiasm for the subject. But that enthusiasm cannot be, if you like, just a kind of, a very kind of general, I love it, I love it, I love it. It has to be, there has to be some kind of reflective quality to it. Um, uh, so that you're able to kind of discriminate and see where, um, uh, you know, what might be a more plausible answer, what's a less plausible answer uh, to a particular question. Um, what we, one thing which comes up in interviews is that we're looking also for flexibility. So it's not a question of just saying, uh, I have this view uh, and I'm going to argue it come what may. Um, if we're if in an interview scenario, people are giving you new information and saying, OK, you said this, but what if I told you something else that people should be able to take that new information on board and process it and reflect on whether that makes a change to their answer. Uh, and the reason you know, flexibility is is a kind of key issue is, of course, that this is the way we actually teach. We work, uh, uh, we, we work with students in tutorials. In tutorials, we're discussing the work they've done. We're then suggesting to them uh, that there are things which they could do more or differently. And what we, we want to see is that they're able to process that uh, and, uh, and you know, grow uh, uh, in their subject. Does anyone have anything they would like to add to that? No? Uh, I, uh, oh, my um, my uh, cheesy thing that I always say is that an Oxford interview is a bit like a GCSE maths exam in that even if you don't get the right answer, you can still get some marks you're working out. Okay, so it doesn't matter necessarily if you don't know what the right answer to the question is. There might not be a right answer to the question. But if you can talk out loud and share with the interviewers your thought process and how you're getting there, you might still pick up some marks, if you like, if yeah. it were a GCSE maths exam. That, that, that is absolutely, absolutely right. That's absolutely So, I, I mean, in some subjects, there are right answers, but that even in there, uh, like history, it's not so much the, 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 what the answer is, it's the process by which you derive the answer. You know, can, you, can you think through the problems which are, uh, are being laid out in front of you? So, yeah, don't, 
don't retreat completely and say, I don't know. I mean, people complete, it's completely reasonable to say in an interview, we ask you a particular question um, about you know, Mussolini's uh, uh, Italy, and you say, I don't know. But if you then were willing to kind of, but I could speculate, and this would be what I think from the knowledge which I have, this is what I think might have occurred, then that, that's what we would quite like to see. Right, I think that brings us to the end of our half hour slot here. We will be back later on today. Um, so you can catch uh, another Ask Admissions session at half past 12 and then again at half past two. So if we haven't got round to answering your questions, I'm very sorry for a start, um, but do feel free to come back at, at those times and drop us a line again and we will do our best to get through everything. Um, but I think it's probably time for us to hand back to the students. So thank you all very much. Bye. Bye. Uh, okay, cool. Um, oh, my laptop's being red. Um, cool. So we're the next group of students, and we're here to answer your questions. Um, so the uh, link is on the screen where you can submit your questions, or you can go to the university website um and sorry okay if you go to this link you can submit your questions through slider and we'll try and answer them um we're all students at hartford and so we can talk about hartford what hartford is like we can talk about our courses we can just talk about oxford in general so literally ask us anything we'll be here until 11 45. um first we will introduce ourselves and what we're studying. So um, I'm Karina and I am a third year and I'm studying geography. Jay, do you want to go next? Hi, so I'm Jay. I'm a third year and I'm studying engineering. If you want to like nominate someone once you're done. Charlotte? Awesome. Hi, yeah, I'm Charlotte um, and I am a, a third year biochemist. Um, so just going into my, uh, my third year at Hartford. Um, and I am pretty involved in kind of like uh, the bar in Hartford. So if you have any uh, questions about that, like let me know. Um, and that's about it really. Um, hi, I'm Slader. I'm also a third year and I do English. Cool. We are expecting George as well, I think, but maybe he's late, so that's fine. Um, Cool. So yeah, if you were asking an admissions related question, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to answer them probably. We're better off coming back at 12.30 or 2.30. But any questions about courses or about life at Hartford, we can definitely answer. Um, also, George, sorry, I have some, sorry, I have some technical issues. Hi, I'm George. Um, I'm just starting my second year um, at Hartford studying Spanish and Portuguese. Cool. Um, so... We have a question. We haven't, yeah, okay. People submit your questions. Um, but we can answer these questions from before. Um, okay, wait. Um, sorry. While we're waiting for some questions to come in, I reckon, okay, here we have a question. Oh my, sorry guys, my. Does everyone want to go around and say their favorite thing about Hartford? Just no, to kind of get the ball. Okay. Sorry, my 
laptop was being really annoying. Okay, what is your favourite activity to do through the college? And how is the food? Who wants to go first? Go on then. Um, so my favourite activity probably in terms of like extracurricular is like getting involved with rugby. So um, I used to uh, play with the uni and then when I decided that I kind of wanted to um, kind of play it a bit more casually I got involved with um, the college side of things um, and so we play a thing called cuppers um, and it's there's uh, cuppers for everything that you can possibly imagine from like quizzing darts to like classic you know sports um, and things like that um, and it's essentially just a big competition between colleges um, and so that's a really really nice thing to get involved with in terms of the food I don't personally eat that much at Hartford and um, so I'll leave that to somebody else to um to kind of have a go at and that's got opinions on food um or about their general college activities in general um I eat in college a fair bit so I can talk a bit about food I mean it's quite varied um um and you get like um I mean it might be changing a little bit with the pandemic but you do get um breakfast dinner and lunch um during the weekdays and then um brunch on the weekends and everyone really likes brunch um so that's nice um I like going to hall mo mostly because then I get to see my friends because everyone's timetables are a bit different um so it's like a nice time to catch up with someone with people um but we also do have kitchens so I like to cook myself as well so if you want that flexibility um that's there and it's really great and the lucky bugs, all of the incoming people have got newly refurbished kitchens in, uh, in Hollywell, which if you've watched the virtual tour, is the kind of the main place that um, most freshers live uh, in their first year. And there's some beautiful new kitchens that we didn't have the pleasure That's of using. So so. Yeah, if you are interested in finding out about more, more about the accommodation and the food at Hartford, if you go onto the... Uh, the Hartford page on the University Open Day website there's a tab that says food and accommodation and there's a video you can watch there I'll just tell you all about that um, does anyone else want to talk about things activities in college there's lots of sport and like Charlotte was saying and music as well but I don't know if anyone here is involved in that I mean I'm happy to talk a bit about like the LGBT society so Hartford has a really strong LGBT cohort um and you know we do kind of like we have a we have an lgbtq plus rep who organizes like socials um and yeah hartford's pretty inclusive um so i can talk a little bit about that um if anyone has any questions more specifically to that but that's most of what i get involved with in the college yeah also brunch oh i love brunch <laughs> brunch is so good yeah, I wouldn't say I'm super involved in things at college, but I know a lot of people that are. So Hartford has, I think it's the university's largest non-auditioning orchestra and or music society, something like that. But we have a non-auditioning orchestra and a choir and a jazz band um, and lots of people get involved in that. And that's really nice. There's so many uh, things in terms yeah. of like to get involved with with music, even if you're not um uh, particularly experienced as uh, as Karina said like a lot of um, the ensembles are non-auditioning um, our music service is one of the biggest in, in Oxford and um, everyone is really really welcoming and quite inclusive um, in, in all activities to be honest in Hartford even if you are new to things um, and they get in, you know in terms of the music society they get involved in, in so many things that go on so um, Usually if we have in a, a formal or maybe um, a kind of a social, the jazz band might play or um, when it gets around to Christmas time, we usually have carols in the quad. So um, our Hartford choir go out and everybody uh, has mince pies and mulled wine and tea and coffee and um, uh, just listen to some nice uh, carols in the quad or sing along and it's, re it's really really nice um, and they have concerts all the time in University Church which is just down the road from Hartford um, literally a stone's throw um, so that's a really really nice thing to get involved with I'm sure that if George is still with us he can talk a little bit about languages because I know that he's involved in many many things as languages yeah sure so um, at Hartford at Hartford specifically I don't think there are any 
language based societies but maybe that's an idea for next year but um in terms of like the university there's there's a lot going on with languages um it's a really vibrant place where where languages are concerned so like last year um so they do like um so you can opt for a course at the language center which um which um usually which i believe but check this um i believe that that Hartford can pay a bit towards. Um, I'm not fully sure of the exact amount, and I, and I will check it beforehand. Um, but but yeah, so that's really good. So there are, there are loads of, of languages on offer where where you can essentially pick up a new one or continue one from A level that you didn't want to do at degree level. And so that's really good for keeping up languages. And also um, they also have lectures for for like certain languages that just appears. In certain terms so i did romanian last last term for like like eight sessions of it and it was brilliant i really enjoyed it so yeah there's a lot of um of, of different languages you can pick up and, and just try for a bit if you want to um and also there's a language like exchange event that happens every tuesday i believe and essentially people people who who just want to practice practice languages from all kinds of languages from french to japanese to german to chinese um there's a, there's a lot to, to choose from and you can just go and speak and um, and enjoy conversing so yeah there's a lot to offer in terms of languages um on the extracurricular side of things cool thanks guys so um just to answer the person who's asking, is it found upon if you don't apply to a specific college and just apply with an open application? The answer is no, you can apply to wherever you want or you can do an open application and it doesn't affect your chances of getting in. Um, the college you apply for, whether you do an open application doesn't make a difference on your chances of getting in. So just do whatever you want um, and it doesn't matter. Um, okay, next question. But obviously we think Hartford is the best. So if you're trying to choose a college to apply for, apply to Hartford, um, which links to the next question, what is the best things about Hartford College and why is it better than others? Aida, do you want to start? Yeah, so what I love about Hartford is that like the community is very friendly and down to earth. Like everyone is always up for a chat. Um, our college is like quite small as well. So all the first years live on site and like, um, the upper years live off-site but it means in your first year you get to meet people so quickly and you just always bump into people and I really really like that and also our location is I think one of the best in Oxford you're so close to literally everything um, so yeah those two things I absolutely love about Hartford. Yeah, yeah I'd say the same to be honest. George do you want to add? Yeah, sure. So um, one thing that I kind of noticed when I first visited um, Hartford when I was on Unique um, back in year 12 um, is actually, so Oxford is quite a busy, quite a bustling city. And so when you, when I walked into Hartford, it felt like a kind of like um, a peaceful ink, like, um, what's the word? A peaceful kind of... Um, like, Oasis. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, like a portal into like a a really peaceful space within but still right in the center of the city and so um i i kind of really liked the kind of peaceful nature of the college and and um and and all of that side of things and um also everyone is super friendly um i don't think i mean i i think hartford is probably one of the friendliest colleges in my view and um yeah um I, in first year you really do get to know everyone um because as as Sider said, you're always bumping into people all the time. So it's, it's, you know, um, so yeah, it's really friendly and, and yeah, great. I think most people would probably say um, in terms of their favorite thing is definitely usually to do with the people, you know, um, I think as a college, it tends to attract people who are um, quite down to earth as, as Sadie said, and quite, just just diverse you know the the whole community I think in terms of interests in terms of personalities we have a very kind of like rich community and I think that adds into the whole kind of friendly uh, vibe that we've got going on um, and you know we have a little bit of a reputation I suppose in the wider sense of like amongst other colleges that we are a little bit of a party college um, that's not to say that we are um, you know 
going to ram it down everyone's throat. But um, we, you know, it is there if you want to partake. Do you know what I mean? Um, which I is something that I really, really wanted. I know that when I was choosing whether or not to come to Oxford, even not even in terms of colleges, um, was whether I thought that there was going to be kind of nightlife that was going to suit me, whether the, the university life was going to be similar to other universities um, and things like that. And I personally got the feeling from Hartford when I visited and when I met some of the students that there were going to be people who wanted to maybe go out or wanted to you know um kind of have a bit more of a, of a, um, a party kind of social life um just like a lot of a, a lot of other universities and it kind of um put my put my nerves at ease because I, I was kind of not really sure whether Oxford in general was going to be for me um, or whether I should go to kind of like a different university where it's maybe a little bit more central and people get to know each other in flats and things like that but college is so small it's really in terms of geographically that you will just run into people so even if you're not necessarily living with a designated flat of people um your whole college is kind of your you know like your whole year group becomes your housemates if you will because we get to know each other really really quickly cool thanks guys on that subject next question is is there a wine cellar and a student pub at hartford how was social life pre-covid charlotte back to you <laughs> so i'm currently um the bar rep so um kind of events or things that go on in the bar i'm kind of like manning and slash organizing um so yes we do have a bar um and it is underground and it's referred to as dtb just like down the bar um and it was you know it was hustling before you know pre pre-covid it was it was a pretty pretty lively place um we've had um kind of like the uh, rugby world cup on um on like projector screens then there on the weekends we've had like quiz nights we had theme nights so we have a, a women's night and an lgbt social night um which i'm sure jay can talk a little bit about um and we just generally host lots of different events so if someone came to me and was like oh hiya yeah. um this team is having um a bit of a social so maybe the football team or the netball team or whoever they were like oh we want to ha have a bit of a social um, they would book out part of the bar so um, essentially we've got like three rooms really um, and you can book out like like the bigger side of the bar or you could book out the smaller side of the bar depending on what you want to do um, and essentially it's just a really nice space even just to kind of socialize in the daytime there's a cafe in terms of a wine cellar um, we're not really a winey college uh, if I'm <laughs> totally honest um, in, in more ways than one but no we 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 have wine should you uh wish to partake but um it's it's actually in cans so if that gives you any idea of of uh our relationship yeah. with different types of wine then yeah we have one red we have one white we have one rose there and they're all in cans so yeah you can buy wine at formal, you buy Hartford wine at formal dinner yes that's, yes that's that's what you have to do if you want your Hartford yeah. wine yeah true but no we don't have a wine cellar um and but generally it was it was great and we're one of i think um not many colleges so we're all student staffed really um so that's a really really nice thing um about Hartford's bar I think is because it's going to be someone you know that's behind the bar um and there's a bit of like a mutual respect thing going on like nothing ever kicks off down there it's it's, it's but it's a really lively place so um yeah we don't know what it's going to be like post-COVID, but hey. Um, we've got a few questions building up, so I will we'll move on to those. But just to add that there's also lots of non-alcoholic social events organised by college and by the entertainment reps of college. So if that's also not your thing, that's completely fine. And you'll still have lots of nice social events to go to. And you can also go to the bar and not drink, which is what something I've done plenty of times. And that's nice. Um, Okay, next question. How much of the time is spent in college? Does anyone have an answer for that? Um, I think okay. it really oh, I think it really depends on kind of where you want to spend your time. So in first year, all the first years, um, I believe, live on site. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess a lot of your time will be spent in college. Um, and then in second year, we're only like... It, well South Oxford is like a five minute bike ride maybe like a 10-15 minute walk away so like you can kind of pop to college there's a library on site so and there's a gym on site so like I know I spend quite a lot of 
time on site because I really like kind of cycling into work and doing my work in the library and then cycling home at the end of the day so it really just it really just depends um but the nice thing about Hartford is that again when you're on site you bump into people that you know all the time and like you know at lunchtime I can always like find someone to go grab lunch with like it's really nice so yeah also if you tend to do like a a language combination where one of one of the languages doesn't have a tutor at Hartford like Portuguese for example then you actually get to do quite a lot of um like college hopping which is really good fun because basically um each each Portuguese tutor that I had last year is in a different college so I spent quite a lot of time at St Anne's um I this year I'm going to be at Lincoln a lot and and maybe at Jesus as well so that's Jesus College um and so I think um when you when you choose like a smaller language in terms of like university-wide tutorial provision you actually get to see a, a lot of colleges which is nice yeah I mean I think a lot of I think a lot of subjects will have tutorials in other colleges which is like George says really nice and it means that you're not spending all your time in college um personally I had tutorials with the geography tut half the geography tutors um and I also had some with tutors from other colleges which is quite fun and it means that you're you're not like being taught whatever by all you're not being taught everything by two people you're being taught by the specialists the experts who are might be at other colleges but so it gives you the opportunity which is really cool um okay next question uh is there a lot of interaction between undergrad students and the grad students at Hartford does anyone have I feel like the answer is not very much unless anyone can say they've had lots of interaction yeah Charlotte um so I think generally across the board it's probably like less so um we do have like the MCR it's like JCR versus MCR so all that means is like um junior common room and mature common room and so if you're like a postgraduate you would be part of the MCR so the mature common room and if you're an undergraduate you're part of the JCR which is the, the junior common room um and so I think generally for most people correct me if I'm wrong but there's not a lot of uh interaction but I, through playing like uni sport, I got to know quite a lot of postgrads, even if they weren't necessarily at Hartford. Um, I um, I'm still really good friends with a couple of postdocs at the minute who are like just kind of working and living in Oxford. Um, and so you, it, it's it's up to personal preference really. Um, if you kind of get to know them through uh, different. Um, societies or whatever it's not like they're not going to want to talk to you because you're an undergrad <laughs> um <laughs> but it's just because I think it's like you see them less frequently that it's kind of normally but you know yeah it's not total segregation essentially yeah and I imagine that if you none of us would be hugely involved in um Hartford clubs but if you are involved in like one of the music societies within Hartford or something like that then I'm sure you're more likely to bump into postgrads or the Hartford politics and economic society um and things like that um and yeah I can certainly say the same as Charlotte that I've met lots of postgrads um through extracurricular activities across the university um okay next question how many hours of study do you do outside of your lectures or they've written supervisions but at Oxford we call them tutorials so how many hours of study outside lectures or tutorials in a day do you think people do maybe we could get an answer from a range of uh subjects so did you want to talk about English first um I really can't pick a certain number of hours it really depends um <laughs> sort of what I have on that week because I might have like a class and an essay due which means that I probably have to spend a bit more time in the library or just like reading like books in preparation um so yeah I think with like humanities there's a bit more flexibility as to how you structure your days and how much time you spend um and stuff like that um yeah so I tend to like go to a few lectures in the morning and then spend the afternoon in the library preparing for a class or a tutorial essay um, but it changes so much from day to day. And I really like that flexibility as well. Yeah, different subjects will have different number of contact hours. So I think social sciences and humanities are relatively similar with uh, spending quite a lot of time studying because you don't have that many contact hours. Um, Jay, do you want to talk about engineering or just um, science? 
in yeah. general? Um, so just like a quick summary, we have like, we run two lecture courses a week and each lecture course is four lectures and the lectures are an hour long. So um, eight hours of lectures a week. <laughs> My maths is great. Um, and then I think like every, every week or every few weeks we'll have like an afternoon of labs. Um, so it's hard, it's hard to say how many hours outside of contact hours I spend working, but I try and work a nine to five day um, and maybe do like a bit of stuff over the weekend. Um, so I think like my general advice is just like, if you treat it kind of like a nine to five, um, I'm sure I don't actually manage eight hours in a day. I probably manage much less than that, but that's kind of what I'm kind of going for such that I'm not like overworking, but I'm also getting like a good kind of chunk of work done every day. Um, but I think if you're worried about like workload, um, I'd say it's pretty manageable, um, at least for my subject. I don't know about everyone else, but um, yeah, pretty, pretty manageable. So, yeah. I think it's important to kind of say that, you know, um, a lot of the time it's about how much time you want to spend on it um you know a lot of people will say okay I've got to get this done and this done for the deadline or whatever and you can probably condense that down into a, like a really manageable you know amount of time in a week um but a lot of people are, are very very passionate about what they study and a lot of people really want to do some extras and that's not to say that you um that you have to do that it's just that um, it's something to be aware of kind of coming into it. It's something that I've got used to where some weeks I'll feel like, yeah, I want to do a bit extra. I want to go on and look at maybe a couple of these things from the reading list or I want to do a bit of extra work. But it's something to bear in mind that if you do go and you do uh, end up kind of studying whatever subject you want to study at, um, at Oxford, that there will be some people that seem like they're working all the time and that's not always the case and it's also not always necessary for you know to do well in your subject and and to get the most out of your degree like you don't have to be working all the time but some people want to and so it's it's all about personal preference as well yeah cool thanks guys oh yeah george did you want to add yeah i, d I just wanted to add that um um for languages it um you have quite a lot of contact hours because you have both the language element of your course and you also have the literature element of your course. So like you'd have maybe three or four lectures a week um, and then you'd also have language classes and, and, and all that kind of stuff as well. So um, that um, so you have a, a fair amount of contact hours and then you also get maybe an essay a week. So, um, I mean, it is definitely manageable. Um, I think everyone adapts to the workload differently. Um, I know it took me um, a, a few weeks to really get, get used to it. But um, that um, that wasn't because of the amount of work. It, it was just because of of the fact that actually at university in general and at Oxford, it is a different way of working to A-levels. So um, so that's something that I had to adjust to. But um, everyone finds their own rhythm. Everyone manages it. And um, yeah, um, it is definitely manageable. It's just planning and and, um, and understanding your day and, like, um, and, and your schedule, really. Oh, thanks guys. Um, so yeah, if you're watching, please keep submitting your questions. You can go to the Oxford University uh, Open Day website and then go to Hartford and there's a slider thing where you can submit questions or you can go to tiny.cc forward slash Hartford slider, I think is the link, and you can submit them there as well. Um, so next question is, what is the food like? I've heard that it is a very mixed standard. Uh, the link is tiny.cc forward slash ask Hartford. So if you go there, you can submit questions. Um, yeah, so does anyone want to talk about food? We yeah. kind of touched on it earlier, so maybe just a brief answer. Yeah, so I do tend to eat a fair bit in college or like in our other um, catering service, like our offsite. Um, the thing is like you get to see the timetable of what's like of, of the menu like in advance so you kind of know which stuff you like and which stuff you don't really want to eat so on those days I just cook for myself and stuff like that um and you know which food that you do enjoy so you I'd go to hall for those um you can also submit like feedback about food so if you really didn't like something you can let them know um I think the good the food is good, but you've got to realize that they are cooking for a lot of people in a short space of time. So it's not going to be like incredibly amazing, but it's still a good food. So yeah. 
And as I said, there are kitchens. So if you really don't like eating in hall, you can just cook for yourself. Um, so yeah. And they try to cater for sort of most mainstream dietary requirements, at least vegetarian and vegan, definitely. There are options. Um, I'm not sure about other more specific dietary requirements. And um, just a quick note on brunch. So every Saturday and Sunday, yeah, it is on Sunday as well, isn't it? It's it's yeah. Birthday, yeah. Um, so there's a brunch that kind of runs from like ten to like one ish, I, I believe, something like that. And um, yeah, it's it's really cheap, it's really nice, it's really filling, and yeah, it's um, it's like just over three pounds for for like the stuff that I get. Um, I'm not sure how much it is per item, but yeah, it is definitely cheap. Um, also quickly you can go to formal dinners a couple of times a week and those are free course meals uh, a bit more fancy so if you wanted that to just sort of you know as a nice thing to do over the weekend there's also an option to do that um, and formals aren't expensive either compared to, uh, to bed, um, compared to three course meals in a restaurant or something like I, I believe they're around the nine ten pound mark whenever, whenever I've had them um, obviously check that on, on the website but it's around that kind of price which for a three course meal is really isn't as much as i should pay most restaurants i don't think so yeah and also you're with your friends in a candlelit hall with a gown on which is also quite cool well thanks guys um so we've got a couple of questions now about uh clubs and societies so what type of clubs are there for politics at Hartford? Does anyone know much about the Hartford Politics and Economic Society? Yes, Charlotte. I've <laughs> been to a couple of events. Um, I'm not really like really heavily involved, um, but essentially that's the beauty of it, I think, um, because they have um, different speakers. I know one of the seminar uh, seminars that I went to um, was from one of the negotiators for Brexit. He was um, uh, one of Theresa May's um, chief ne negotiators um, and he gave a talk. He's actually Hartford alumni. Um, so like he went to the college um, and he gave like a, a bit of a speech about the civil service or whatever and then um, there was the opportunity to go for like dinner afterwards with him and like ask him some questions and things like that um, and there was stuff like that going on like all the time so um, there's like lots of discussions panels we've had so many speakers in um, for from different areas of politics and, and economics um, our outgoing principal was um, uh, quite a prolific economist and um, so he got loads of really great guests in and they're, they're just kind of rolling with it now um, it's it's quite a um, quite a happening society at Hartford um, and yeah so you get the opportunity to have dinners asking lots of questions and you don't have to be a member necessarily necessarily to go along to some of the talks or events if it's just one specific thing that you're interested in like myself cool thank you so yeah there's lots of opportunities to get involved in that and you can be on you can also apply to be on the committee for the H hpes um if you want to be the one inviting the speakers um the next question is what are the music or drama societies um so there's music societies within Hartford. There's also various student drama productions that I think are run by Hartford students. And then there's the University, uh, Oxford University Music Society, OUMS, which has like a million orchestras and wind bands and different things you can get involved in. I'm sure they've got a website that you could look at um, and see all the different things, some auditioning, some non-auditioning. And there's also the Oxford University Drama Society. I think that's what it's called. Um, and within that, there's like lots of different student production companies and they put on loads of shows and stuff. Um, and that's really cool because it's just all the students running, um, running everything. Um, and then you can go see your friends in these productions. That's really cool. Does anyone have any, I think, extra to add about that? Just briefly. I think, ooh, I think if you're really yeah. interested in like drama, um, Oxford is a really good place to kind of get into it because we have the Oxford Playhouse, um, which basically is the kind of perfect gateway into the kind of really kind of professional stuff um, because it is, you know, a professional um, theatre. So um, if you really are interested in your drama, um, whether it's like behind, behind the scenes or on stage, then I think Oxford is a really, really good place for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Um, 
And the next question is one well, I'm very intrigued by everyone's answers to in the top tips. Do you procrastinate to do your work? If so, how do you try not to? Who's got some expert advice about, I'm sure, doesn't everyone procrastinate? I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm procrastinating, procrastinating right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I tend to procrastinate from doing the bits of my course I really don't like by doing bits of the course that I do like because I found that this is the most effective way so if there's something that I really don't want to do for example there's a bunch of questions right this moment that um I should be doing but um if it's something like that where I just I'm like oh I just really don't want to do it and I'm kind of putting it off I'll just be like you know what I'm going to procrastinate by by doing by doing some revision notes for this lecture course that I like and and so I end up being a little bit productive with the procrastination just just to save myself from doing like no work um so yeah that is a tip if you're like there's something that you really don't like procrastinate it with doing bits of uh work that you do like and then come back to it afterwards I procrastinate oh, I by no, sorry. Oh, I'm just going to yeah. say I procrastinate by making elaborate revision planners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> top yes, tip. Also, yeah. No, I think the productive procrastination is definitely something that I do. Um, I'm on like, I've been, I've had, oh, it's my Wi Fi. Yeah, I've had committee roles for quite a lot of different Oxford societies so I just do like my committee admin work instead of doing my actual Oxford work because I need to do it anyway and it still feels productive um <laughs> so I don't know George anything else um last year's so um in in Hollywell Quad um at Hartford there's the JCR which is like a common room for 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 members of the of the JC, of the JCR, and in there there's a table a tennis table, and uh, last year whenever like me or like my friend were, were like about to do some work, we'd like message you know do you want to play a table tennis? And so we'd play like two or three games, and like half an hour was gone. And you're like oh I should I should be working, but it's kind of sports that's so kind of good for you. So <laughs> we, we tried to we, we tried to like justify it in that way, but um, it was procrastination in effect. <laughs> I think there's a, there's a big thing to say that like I think your work expands to fill the time that you give it so I try and like fill my days with lots of like seeing friends and clubs and activities and sports such that like I don't kind of feel like there's time when I should be procrastinating because like you know I just the work expands to fill the time so I just do my work and then I go see my friends so I think that's quite a good tip is that like don't feel like you can't sign up to anything because you need to do your work because otherwise all you'll do is work and procrastinate work um so yeah um also just to add quickly i feel like um academic life at oxford is a bit different to other universities in that we get more deadlines and more mm -hmm. frequent um i feel with i know from my friends a lot of their deadlines come at the end of term whereas i get an essay due at least once a week so I kind of have to do the work. I'm very bad with procrastination, but the work does get done. And I <laughs> definitely agree with Jay in terms of the, there's so much going on at Oxford that you can just like slot in other things to do. And in that way, your work just has to get done. It definitely takes time to like get used to that. But yeah, it is manageable. Yeah, deadlines are a good motivator. <laughs> but I think also if you realise you're actually you're not getting any work done and you need to, um, organising to work with other people is quite good. Even if you're not actually working together, like you'd be like, you'd be like do you want to go to the library at 9am tomorrow morning? And then you have to do it because you've said you'll do it. Um, and then even though you're not talking to each other, the fact that you're both there is like you know, pressuring you into doing work. Because if you're just watching YouTube, someone will know. So <laughs> that's my top tip. <laughs> I think it's also worth worth mentioning that while there are many deadlines, um, if you're having a particularly tough week for maybe ex external reasons or 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 or, or something's happened that's really kind of affected you, um, you know any kind of exterior circumstances, then you can always drop your tutor an email and say, "Hi, I haven't got got this essay done yet. Can I either send you the notes that I've done from reading, or like, can I send it to you?" A, a, a bit later on and lots of tutors are very flexible and very understanding um because obviously things don't always go to plan so and and that is absolutely fine um so that's worth keeping in mind as well yeah i think in um i think in like first year i sent my my tutors an email at 3 a.m 
just with the subject line bridge of size over troubled water and then just kind of left it um but they were so lovely i expected like the worst response but like they were so lovely and they put aside time to help me with the stuff i was struggling with and like gave me like an extension so i think yeah the tutors are generally speaking really understanding um so yeah um cool so now we've got someone asking they're saying that their ap school works so that's the their american so in America, their work is overwhelming and they can't seem to get enough time to have time to do any extracurricular stuff. And do we have any tips for that? I'm assuming they mean like super curricular stuff. Um, the difference is the extracurricular is things like sport or drama that's not directly linked to your course. And that's obviously great to do. Um, but if you're trying to apply to Oxford, um, they're less interested in that stuff. And what they're interested in is the super curricular things, which are things you do outside of your sort of school course, but that's linked to your subject. Um, and that's what you write about in your personal statement and things like that to show that you're really interested in your subject and engaging with it. So does anyone have any tips about things they can do that doesn't take much time or it's easy to fit in, things like that? Charlotte? Was this question about IP? Huh? Was this question about IP? Yeah, I don't know much about it, but I know it's American. I have, I actually have a resident American with me at the moment. He also <laughs> goes to Hartford College. He's quarantining with me. Um, and so what was the question about APA? Sorry, I can, I can refer they to saying, They were saying that they don't have much time to, they feel like they're working, they don't have enough time to do super curricular or extracurricular activities. And do we have any tips for how they could do super curricular stuff? Um, alongside their AP work. Everyone go go with your tips, I'll ask her. <laughs> Anyone? Um, there are things like, you know, listening to a podcast that you can do while you're, I don't know, taking a walk somewhere. Um, things that don't like take up that much time when you can always just think about it and write down some thoughts on um, what they made you think when you do have the time to do so. Um, and just like looking up an article, things like that, that, um, that do add a bit to your application um, and that you can just do in your spare time. It, yeah, so I would recommend doing that. I think as well, um, for literature courses, like um, languages and in, in, in English perhaps, um, lots of people tend to think that like there's a prescribed book of like classics that everyone has to have read before they got to Oxford but that is just isn't the case at all like I read I, I read one Brazilian novel that that just looked interesting on on Wikipedia I bought it and I read it in English in translation because Portuguese was, was my beginner's language and so I read it really enjoyed it I just speak about about that in my interview um, so like um, there's no like prescribed things you have to do, but anything that kind of shows interest and kind of commitment to your subject is definitely worth showing in your personal statement and then eventually an interview. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with George on that. And I also just want to add, going on from that, that you might have already done things um, that you're interested in that you didn't think of including on your personal statement, like as George like George your point made me remember that like I wrote about young adult novels that I read in my spare time in my personal statement and I actually like talked about those in my interview so things that you wouldn't think would be like beneficial for your application might actually have a lot of um like you, you can just include them in your application and they say a lot about how you think about your subject um so yeah so um she said that she didn't do a lot of super curricular stuff um, alongside our AP um, and most of it just kind of came through uh, the studies that she did and hadn't even taken her subject in her senior year so she said that a lot of the super curricular stuff um, was just kind of in the AP really and stuff that stuff that she read to kind of understand the AP stuff was kind of like enough to 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 deal with the uh, interview slash personal statement stuff. Well, cool. thanks for asking. Um, Jay, anything to add? Um, I was just going to say something which like my tutors said in like we did a little tutor chat. I think it's on YouTube on the Hartford YouTube. Um, but, you know, like, don't worry if you haven't had the opportunities that, you know, I don't know, people from from like super kind of fancy schools have had like the tutors understand. So if you're a bit worried about the fact that you haven't had opportunities and you see all these people having all these opportunities, then don't worry, like 
your application will reflect your interest, not like, like, like tutors understand that basically. Um, so yeah, don't worry too much if you're thinking like, oh, I haven't had, you know, I haven't been able to, you know, go to, go to France and speak French for a year to do French at Oxford because, you know, they, they know that, like, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I think just trying to find time to fit, yeah, like listen to a podcast while you're on the bus to school or watching like a documentary on YouTube in the evening as a way to like chill out, but it's sort of something you're interested in. Just that you don't have to be like reading it. Uh, some lengthy book for an hour every night you know There's lots of different ways that you can show that you've expressed an interest in your subject cool so um that is the end of our session we'll leave the questions about how is the workload at oxford and what to include in your personal statement for the next group to answer um so if you ask those then that's where you go so hang on and we'll the next group will ask answer them. We'll be back at 1.45 um, and if you have any specific questions about our subjects you can come back then and ask them as well. Um, cool, thanks everyone. See you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks Karina. So I will be leading the next session. Uh, my name's Rebecca, I study geography and Anoop and Freya are here. Imogen's just joining um, and yeah we'll just quickly yeah and Lizzie, so we'll just quickly introduce ourselves so I'm Rebecca just going to my third year geography um, Anoop. Hi I'm Anoop um, I'm going into my third year studying physics. Freya. Hi I'm Freya I'm just going into my second year studying maths. Lizzie. Hi I'm Lizzie I'm a history and French student going into my second year. And then finally Imogen. Hi, I'm Imogen and I'm going into my fourth year studying Japanese. Perfect. OK, so as Karina said, let's start with the question, how is the workload at Oxford? Um, who would like to take this away? Lizzie? Yeah, um, so it's definitely a lot. And I think because the terms are quite short, um, it means that maybe what other universities are doing in 12 weeks we tend to do an eight um, but it's like 100% manageable and the tutors are very understanding you know because sometimes you do just have a bad week and you know if you say can I send you an essay plan instead of an essay um, they tend to be quite nice about that um, and it is a lot but it's what we're you know what we're spending most of our time doing so it's not all that it's not that bad basically um, and so we're getting a really good quality education um, and we're having time to do lots of other things as well um, we can always find time to go hang out with friends go do some sports go get involved in a society and everything um, but yeah there's a lot of work um, but I think people generally quite enjoy that you know, enjoy pushing themselves and making the most out of their degree yeah Um, Anouk, do you want to talk about science and how that's like? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think I think what Lizzie said was great. Um, I think from a science perspective, um, I'm sure Freya can add on as well. Um, but I'd say like the workload when I first came, I was like, oh, this is intense. But like, I think you get used to it. I think if you're apply even applying to Oxford to study your subject, you're quite passionate about your subject. And so it almost becomes, this is going to sound a bit nerdy, but it becomes quite enjoyable. And um, for like, for physics, exa for example, um, most of the stuff is exam based. So like the stuff that you do in college is within college. So like all your tutorials don't count towards the final grade of the year. The final grade of the year is down to like how you perform in the exam. So like, if you're like one week, wow, I've got like a million things to do then like tutors will be understanding. And like, if you then get like, I don't know, 80% of the work done for that assignment, then like, they're not gonna get completely, um, obviously that they, they won't be like completely impressed by the fact that you didn't complete all the work, but they're not gonna like, I don't know, murder you, like you'll be fine. So I'd say just like, um, if you enjoy your subject, um, I'm sure like the workload will be enjoyable. 
Perfect. Okay. And also what one thing I wanted to say is that at, at Oxford, everyone works hard. So everyone has work to do. So don't feel like you're going to come here and be the only one that's going to be stuck in a library all day. Um, everyone, like at the end of the day, everyone has to get their essay done, their problem sheet done. So we kind of all just accept that we're going to be working. And so it's all manageable. Everyone kind of gets, we get through it. And it's a really nice, like supportive environment. You don't feel like you're being flooded under. And some weeks when you are a friend that isn't can kind of help you out, maybe a cup of tea when you're feeling a bit stressed or whatever. It's just a really nice like environment to be in where everyone can kind of lift each other up. Um, so yeah, we're getting quite a few questions in so we can kind of probably go through them quite quickly. So what should be included in your personal statement? Any key points they're looking for? Is there anyone that wants to take that one about personal statement? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I think the most important thing is kind of showing passion for your subject. And you've said this earlier, I think. Um, is kind of showing a kind of super curricular interest in your subject um, in any kind of way that you can. So uh, some examples are reading books, like only on things that you're interested in the subject, um, but like if you're interested in particular parts, so for example, for maths, if you're interested particularly in statistics, um, reading books about statistics and being able to talk about why you found them interesting, it's a really good opportunity. If there's anything you can do um, kind of within your school or kind of just, um, you know, maybe a kind of, uh, summer school or like open day where you're able to kind of show your interest in your subject obviously those complete aren't necessary but just kind of any opportunity that you have to be like I'm passionate about this subject and this is why and this is what I've kind of done um, is always really beneficial. Perfect thank you um, we can move on to the next one um, so someone said tell us about Simpkin is he friendly and can you take him to your room? Imogen, do you want to take this one? Um, I don't think you can take Simkin to your room. Um, I'm pretty sure that that's not really allowed as much as you might want it to be. Um, he is a little bit temperamental, I think. Um, there are kind of posters up around college that are sort of say, like, stay away from Simkin. He can get a bit, a bit violent sometimes, but um, he's really nice. He's a little bit moody sometimes, but he mostly hangs out in the library. So, you know, that's the best best place to see him. Sometimes um, the library will be pretty much full and he's just sleeping on the last chair and like no one wants to move him. Um, you can like see people coming in. Um, but he's yeah, a nice study buddy, just walks around college. Um, people from other colleges really like him. Again. I'd also just like to say good luck getting Simkin into your room because I can hardly stroke him, let alone, you know, just like actually get him to your room. But if you do, like put it put it on the Facebook page because, you know, that would be big. Yeah, if I'm honest, I'm in Oxford at the moment and I remember cycling past Hartford and Simkin's like, I saw him and he attacked another dog. So a dog was like walking along with his owner um, and he like clawed out whatever and the owner was like oh you nasty cat and I was like oh sorry <laughs> on behalf of Hartford I say sorry so as long as you don't bring your dog to Hartford on um like an open day or whatever or like when you in it'll be fine um okay so we've got from Sophia she says what are the pluses of Hartford so like what are the good things of Hartford like the main standout points um Lizzie do you want to start in I think there are so many I think being central is really nice um and I think especially for the way that the accommodation works is that we have for the first year, everyone's all together on the main site and it's a big enough group of people that you find, like there are lots of people to go meet, lots of friends, but then the site is small enough that actually you do get to know everyone really well. And um, it does feel like quite a close knit community. And I think just having the, it, just having it a really, having a really friendly environment to be in, um, is really really important um and yeah i think it's just a really nice place to be we've got lots of nice old pretty buildings you know, we've got the bridge of size which is beautiful but then at the same time a lot of the accommodation is in newer buildings which makes it feel slightly more homely it doesn't feel like it's a museum and it's really stuffy it feels very down to earth um so i think we get the best best of both worlds there um yeah anyone else wants to add I'd say we have a great bar as well. Um, I, I'm not sure how it's gonna, um, how things are gonna pan out. Like obviously next term, 
or like or over the next year but hopefully like, things will be better by then um but like um yeah we have a really nice uh, bar which is underground which is quite cool and um it's open during the day as well well last term it was open during the day so um you could get like a sandwich or like a coffee or something and chill down chill we call it down the bar and so we abbreviated dtb so just like go dtb but yeah i'd say the bar is really good Also, sorry, just like what Lizzie was saying about accommodation is um, you get all of your years in Hartford guaranteed. Um, so you don't need to worry about private landlords and you kind of, it's quite nice moving into like second and third year, you get to kind of stay surrounded by half students, but get to meet kind of new students, particularly in different years, because first years all kind of live on the main site. Um, and also the accommodation, it's like a flat rate. So you're, you don't need to worry about um, not getting an ensuite necessarily because you don't want to pay more or kind of um, people splitting off because it is kind of all one rate um, and also I think we said this already but Hartford does just genuinely have a really kind of friendly community feeling um, it's a really kind of open and welcoming college um, and I think that really does kind of come through from your first day in the college you do really get a sense of the students that um, kind of wanting to look out for you and want you to feel welcome which is really nice. Yeah, no, I agree with everything that was said. And also Hartford has its own bursary system. So um, it has the Hartford College undergraduate bursary. So I've got a bit of information here. Um, so UK students with household income below 53,000 are offered a thousand pounds per year, just as a one-off bursary. Like not, you don't have to pay it back or anything, just to kind of like help throughout university and like throughout the year. And so that's per year. So over the course of your over the course of a year you'll get three grand just um from being at Hartford and that's really helped loads of students um and yeah there are lots of other support funds but that was like the main one that Hartford advertises to the undergrads and um, yeah, you can probably find more information on the web page you're watching this from or if you're on YouTube go to the Hartford site on within the Oxford website or very confusing but um yeah there'll be more information on student support and like loads of interactive videos to kind of like introduce everyone to Hartford a bit more um so yeah any any more pluses, Imogen, that you can think of? Um, I think having the bridge is really cool. Um, the sort of most, I think it's one of the most photographed spots in Oxford. So it's, it's quite cool to you know, be able to go over it and you know, have that in, in your college. It's, it's also good for pointing out if people don't really know which college you're at, you can say, oh, it's the one with the bridge and they sort of have, have a vague sense of which one that is. Perfect. Okay, so um, I don't know if anyone will have the answer for this, but someone's asked, do you have any experience of jazz group? Do they accept violinists who play jazz? Um, I personally haven't, but does anyone know about this? I'd say in true Hartford spirit, if you want to do something, you, you, like, if you don't ask, you don't get. So like, I'd say like, I, I, know, I know some of the people on the jazz group and they're just so lovely, like they'll literally like, be inclusive to anything so I'm not going to say yes but I'm going to say like I'm pretty sure like it'd be okay yeah no I've, I'd, I'd agree with the noob there so <laughs> um perfect so we've got one for history basically asking what were the best parts of the history course so Lizzie do you want to take that yeah um I think we get a lot of options and if you're doing just history there are certain um, periods and um, areas that you need to cover over the course of your degree. So it does mean that, you know, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to do 18th century France, you know, you've got to sort of like branch out of it, which I really appreciate. Um, I did a paper last year about Europe and the Middle East from medieval, like early medieval era, era and you know, the rise of Islam and everything. And it's a really interesting um, way of being able to explore just the wider world um, and I really it, it's just quite fun um, I like history so it's you know all history courses are great fun but um, I think being able to have the range is really good I think if you look on the university website there's normally a um, like um, what's it called there's you know the um, what you can learn um, the options for the modules and stuff um, so I think you do get a lot of range, but then you can also narrow down quite well. Um, so in your later years, you can go on. Um, and there are options to do courses in modules in different languages. So I did a paper last year 
about a French historian and we looked at the original text in French um, and then looked at the history around it and that was really quite interesting. So there was a lot of um, variety and then you can also narrow down quite well. Um, I think if you're interested in ancient history in particular, like early stuff, then there's also the ancient and modern history, which has fewer restrictions as well. Um, so that's something to look into maybe. But it's just, the tutors have been really nice. Um, it's, you know, the library is amazing. It's in the Radcam, which is the big round building. So we've got the prettiest, prettiest spot to work in over Oxford. Um, and yeah, lots of fun. Perfect, thank you, Lizzie. Um, if the next question is, does Hartford have any traditions? So um, obviously Oxford University is a university full of traditions, but can anyone think of Hartford specific traditions? I've got the pancake, the pancake day. Okay, um, yeah, do you want to talk about that? So yeah, every, um, every pancake day, everyone, there's a race around our main quad. And so everyone runs around and you have to flip a pancake. In, in a pan when you get to each corner and there's a big race so you have like different heats and everything and it gets quite intense um so that's quite a fun little tradition i don't know if there's any other there's also on may mornings may morning is quite a big thing in oxford um i think the choir always give a special performance from the bridge because they're sort of like a lot of dancing and music events going on in the area around Hartford. So I think there's normally a kind of choir performance from the bridge down on that day, I think. Perfect. Anyone else can think of any others? I just think as a general, like Oxford College, like you have like these formal halls. So like um, you can have like a formal dinner um, in the evening and like you all dress up and like you have to wear your gowns and stuff which is like first I thought what is this like seriously like this does not go in my outfit but um, like it is it's actually all right and it's like it's quite nice just to like have this like one common thing to like all like I don't know bond over food and just like have a good time so um, I'd say also Christmas formal that's good like um, like there's a it's a really good uh, good time yeah so that's what I'd say. Also, just adding on to that, um, Simon, who's the head of catering at Hartford, he's like, he's lovely. He's so like inventive with his ideas. So when you go to a formal, if it's a Valentine's Day formal, it's not a normal formal. I think last one, the last one he just had, he like got loads of helium balloons or like loads of hearts, like stuck them all around the hall, like bought like loads of flower petals, like rose petals or something. Or maybe it was um, like decom like env environmentally friendly confetti and put it all around like over Christmas. I think it was a really the Christmas formal we had was like reduced waste as much as possible. So everything was kind of biodegradable and things like that. So Simon really puts his like heart and soul into it. And it's really like work. It really like works out because our formals are just that bit special. And they're like, they're really nice. And like the food as well. I know there's a rumor that Hartford's formal food isn't as good as other colleges, but we've recently got a new head chef in and the food, the food quality has increased quite a, like a substantial amount, basically between my first year and my second year. Um, so yeah, Hartford are doing quite well on the food front. Um, but yeah, we also have, there are also loads of traditions in Oxford, such as like, as Imogen mentioned, like May Day, where everyone stays up all night and then goes to the um, Magdalen Tower in the morning and there's a choir performance. And then things like Halfway Hall, where at, in the middle of your degree, all the second years go for a dinner and they just celebrate being halfway through their degree. Also for third years, there's finalist fling. So just before you graduate, there's a formal where everyone goes and just celebrates being finalists it's probably more sad than if anything um and yeah there's just loads of like little different like, like different traditions that half kind of embrace and they don't try to like dampen it down they just yeah just embrace it okay so that was that question um there's one question saying what would your okay what would you say your gym slash bar is like compared to the other colleges you have seen has anyone seen any other colleges gyms or wants to talk about the gym i haven't seen other colleges gyms but I just know that not all colleges have a gym so that's sort of a plus from Hartford I guess um, that we have one too. I think I keep talking about the bar like literally this is not like employers if you're watching um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but like our bar is like I don't know it's just it's got so much more character than some other bars like I've been to I'm not going to name colleges because that'd be a bit snaky but like some other bars are more like cafes rather than bars 
but ours like in the evening it really transforms into like a really nice place to be in the evening and just like yeah so I'd say it's one of the better ones. I think it's also one of the cheaper ones so that's <laughs> something to consider. I mean it's a minor consideration if you're choosing a college but it is a win. Yeah, I was, it is very like traditional as well, like sticky floors, you go and it's like half a bar has a certain smell about it, but it's kind of like the bar smell, like every, um, I don't know if people hit like people watching know about bops, they're called like big or organised parties, um, where it's like our ENTS committee, hire out, a, hire out a club and the whole of Hartford, the first, second and third years can go, or like the whole of the undergrads can go and like basically have a night out together. And it all starts at the bar and it's so nice like going down the bar when like everyone's there and like you'll dress up with like a theme, everyone's in their own little outfits, you're socialising between the first, second and third years and fourth, fifth, sixth years if the medics come. Um, so that's really nice, like having the bar there. Obviously this year it's actually changing because of Corona, um, where our bar's being, it's not being opened this year, but instead the hall is going to be tried, like the hall is turning into a bar in the evenings, which would be quite cool. So that's obviously changing for our year. Hopefully it'll be back to normal by the time that if you're applying in to start in 2021, October 2021. Yeah, it'll be back to normal, but that's something that's changing this year. Um, our gym, I've not actually, I've been in the gym once and it's got it's got really good um, facilities. I think there's weights, I think there's running machines, all the, the kind of machines you want. And there's women's only hours as well. So if you are a woman and you don't feel comfortable going in the gym, and there are men there, there are, we do have our certain hours, which is really good. And it's underneath Hollywell. So it's in like a really good location on main site, absolutely free. And yeah, it's just kind of like clear up after yourself. So it is a good gym for those that want to go to a gym, but I just don't, <laughs> not that kind of person, but perfect. Um, anything else anyone wants to add? Freya, Imogen, Lizzie? No, okay. Quite a yeah. basic gym. Oh, just, it's not, you know, anything massive and special. You know, there are treadmills, there are, growing machines or you know there's weights and stuff so it's it's got what you probably will need but if you're wanting a really like fancy swooshy gym then maybe go into like a private company um rather than a college gym um but because the gym is free um it's a really good facility to have and it does you, know, you can get a, have a good workout in there um but it's not going to be something like a gym that you'd pay 10 pounds a month for uh, it's not going to be quite as fancy as that yeah, we also have a gym rep. So if you go to the gym and something's wrong, you can just message them and they'll try and sort things out. Um, okay, perfect. Next question is, how many of you got into Hartford through the pool? So um, for people that don't know what the pool is, so if you kind of, when you apply to Oxford, you have to apply to a college or you can make an open application. And then, wait, correct me if I'm wrong. So the pool is where you get, you apply to a college and they say, yes, you're a good applicant but we don't have space for you. Is this like maybe before or after interviews? And then you go into a pool and other colleges can come and pick you out the pool and like offer you off your place or interview further, interview you further, whether to offer your place. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I didn't, I applied directly to Hartford, but Anoop, what was your experience? Um, I applied directly to Hartford and then I interviewed here, but I also interviewed at Merton as well. Um, because I think for my year at least, um, physics interviewed at two colleges. Um, just to get a second opinion um and yeah so i, I didn't go through the pool um, but yeah did anyone go through the pool no oh amazing because I, I do feel a lot of my friends at hartford they didn't actually apply to hartford the first time they applied to other colleges so maybe like john's or something one of them applied to jesus and then christchurch and they got pulled to hartford and applied at hartford um so that's quite cool that the five of us all applied straight to hartford um but yeah the pool the pool system I don't think it disadvantages you if you go through the pool if you're if you're like a good candidate and you're a strong candidate and the, I feel like if you go into the pool the colleges understand that and they're like okay we want this person to go to Oxford but we don't have space necessarily in our college um that's good they just understand you're a strong like a strong candidate so I wouldn't be worried um okay next question do people share rooms um, I can answer this quickly. No, we don't. Everyone has their own room. Um, all the rooms are single beds. Um, a couple of them are en suite. You can look on the website to find out how many rooms we offer that which are en suite. But it's in the Folly Bridge, which is south of, of Oxford. So first year you won't have an en suite, but second year you can and third year you can. Um, it's always available. Um, it just depends on your position in the ballot. But I think everyone gets where they want to go. 
in second year and third year accommodation. Um, so yeah, don't have to stress about sharing rooms. You have to share bathrooms, as you mentioned, and share kitchens. And then sometimes you can, it can kind of be like 10 person, 10 people sharing one kitchen, or it can be like six people. It, it varies. But luckily the places that had kind of quite a few people sharing a kitchen per persons. And when Hartford renovated, they added more kitchens in. So less people are sharing per kitchen now. Um, but yeah, so we've got a question here. What have, what have been some of your most standout memories at Hartford? It's quite a nice question. I may need a, I may need a minute to think, but can anyone, does anyone want to start? Um, I'd probably go, oh, sorry, Freya. Okay, I'll keep this quick then. Um, I'd probably say matriculation because basically it's just this, um, it's just like university-wide event where you basically go inside, I think there's a Sheldonian theatre um, and they basically say some Latin, I had no clue what was going on. And then you just have like a chill day, just like chilling out with everyone. Um, what my year did, and this was a long time ago, this was in 2017. So, oh God, okay, yeah. Um, we all like the entire like cohort of the, like not the entire cohort, but like a lot of us. I don't know if Imogen might remember, but we all went to like, I think it was Christchurch Meadows or something like that. And we all just like, none of us really knew each other, but we just had such a good time. And um, it's just like great to get to know everyone. And I thought, yeah, I like Hartford at that point. So, yeah. I was I was going to say kind of like a similar thing of the stuff like the kind of bops where particularly like further on in the year, you kind of have a real kind of sense of community in your year group. And it's actually a really nice thing to kind of be able to all get together, kind of dress up in like fancy dress and then kind of go hang out um and also um me and lizzie in our year uh we had a couple times in the year we kind of booked out the jcr kind of common room um did like little cocktail nights there and that was another thing that was just really nice as you kind of felt the community in the college so that's like a night that i remember um just because it was quite like a relaxed night it wasn't particularly like fancy but it was just kind of like a um getting to hang out and kind of be with my friends like it's a nice kind of atmosphere at the college Yeah, I think I'd agree with Freya that it's definitely about you know, the people and the friends you meet. I think my favourite night was just hanging out with a bunch of friends in someone's room and we were like playing the guitar and just chatting and just hanging out. And I think it's really the people that make, um, especially the college experience. Um, and Hartford has been so lovely, so friendly and um, yeah, just fun little nights when you're just relaxing, you know. Um, or maybe if you're in the library late at night and there's a group of you, there's a sort of sense of solidarity there and it's a little fun and games up there. Um, so I think just hanging out with people, I think has definitely been some of my favourite memories. Yeah, I've also really appreciated the sport scene at Hartford. Um, so obviously you can go for university level, but a big thing of Hartford is doing college level sports. They're a lot more relaxed and you can kind of like, we have these things called cuppers where the colleges, the college sports go against each other in a, like a tournament. And at the end you win a cup. I think if you, yeah, you win like the cuppers cup, whatever. And it's every year. Um, and what I really liked is I'm not a very sporty person, but I like to try out a lot of sports and all the sports that are available at Hartford. They're so relaxed that anyone can join them. You don't have to like have been scared that like, oh, I have, I didn't do like national level rugby or like national level netball to go and to like make attend or whatever, or, like go to practices. You can just turn up, I don't know, with like no experience and do whatever sport you'd like, which is really cool. So in my, I remember my first year, I did like water, water polo at one point, like water polo cuppers, women's rugby. I just turned up to a couple of practices, had a go, like played a match. It was very like, it was like 20 minutes long. Um, and it's just those kind of sports that um, you probably at other universities, it'd be quite intense to join them. But it's just with Hartford, you can just take like test them all. And we're just all there to have a laugh, really. And it means that you can meet people in different years. So in netball, I think that's quite a big and you can like the first, second and third years kind of they can all, like mix together and rowing as well. That's massive. I did that in first year and the rowing club is it's not on Boathouse Island, whereas like the classic one, it's across the room and further down. But it just means you get a nicer. I suppose you enter the water at a different point. But the W1. But it's really lovely like we're doing really successful as well there's also w2 which is the like the second women's boat and the second men's boat and they're not as competitive and yeah it's just there's like a sport for everyone and if there isn't you can just make your own team i know hockey is kind of like lagging a little bit so if there's anyone that wants to come and make a hockey team and make it more of a scene in hartford like honestly you can just do whatever um so yeah those are our most standout memories 
There's one for you, Anoop, saying, what did you do to prepare, to prepare for your interview? I want to apply for physics. Um, so what did I do? First, the first thing that I did was I looked over my A-level syllabus and the PAT, the PAT syllabus, because um, most of the stuff they're going to ask you at interview is probably going to start off somewhere that is like questioned in the PAT. So you have to do, um, I think the PAT is still on this year. Um, and that's like the physics chess, which is just the um, exam basically. Um, but to prepare for the interview, I would just um, just brush off my A-level and just um, maybe just, you can literally look up on, the, we have like the whole internet, like you can literally just type in Oxford physics interviews. And then, um, and obviously don't trust every single interview question that you see and don't get scared by it. But um, just, uh, yeah, to just be prepared to get asked something a bit different like that's like developing from the A-level syllabus. That's, I just prepared by like looking at practice questions online. Perfect. Uh, there's a second question that leads into that. So what makes physics at Hartford unique? Oh, okay. A lot, uh, there's clearly some physicists around, hello. Um, so I'd say the first thing is the Tanner Society. So Tanner was basically this um, revolutionary tutor that completely changed how Hartford um, basically took its applicants and it encouraged uh, more state school applications. And I think from the north as well, but um, I don't know if anyone can verify that for me, but um, I don't know. Um, yeah, so the Tanner Society is basically every term, there's just a physics society where we all have a meal with the tutors and we have some, have a few drinks if you drink and um, it's just really nice. Um, also, we have loads of tutors. So we've got a, a particle physicist. We've got a um, so theoretical physicist. We've got an astrophysicist. We've got loads of um, different fields that are like represented by Hartford. Um, so and Hartford physics cohort is quite large. Like um, my year is like a bit of a larger year than normal, but um, I'm pretty sure there's like is there, I think there's. In my in my original year, there were six of us, but um, this year I think there's nine of us. So like, there's like quite a few physicists at Hartford. Perfect. And on on the line of Pat, someone's asked about history. So specific, can't talk specifically for history. How did you prepare for the hat? I'm doing practice papers, but I think it isn't enough. Um, I'm possibly not the best person to answer this because I really, <laughs> I did really quite badly in the hat. Um, I would do practice papers and get your, if you've got teachers who can maybe give you a hand and look at them and see what you're, maybe what you're missing. Um, and we, I was really lucky that um, my school ran a sort of like help thing for people who were applying and for people who were looking at the test um, and just we looked at some of the papers and we discussed it. And I think part of it is breaking down some of your own prejudices about like, there was an example where someone was talking about religion and um, some of the students were saying like, oh, um, I think this is quite like very conservative, very like kind of backwards maybe. And actually it's about like breaking down, you know, sort of trying to move away from your own like background and what maybe you think and then trying to get into like the deeper levels of like, what does this tell us? Like how, how important is this? How useful is this? Um, how reliable is it? And looking in underneath. Um, I, I'm sure there is advice online. Um, as I said, I didn't do very well in it. So, I mean, that's quite reassuring in a way that the tests aren't the be all and end all. Um, if I can do really badly in one of the tests and still get in, um, then, just shows that you don't have to be absolutely perfect in all aspects of your application to get in yeah perfect thank you um so there's a question here that says what were the interview days like how did slash do they work um i suppose we can do it we can cover that slightly although our experiences are going to be very different if you're applying this year so all the um i i'd like to say all the interviews are going online um let me have a quick look um, yeah, I think all the interviews will be going online. Yeah, remotely. And um, they're still, Oxford is still working on the precise details. So just, so yeah, basically everything will be fine. You'll be able to do your interviews, but the actual workings of them is going to be um, coming out soon. 
I mean, for us, it was kind of like you got to Oxford, you like stayed the night before, I think. And then the next day you kind of did your own thing and then went for your interview, which is kind of like half an hour, maybe 40 minutes long, I want to say. Sometimes you had two in one day, sometimes you only had one and then you kind of like chill. Like people, the student helpers organised a few activities that you could do during the day or like you could socialise with the students that were there and kind of like take your minds off the interviews then have dinner and then either the next day have an interview or go to a different college. But then if you are if you were being interviewed at a different college, you'd be like led over by one of the students. So you wouldn't be like walking Oxford alone, not really not knowing if you're going to get make it to your interview or not at a different college. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, we can't really answer that to the same extent because they're so different this year. But like rest assured that they'll be like, it'll be fine. Um, and yeah, next question. So have you maintained a decent social life in spite of the very condensed terms and high work workload whilst Oxford? Um, Freya, do you want to take this? I think um, one of you might have said this earlier, but one of the helpful things is we're kind of all having that quite intense workload together. So it's not like people are going to be kind of encouraging you to ignore your work or kind of be like, why are you working so hard? Because you're kind of all in the same boat. Um, but I think with the number of like societies and activities that you have in Hartford and outside of Hartford, um, it's very easy to find something that's happening whenever you're free. So like um, necessarily like depending on whenever you prefer to work, there will be like something happening when you want to relax. And I've found it quite easy to like engage with the social stuff in Hartford and kind of balance it with um, my workload. And I think even just like the little stuff, like um, me and Lizzie actually were next door neighbors um, in first year. And like, we'd go take our work into each other's rooms and our like floor, we'd kind of like get together and have tea breaks together. So like, even when you feel like you need to work, it is quite easy to socialize with other people, like Lizzie said, in the libraries and stuff. So I think because everyone's kind of in the same boat of like the workload, you kind of support each other in it. Sorry, I feel like I rambled, but. No, perfect. That, yeah, that's exactly what I'd say. Um, and also a lot of people get stressed about the nightlife in Oxford. But for me personally, um, well not, anyway, in Oxford, because it's a city, it's not kind of a town. And um, there's kind of a nightclub for everyone if you do want to go out clubbing. If you don't, there's also loads of stuff. What I really like about Oxford is the pubs. So like pubs and like you can go for drinks you can go for like fancy drinks. There's a place called the Varsity Club, which is a rooftop. Or you can just go to a pub, go to DTB. So there's like kind of lots of things to do in the night as well in terms of that social life. And then with the clubs in Oxford, there's um, like your cheesy clubs or whatever, the clubs people go to with their sports societies. But then also quite far out, there's more like, I'd say maybe more like a edgy <laughs> music taste. There's places in like No Cowley called the Bullingdon and um, also the A2. They have kind of different, yeah, just not nice for everyone really. Um, and also like, but, and if you want to base your whole, it's like your whole social life or like night life, so you can easily fit that in. You can kind of change your working habits or if you want to base your, social life and just whatever other societies like sports societies it's really like malleable I think that's what's good about Oxford is like yes there's a lot of work but it's completely it's quite flexible um I know some science students have kind of timetable in their days a lot of stuff to do like labs and everything but for especially for humanities it's very malleable so you can kind of do work when you have time and then also not do work when you want to socialize but then still have the ability to do work and catch up and hit all the deadlines um so yeah that's good um Imogen do you have anything else to add Sorry, just unmuting. Um, yeah, I'd say my course is quite contact hour heavy, particularly in first year. So I think you, it kind of does vary, but there's definitely, there's, there are more hours in the day I find than I thought before I came to Oxford. I think being at school, it's like takes up all the time. Like I think because you're just there for like most of the day when you get home, you're sort of tired and don't want to do anything. But I feel like you could have sort of, I would sometimes have four or five content hours in first year. And then you'd do like a few hours in addition. And then there's still time, like after meeting, you'd meet people for an evening meal and then there's still, you know, time to go do something. So I think if you sort of plan, you know, it takes a little bit of planning, but it, it is really possible to, to have the best of both, I think. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we've got two about foreign languages and like languages in general. So the first one is, what is it like to study languages at Oxford? And then the second is, is there any, is there a way to get involved in learning foreign languages as an extra, extracurricular? So Imogen and Lizzie, I'll leave this to you. <laughs> I guess learning um, Japanese and learning French is like slightly different um, because there are 
very different languages. Um, there, for me at least, it's quite literature heavy. So if maybe you're wanting to do more of like culture and um, obviously I'm doing history, but if you want to do maybe more of like the cultural and historic aspects, then maybe um, this isn't necessarily the right course. Um, I mean, I think I've had also had the opportunity to learn a bit of Romanian, um, just as a bit of a random thing. So there's the language center where you can do, you can pay and do courses um, in like learning languages. And there are lots of different levels. So if you've done an A-level in language and want to keep that up, you can do that there. But then also, um, I was just able, the sort of department ran a, um, ran lots of lessons for Romanian and I just signed up to them and did a term's worth of Romanian just for fun. Um, and that's just, it's very fun. So there's definitely a lot of opportunities to do languages on the site. Um, and I, yeah, it's a lot of literature. Um, and maybe I, I think because a lot of my lessons got messed up because of COVID, um, but I haven't had so many, like I haven't had that many speaking lessons and stuff. So that's something to consider. I don't know what it's like for Japanese though. Um, yeah, I think my course is, I think most of the languages in the Oriental Studies faculty are not so literature based. There's certainly literature work and literature options, but it's not such a primary aspect. I think we spend a bit more time on language in the first year, at least, because it's a bit more ab initio based. Um, and we also have a year abroad in the second year rather than third, like modern languages do, I think, although maybe Russian also have their year abroad then. Um, and just adding to what Lizzie said about doing languages outside of your degree. Um, I did German A-level and I kind of wanted to continue that. So I did one of the courses at the Language Centre. It's quite laid back. Um, they've also done an online one this year. So that's not stopped uh, even with uh, the pandemic. And also, if you don't want to sort of commit to a language course at the centre, which you, there is a, a fee for as well, um, but it's, it's not too bad. Um, you can also look at some of the student societies for that subject. So I know French society and definitely German society as well um, will run sort of language classes quite informally, um, normally free for members, just taught by uh, students from those countries. So that's another option to get involved with languages outside your degree. So I've okay. heard one more thing. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say um, for physics in second year, you can swap out one of your short options. So you have like short options are basically you can like delve into like something a bit different from the core course. And um, you can actually swap out one of those modules for like a modern language um, in your second year. So like that might be something to consider if you're doing like physics. Like I don't know if other STEM subjects also do that. Perfect. OK, um, so we've got two minutes left before we hand over and there's two questions. Um, so the first one is, is Oxford expensive? And if I'm completely honest, yes, I, like I know. Yes, it is. In terms of um, I know I remember the other day I, I was Googling um, how much like the average pint cost was. And like it said in the UK, it was four pounds. But like the other day when it was like over five pounds in Oxford or I know it's just like there is, it is generally it's more expensive to live here. Um, and then this kind of ties into the next question is, do you think it's a real advantage to go to a college with accommodation for all years? And I'd say yes, because with Hartford, we have a set rate and because and it's, it's one of the lowest in Oxford, like out of all the Oxford colleges. And then also because of that, we only rent out our rooms for the eight week term. So you're only paying for eight weeks and you're paying like substantially less. I don't know, it's not as expensive as like renting out for the whole year. Um, and it's like one of them second, like third most the cheapest colleges in terms of accommodation. So it kind of, both of them kind of offset each other. So I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. Um, yeah, that's what I've got to say. Yeah. I don't, oh, sorry. I, I don't think it's any more expensive, like, or like that much more expensive than other universities. And my friends at Durham are paying, especially in their first year, they have to have fully catered accommodation. So they paid sort of 7,000 pounds in accommodation, whereas I think I paid because it half it got cancelled, but I only paid two and a half grand in accommodation. So it does balance, um, and because there is a lot of support for Oxford, you know, there it shouldn't be, and you have you know, your student loan and everything. So I think there is enough support that it's not like I could go to this university, um, but I, you know, Oxford is too expensive for me. I don't think that's really the case. Um, 
can I just add one last thing? Um, also, you've got to, um, so when you're at Hartford, you just pay for the um, accommodation that like, um, when you're staying in. So like, you pay for like the nights that you stay during term, and then over the vacation, um, you don't really stay in college unless like you've got some reason to. Um, so then you don't have to pay for those nights. And that really adds up like some universities, like especially when you're private renting, um, you've got to pay for that whole time that you're there and it can really rack up. So I'm, I really like how Hartford does its accommodation, like with the pricing. Yeah, I've got a little sheet here. And um, so as I mentioned earlier, we have the Hartford College undergraduate bursary. So that's um, students under £53,000. Household income below that, and um, they get £1,000 per year. So obviously go towards, um, I know, yeah, go towards university. And we also have free vacation residence. So 12 nights free per year to cover start of North week and then additional seven nights free per year for any purpose. So alongside paying our rent, we also get free nights accommodation. So kind of a heart for do work to make it less expensive and kind of make it more accessible to those that might think that Oxford's too expensive to um, live in. But like, as he said, it's not kind of like extortionate and especially at Hartford, they do help students that may find it quite stressful moving to a city like Oxford. But yeah, this is the, this is the, I don't know, yeah, we're going to hand over to Catherine Boast um, and the tutors and the senior tutors to answer some admissions questions. So yeah, that's everything from us and we'll be back later on like 3 p.m. Um, answer, ask all questions in the box the below this page, below this page, and we'll pass over now. So yeah, thank you for asking your questions. <laughs> Bye, that was quite long-winded, goodbye. <laughs> Uh, it was I really enjoyed listening to those answers. Very nice stuff. What we're doing now is we've got an ask admissions section. So my name is Catherine. I am the STEM outreach officer at Hartford, which means that um, I coordinate a lot of our work um, with schools, but specifically on science topics. Uh, I'm going to be comparing this session. So I'm going to be taking a look at your questions as they come in. Um, but I am joined by a panel of excellent experts um, and I think we should start with them introducing themselves. David, would you like to begin? So my name is David Hopkin. I'm the senior tutor at Hartford, uh, as well as being a tutor in history. Uh, and that means I've got a kind of general oversight of all the academic provision and things around admissions and so on and so forth. Thank you very much, Lynn. I'm Lynn Featherstone and I'm the Director of Admissions at Hartford. Um, so that means that um, I work with the admissions team on the kind of operation that is the admissions exercise. Um, so dealing with all the applications for um, applicants to Hartford from across all courses um, and working through the logistics of the, the process, which um, includes interviews. Um, I'm also the registrar at the college, which means that I um, work with the team who support students when they're here as well. So for all on course matters. Thank you very much. And last but by no means least, Nathan. Hi, I'm Nathan Stavica. I'm the Outreach and Communications Officer at Hartford. Uh, and I work with Catherine to run activities and make resources for uh, schools and colleges and prospective applicants to um, introduce you to Oxford and to Hartford and to answer your questions. Lovely stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, if you've got any questions for us, then please do put them in the, the chat room on Slido. If you're on the university page, you'll find it um, on the right hand side in the tab there. Um, and we will do our best to get through all of your questions. So if you've put a question in, please do hang about and we will get to it. First up, are we allowed to stay in Hartford during the holidays? As an international student, it seems excessive to travel to and from the UK at the end of every term. Then you right. go take that. Yeah. Um, yes, the terms at Oxford are relatively short, so they're eight weeks. Um, and in between that, um, we um, accept most students to, to return home. International students, especially those who are travelling great distances, um, do have the opportunity to ask to stay in residence during periods of the vacation. Um, so, so, yeah, um, there is that flexibility. I would say... Quite often students, if, they're, if you're an international student from somewhere very far away, uh, like North or South America or Asia or Australasia, um, people often use the, the vacations to um, explore Europe a bit more as well. 
Um, obviously not at the moment, but in, in normal circumstances, people, people will do traveling as well. Excellent. Right, we've got quite a specific one here um, about maths and computer science. For math courses and further math courses that are required to be taken for computer science, is it enough to take pre-calculus and AP calculus, or do I have to take the SAT math subject test for further learning for math? Do we know an answer for that one off the top of where we're at? I would rec recommend looking at the university um, web pages on qualifications and international qualifications specifically, and also either asking that question in our tutor chat or to go to the relevant departments today and ask that question. And whatever they say in relation um, to those qualifications, that's what would apply at Hartford. Okay, nice. Nice and simple. Um, we've got a question from Elsie here. How will the interview days work for 2021 applicants? So there are people, there are people apply, applying this uh, autumn. Uh, well, they will be online, I think is the, 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 the straight answer to that. Um, uh, the the timetable and things like that are yet to be worked out, but the we know that the interviews will all occur online. Uh, otherwise, I suppose you know, how, how will the actual interview run will be fairly similar. I mean, the, 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 it's one of the interview virtues of um, having a kind of interview basis that we can do the, roughly speaking the same things on Zoom, Skype, Teams, whatever it is, as we would uh, do if you were here in person, which, you know, which is to sit and ask you questions. But um, uh, so that's probably as much as we can say about that. And it's Lynn, you had to kind of more detail at the moment. I think the, the main message there is that we are working through all of the um... The, the kind of the, the thinking about the logistics of that process um, and more information as and when it's confirmed will be available on the website. Um, applicants and teachers um, are welcome and encouraged to sign up for our newsletters as well. Um, and you'll see that there are details on the main university admissions pages about how to go about doing that. And then you'll receive updates um, in your inboxes as well as kind of checking online. It's worth saying as well that, that you know, we have been doing online interviews for quite a number of years with with students from uh, abroad who can't make it to Oxford for an interview in person so this isn't something completely new that we've never done before um you know we have we have done it before but as Lynn and David says it's just going to take a little bit more time to work through the exact details thank you very much so we've got a question here from anonymous anonymous is sending us lots of questions today is it a disadvantage to be coming from a private school? I started last year as I'm on a full scholarship for sixth form. So, no, it's not a, a disadvantage. Um, it's, uh, but we do work to make sure that all of our candidates are operating on a level playing field. So where people have suffered significant disadvantage in their educational history that is something that we will know about and something which we will take into account in our decision making um, so it's not a disadvantage to be at a private school but um, uh, it's not necessarily uh, we're, we're working to make sure that everyone is seen uh, in the round and uh, that you know, those people who have you know, that the uh, those people who uh, might have uh, a lot of educational advantages, that they are not therefore privileged as opposed to people who haven't had those advantages. Did anyone want to add anything else? Or I think that was a fairly comprehensive reply. Lovely. Um, Okay, we've got a question just in from Elsie. Will there be an issue with less places available due to people choosing not to apply for this year? Or does that not apply to Oxford because of the early applications? I don't think there will be less places. Um, 
I mean, the, the, so, so if you're asking, did a large number of people defer from this year's entry? The answer to that, is, as far as we can work out, or the ones we know about, the answer is no. Did people take a gap year? Um, that I don't know about. Uh, and we'll have to see when people make their applications. But I don't think we're expecting there to be a kind of massive spike in the number of applications coming in next year. And the number of places available will be much like it is this year. So uh, there won't be a major change uh, caused by the pandemic in, in, in that factor. Very good. We've got a subject specific question here now, um, but about um, applications in general, in a sense. I'm applying to study economics and management, and I like that you have a relatively large number of E&M students, but does this make competition higher at Hartford? There are processes, so um, in any year, uh, a college could see a spike in the number of applications that it receives. And, and we do have a large number of applicants in e &M, that's definitely true. But there are processes to ensure that where you do have spikes, uh, that those are smoothed out. Uh, and so that no one is disadvantaged by applying to a particular college just because it happens to have a large number of applicants in that year. Uh, those processes happen both before interview and during the interview process. Uh, and it may mean that people are reallocated from their initial college choice to another college. Um, but uh, uh, that means that everyone is getting uh, a fair opportunity uh, to uh, make a success of their application to Oxford. Very good. Right. Um, let's take this question from Anya. Hi, I'm from Germany and finished my Abitur this year. I'm wondering how I should put my grades into UCAS as there are boxes called module slash unit, but no possibility to upload my Abitur certificate. Do we have any insight into how, how we want to handle UCAS and international qualifications or? I think that's one for the UCAS website. Um, so uh, yeah, um, there will be instructions there on to, as to how to, to kind of um, represent your qualifications. Um, and in my experience, we don't expect, um, or we certainly don't receive at Hartford or at a college level, um, your certificate um, at the application stage. If you already have qualifications, and this applies to any qualifications um, that you're declaring on your application and you're subsequently made an offer of a place, that place will be conditional on you providing us with proof that you have those qualifications. Um, I'm not talking about GCSEs, but certainly the kind of the um, the qualifications you'll have taken in the last um, couple of years um, as kind of entry level, if you like, to, to university. Um, so it's at that stage that we would ask you um, to provide evidence of the arbiter in this case, um, or A-levels or IB or whatever it, whatever it is. Um, I mean, it's worth saying that we're very used to dealing with applicants from a very wide range of uh, different international academic backgrounds. So, and there are, the university has a set of guidance uh, for, for us all on how to interpret uh, uh, exam results from Germany, France, um, China, um, uh, wherever. So there's a case, so you know, there, there is a kind of mechanism to kind of make sure that we uh, understand where people are uh, in their home uh, educational environment. Good. Right. Okay. We're going to take a slightly different tack now. Have you got any tips on preparing for the mat, the maths admissions test? Any top tips? <laughs> I haven't got a kind of particular one for the maths test. I should say that I think with all of the tests, the standard advice would be go and look at the past tests and give them a go. Uh, uh, and that's the way in which one, uh, that's the best means of preparing. If you, and then perhaps if, if your teachers are willing, ask them to have a look at what you've done. And, uh, um, but there, I, yeah, I, I'm not a mathematician, so I, could, I couldn't go beyond that in terms of advice. My top tip would be to, if you're doing the mat, um, go to the maths department website because the outreach officer and admissions coordinator in maths, James Munro, runs a live stream on the mat 
every Thursday. I think he still does, unless Catherine's going to shake her head and tell me no. Um, and he goes through the questions and goes through kind of how the how the test works. Um, so if you can log on and watch some of those, then that is going to be a really good introduction to what to expect in the test. All the tests are administered uh, by the relevant department rather than the college itself. Uh, so uh, test questions that are likely you're probably going to get uh, fuller answers from the departmental websites uh, than you would necessarily get from the college. Some nice tips there. And I second the, second the suggestion of checking out the Maths Department YouTube channel because um, there's a lot of resource there, a lot of maths. Um, right, okay, here we go. Specific one again um, around international students, this time around medicine. Hello, hello Anonymous. Uh, would a pre-university course be of advantage when applying for medicine? Also, would a six year long course at a conservatory in my home country be relevant for a medical uh, medicine application? when applied to relevant characteristics. For example, does this demonstrate perseverance and time management to tutors? I take a conservatory there might mean music. That would be my guess as well, but yeah. I'm not sure exactly. So this, I mean, there's a, there's a straight answer there, which is uh, no, uh, in the sense that, the fact that anyone has got a qualification in music is not a factor that we would consider in terms of uh, admission to Oxford, you know, that we're only looking at academic um, achievement and expectation and promise in the subject which, to which they've applied. Nonetheless, I would say that it would be true that someone who has uh, done music to a very high level for a long period of time, it, has acquired through that process the kinds of discipline um, which are very helpful to students in general but also to maybe particularly to students at Oxford because uh, so much of the of the degree course relies on people having that kind of internalized discipline to be a self-starter to kind of pick up and run um, uh, and so although it's not it's not going to be a criteria which people are going to uh, use in making decisions. It, it probably has given you uh, um, uh, a very good background in, in that kind of self-discipline. Um, so uh, it will benefit you, I would guess. Does anyone have I, anything they would like? Oh, sorry, go on, David. I, so I, I, on the... Uh, on the pre-university course, uh, and uh, again, we, there couldn't, it couldn't be a requirement because of course some people wouldn't be able to do that kind of uh, activity. So there's not gonna be, it's never gonna be a thing which is gonna be in, used in making decisions, um, but nonetheless, it's hard to see how it would be negative. Uh, it would be, it's probably something which is going to be of use because it provides you with experience. Uh, uh, and that's something which you can talk about in an interview, for example. Excellent stuff. Uh, sorry, Lynn, did you want to add something? Just on the specifics of it being a, um, uh, an inquiry about medicine, um, I would recommend also going to the medicine pages of the, the open day um, and to speak to the, the medicine tutors because the, the, the process that we run um, across the university is very well coordinated by the medical school. Um, and they'll be able to give specific advice. Yeah, or, or always a good answer to, is to, to look at the departmental website. Of course. Right, we've got a question here from Elsie, uh, who asks, what sort of things are good for writing personal statements? Well, yeah, yeah uh, I mean, <laughs> I know this is going to sound like um, uh, we're saying this a lot. It will depend on the subject to a degree. Um, but what we're, in general, I would say that we're looking for uh, is that people have got a demonstrated interest in and commitment to their subject, which just go, which goes beyond simply being good at what they're taught in school. 
everyone who applies to Oxford is going to be good at doing exams and passing exams and getting grades. Um, but it, that can't be the only criteria that we're then using for selection. We're looking for people to demonstrate that they really want to commit to this subject, that this isn't going to fully occupy them for, for the three or four years of their degree, um, that they're excited by it. Um, and the, that can be done in a variety of ways in terms of you know, activities you've engaged in, um, uh, books that you've read, um, uh, places that you've been, all of those kinds of things. Uh, but in all, all of those, I mean, it's not just, I suppose it's important to say, while we want to see that you're you know, doing things, we also want to see that you're reflecting on them, that it's um, a process by which you're kind of thinking about the subjects, not just that you're, uh, yeah, yeah, I went to a museum, uh, that's good. Um, uh, we, yeah, I'm a historian, so I would, I would say that. Um, but in what's, what did that lead you to reflect on how history is presented, packaged, as they necessarily will be within a museum? Uh, what is left out? What is promoted? Why is uh, everything come in the, you know, within a kind of national framework, for example? Um, those kinds of things. So it's you know, demonstrating you're going beyond uh, the school curriculum, but also that you're reflecting on the subject that you, you're going to be studying for uh, a chunk of your life. But bear in mind, you know, the personal statements, you know, we will read them and we'll use them, particularly maybe in framing uh, interviews. I mean, that slightly depends subject to subject, but you know, it's likely that stuff you say about yourself will be discussed with you in an interview. Um, therefore, everything that you put in it is, should be something that you want to talk about. Um, but it's also true that we're not likely to be making a decision on the personal statement alone. That's not the, we, it's uh, a useful way to introduce topics into conversation in an interview, but it's not something which we assess. We're not kind of giving it a mark or anything like that. And those things that David's been talking about, we sometimes refer to as supercurricular activities because it's rather than extracurricular, which is something outside your schoolwork, it's supercurricular. So it's going above and beyond what you're doing in school. So things like the lectures and books and podcasts and documentaries, museums, whatever it might be. Uh, and if you want some ideas for some of those things, if you're feeling a little bit stuck about where to start, then you can go to our website, www.hartford.ox.ac.uk forward slash challenge. We've got a whole list of ideas there. And that link is also on our open day page on the university website in the further information box on the right hand side. Uh, so hopefully that will give you a little bit of inspiration if you're feeling a little bit stuck. There's some good food for thought, stuff for you to get your teeth stuck into. OK, we have a question from Anonymous. I imagine you receive many more top level applications than you have space for all showing supercurricular interest in their subject. How do you choose? How can I stand out? Well, we do receive a lot of excellent applications. That is true. I mean, bear in mind, of course, that we're not just looking for one person. Where we, in every, in every subject, we're admitting several, and across the university, several hundred. Uh, so it's not quite as uh, hideously intense as, as that might lead one to um, uh, suggest. Um, so it, but we are, you know, we are definitely looking for that supercurricular, uh, as, as Nathan you know, corrected me there and I, on my usage, it's a supercurricular. Uh, um, uh, we are looking for that, but you know, we, we're well aware, of course, that people have a whole variety of obligations um, to their school, uh, to their family. Some people may need to work in order to support themselves or other family members. So we couldn't. They're not going. To, we're not going to make any of these things um, uh, an absolute. That you you have to do something uh, above and beyond. Uh, in order to uh, get a place at Oxford, because that would clearly disadvantage people from uh, who have 
uh, you know, more complicated circumstances. So you know, that's a, it's something which we're keen to encourage for people to go beyond the curriculum. Um, but it would also be true that, you know, that we're also going to be looking at schoolwork and we're also going to be looking at uh, uh, what your teachers tell us about you. And we're also going to be looking at other things like um, uh, whether our admissions tests. So it's never kind of one thing. Uh, and we're very much thinking about the individual and the circumstances in which they have been operating uh, rather than thinking about kind of absolute criteria which everyone has to meet. Does anyone want to add anything further or are we happy with that's covered? Excellent, right, okay. We have quite a specific question here now. Um, how accessible would you say to Hartford, how, sorry, how accessible would you say Hartford College is to a wheelchair user like myself? Perhaps I could take this one. Um, so part of my role, as I said at the beginning, is supporting students when they're here. And I work well, member of the, the welfare team um, at the college as well. Um, so I'd want to preface all of this by saying that, that we support um, a range of um, a students with a range of different um, disabilities and chronic conditions. And we work very closely with the university services to make sure that the adjustments to learning, to living um, and all aspects of college life um, are put in place. In relation to physical um, access, um, we are um, aware of um, the challenges for, for some students, including those, those students who use wheelchairs, um, and we are working towards um, making our facilities as accessible as possible. Um, and where we can put adjustments in, we have put adjustments in. Um, we are um, also constrained by things like, you know, um, our kind of listed status. Um, our buildings are old um, and not all of them can be easily adapted. Um, so I would recommend um, that you have a look at the virtual tour because you can't quite <laughs> come to visit us in person right now, but also um, drop us a line separately so we can talk through exactly some of the kind of the, the specific issues um, around access. Um, so you'll see on the virtual tour, for example, that um, the main um, access route up to our dining hall is via a spiral staircase. Now there are adjustments we can put in place for that, but we don't yet have um, a kind of lift access to, to, that, um, to that facility. Um, and so there are things that we probably want to explore with you um, in relation to that, in relation to Hartford, um, things currently stand. There's quite a lot of uh, building work planned for Hartford but they won't kick in for 2021 entry. Okay, we are coming to the end of our time for talking. So if anyone's got any last minute questions that they want to put to us, do fire them into the Slido now. Uh, let's see, have we got anything, any final questions coming? Um, Uh, we've got one question. Nathan, you might be able to handle this quickly. Where are the answers to the questions on the Slido? Someone can't find the link to the live video. What should they do? Where are the questions? Oh, actually, if we answer this on the live so, video, it's not going to help them, uh, is it? The so line... I will post something in the typed chat that tells them what to do. Um, in which case, I think we should finish off with a, a different question. Um, how about this one? How important are predicted A-level grades? That's an interesting one. Um, it's obviously going to, uh, uh, we've had quite a lot of fun uh, over the summer with predicted grades and uh, the relationship to actual grades. Okay, so uh, there, there is a kind of minimum entry level. So for A-levels, it's going to be, depends on subject, but it's going to be three A's or, uh, uh, a star A, A or A, A star A star A depends on the subject. So we are, we're not going to make offers to people that we don't think are going to make that, um, uh, those necessary grades. But you know, how do we assess that? Is it all down to what the teacher guesses at a particular point um, in the year? The answer to that is no because we have other information, some of which uh, might um, appear from an admissions test, some of it may appear in interview. So 
uh, while we couldn't ignore um, uh, what the uh, teachers' predictions, uh, we don't. We won't necessarily be guided by those, and we may nonetheless make an offer uh, which suggests that we think that the student you know, could could reach a higher level than is predicted uh, on the UCAS form. So uh, I think that's the, uh, um, the, the the answer there. Excellent. There we go. Well, that about brings us to the end of our session, uh, and I can see that we've got some students waiting in the wings to, to take over. Um, we've got uh, one more Ask Admissions session, so if you did have any questions that we didn't get round to asking, uh, answering, we have one more session at half past two this afternoon. Um, in the meantime, we've got a couple more Meet Our Student sessions, and there is also on the other half of our Slido, um, on the typed bit of our Slido, we have a Meet the Tutors session. Uh, that is about to start now and run till 2 p.m., and we'll have tutors from loads of subjects, archaeology and anthropology, chemistry, computer science, e &M, English, geography, history, human sciences, law, modern language, music, oriental studies, philosophy, PPE and physics. So if you've got any questions for any of those tutors, do head over and ask them in the Slido chat. Um, otherwise, it has been lovely to answer your questions. Um, thank you for typing them all in. It's very nice to hear from you. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all sometime later maybe. And it's time for me to hand back over to the students. Hello, welcome back to our Meet the Student Sessions. Uh, we're gonna be with you for the next 45 minutes. Uh, so please send all your questions by Slido which is on the website um, linked to the Open Day for Hartford. We'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. But first of all, let's introduce ourselves so you know what we're doing. I'm Imogen, I'm a third year English student. Um, then let's see who's next, Ian. Hi, I'm Ian, I am a third year chemistry student. Caleb. Hi, I'm Caleb and I'm a second year biology student. Antonia. Hi, I'm Antonia and I'm a second year geography student. And Tash. Hi, I'm Tash and I'm a third year law student. Lovely, let's get started. So we have quite a few questions to start with. So let's have a look. What kind of atmosphere does Hartford have? Who would like to start? Ian. Hartford has a very friendly atmosphere. That's kind of why I chose it as a college. Um, it does have a reputation for just being really lovely and friendly. The whole community is really supportive of each other. Um, and there's a lot of like inter-year mingling. Um, so I know a lot of people in the year above and I know a lot of people in the year below. So it's just, yeah, it's almost in some ways much more for a bigger place than it was at school. You know more people and you're actually friendly with more people, which is, you know, quite nice uh, as a uni experience goes. Right, anyone else? I think Harvard's really accepting in a way that I don't necessarily feel so much in some of the other colleges. Um, I think part of the reason is uh, the just sheer number of state school um, applicants that we take. Um, there's not any kind of pretentiousness. There's no kind of like, um clickiness I guess maybe um and like I've always really struggled with imposter syndrome at Oxford and it's kind of like feeling like you don't belong even though you got in um and I think the kind of community at Hartford and the feeling you get at Hartford that like everyone belongs there is really lovely and really special totally um I feel like as a community, it's very friendly, welcoming and accepting. I mean, it's quite amusing. You don't necessarily think you can do it at school, but like if I bump into a tutor in the street, I can just say hi, have a chat. And it's very normal there. Although you're like working with them and they mark your work and stuff, it's very much sort of, they're not just your tutor. They're like a person who's interested in you as a person and like, you know it's just really lovely because one of was like oh how are you and in my first week I was like oh I'm getting on really well with the essay she's like no I don't mind about that I'll find out about that later how are you as a person and I'm like you know what that kind of vibe if you can have that with your tutors 
and they're happy to do that I feel like it's just a really good sign so yeah um lovely so now a very important question what is the food like at Hartford Antonio or Caleb do you want to start yeah I'll, I'll go um so I really like the food at Hartford um I was a bit put off after I got my offer because I'd read a lot of stuff like there's like the student room and stuff online and it had like not that great reviews but when I got to Hartford and tried the food I actually really enjoyed it I think they do a good mix as well in Hall and um for like for most people who have met like the catering staff uh, who work in the kitchen they're actually really nice people as well and they're quite they're like really quite enthusiastic about um getting to like know they want to learn like what the students like and whatnot and so like we have like um submission forms and stuff like surveys so like you can review the food in hall so they know that way like did they did the students like this kind of meal or did they not and then they're so they're always looking to like improve on the food but generally i, I do think the food is really nice at hall yeah they definitely stepped it up the year you guys arrived um because I remember there being like a end of year kind of food review and um the catering team wanted to shake up kind of what meals were like a little bit um and like we were working with a new system so uh food doesn't like paid for in the same way you have like an app probably like like people would do in college um so we're all that changing and then all of a sudden coming back and then food being really really good um but the other thing is that as well as the food being really good, um, the kind of self-catering options and kitchens and stuff, uh, the availability of them is pretty good as well. More so in your second and third years, but even in first year, if um, cooking for yourself is what you'd like to do, there is that option, which is I've always really appreciated that. Yeah, they've also done up the kitchens um, in, which I think Tash was probably about to talk about, <laughs> in Hollywell, uh, which is where you live in first year, which is Central College. Um, yeah, anyone else want to say something? I've got a, a little bit of a different opinion on the food. Um, I I mean, yes, they definitely did change it um, for the year that you, you guys came in. But um, I think in our first year, I wasn't too keen on the, ho- uh, the food in the hall. Um, and there were a few instances that I think it was a little bit pushing it a bit in terms of what they were serving um just to, it, being completely honest about it but that is hall which is the the kitchen in north oxford um and in south oxford where you most people live in their second third maybe fourth years um they have warnock which is another catering facility and that is really good um they do really like to repeat the same vegetables every night though um so that can sometimes get a bit tedious but generally the food is well, has been a lot better this year um, for me. And their, their formal hall, which is their kind of, you have the option to go fairly regularly um, when you, you pay in advance and then you kind of go in a formal attire or whatever um, and you just get served like you're in a restaurant and that's really nice. And their food is really good then. They really do do well with that. Uh, I think it's just the normal normal food, which I'm not as keen on, but that's just me. Maybe I'm picky. <laughs> <laughs> Also, just something worth mentioning, um, it's actually, I quite like the college food, mainly because I I like just getting something to eat and go, but as a veggie, that the food is actually really good, because, I don't know, school dinner, vegetarian options often aren't very inventive, but they do really try, and the vegan as well, and I think most of the meat is halal as well, so it's actually pretty good when it comes to sort of, like, different eating uh require like dietary requirements and stuff like that so if you're worried about any of that kind of thing i think it's all sorted but also that kind of info will be on the part of the website hartford website that tells you about that um but yeah i think it's just another thing as well especially in first year um going to hall is more than just going for food which is another really nice thing um so in your first year uh everyone has different timetables and everyone's doing different things and everyone's doing different like societies and it can be really difficult to keep up with the friends that you made in freshers and like I didn't go to hall a lot in first year um and Ian will remember probably because we were, we were in the same friendship group but like you don't tend to like run into people as much whereas if you're going to hall together everyone's there at the same time 
and it's like this really nice kind of forced social opportunity to catch up with everyone. Brunch is good for that as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, brunch. Brunch is also the best meal that college college do. It's the one. Um, but if you're struggling um, to kind of socialize and catch up with people, and you, you're like feeling overwhelmed, you have to eat. So you know, <laughs> um, you have to socialize for at least an hour, which is lovely. Great. So a uh, question about accommodation. So is accommodation shared? So let's just explain a bit about the accommodation system. Um, Caleb, do you want to start? Um, yeah, so for first year, everyone gets their like their own room um, in whichever block you'll be, which will be on the main site in college. Um, and the only things that are shared are like the bathrooms and the kitchens if you want to cook for yourself. But other than that, in your rooms and stuff, you do get um, like a, a mirror and like a sink and quite a big wardrobe. Um, so, yeah, the only thing you're really sharing is uh, bathrooms and kitchens. But the kitchens are cleaned uh, throughout the weekday by the scouts. And I think rooms get cleaned once a week um, on main site and like your bins will get emptied and stuff. So the setup's quite good. Great. And would someone like to explain how it works in second and third year? Um, just to say, you do get accommodation for all three or four years of your degree at Hartford. So we'll just explain about how you go about getting that. Um, anyone else want to take that? Yeah, sure. So um, going into second and third year, uh, because Hartford offer accommodation to everyone, the fairest way to do it is um, to form what we call is like a ballot. And essentially you kind of put a group of friends that want to live together and you submit your like ticket together and basically like a year by year raffle um, of the order that you get to pick. And then you pick from all of Hartford's rooms where you want to live. So Hartford owns annexes, so like blocks of, of like halls basically, and like individual houses uh, in both North and South Oxford as well as uh, the main site. So you'll pick from there. So you might end up in a building that's quite similar to where you've lived in first year. Um, that's where, where I lived last year called Abingdon House in South Oxford. So that's kind of very similar to, to being on site. Uh, you have your own room, your uh, like sink and mirror, and then you share a bathroom, you share a kitchen. Um, you could end up in a house. So you and maybe four or five, six friends, um, just just the like six or seven of you in the house. Um, and then you'll share your bathrooms and you'll share your kitchen, but just with that group. Or you might end up in somewhere like the Grad Centre where you do get an ensuite toilet uh, and an ensuite shower, but you share your kitchens. So when you go into second or third year, you kind of get this like nice big bit of choice, like what suits you more. So like, I know that I cannot bear to share bathrooms. Um, it, it just stresses me too much. Um, so going into my third year now, all I wanted in the world was this ensuite toilet. And like, I know a group of my friends are living in a house um, so like it's just different preferences and the other nice thing is that when you go into second and third year the, the accommodations kind of like clustered so like even if your friends go in a house you're in a block they're like they're still like there there's still like a little community in South Oxford um, and I don't I've never lived in North or been in North I assume it's very similar there Imogen did you live in North Do you know what it's like um I did for a bit. So basically the way it works in North Oxford is there's about three or four houses and they each have, you know, bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchen, and they're all in nice sort of like old buildings. And it's quite close to the science department and the maths department and the computer science department. So I know a few people who did computer science who literally had that, you know, five minute walk and they loved it. So it was you know it, it's kind of all about what suits you really um you can go for the big corridor atmosphere or you can go for the i'm living in a house with my friends so it's quite nice that you get to choose that a bit which um i think a lot of people appreciate because you still sometimes like decide in third year oh i would like to move into a house or oh no i definitely want on suite so there is actually a fair amount of choice which is really nice um but as i say it's just also, it's a flat rate at the moment for Hartford, so everyone pays the same for their rent, which I think is really good because then it's fair and people aren't like, oh gosh, I've, if I want to get X room, I've got to pay more. And I just think it's a really helpful thing. And you also, you know that everyone's in the same boat. So I think that's just a really nice, helpful thing. Um, 
financially as well as just equality wise so yeah so, it's, it's shared in the sense that you will probably share a bathroom and probably share a kitchen for a while but not shared in the sense that you get your own room you no one shares rooms um you'll have your own sink and your own mirror and everything so you will have your own like private space if that's what you're worried about also the um just to add with the bathroom thing i know you didn't work out quite as well for you tash um but i was pleasantly surprised because i was like terrified of having to have shared toilets and everything with uh, seven other people or whatever but it worked out really well for me in my first year uh, i think we had two toilets between seven people or something and it actually didn't bother me at all and so the accommodation i chose in second year and in third year didn't actually affect um the the so yeah, I, I'm still sharing facilities I have for those two years. Um, and I was too many girls with it. in one shower, Ian. Too <laughs> many girls. <laughs> yeah, I never had that issue. <laughs> um, I was just going to say the same thing about the bathrooms and that I thought it was going to be a problem as well. Um, but there were six of us on our floor and we had one shower and two toilets. Um, and I never had to wait for the shower like at all because like often you're usually with people who don't do your subjects so you have different timetables so you're never really like people are up at different times in the morning so it means that you hardly ever have to wait for the shower or anything um and I also got quite lucky with kitchens in first year and I had a kitchen quite close to me because I wasn't too big on eating in hall all the time so I cooked for myself most of the time and the kitchens that we had were good enough for me to cook for myself so and also they've been redone now on main site so that's even better for people coming in, in the next few years yeah that's a really really good point actually um you know it's kind of just like you know you, you often share at home so it's just like that but with your friends instead so you know it it's all good fun um <laughs> but no we've got a couple of questions which are quite similar so what how does Hartford stand out from the crowd and what is the best thing about Hartford so why are we so amazing and special guys um <laughs> who would like to go first um I was going to say that, well, I mean, everyone says this, but the friendliness and the community of Hartford is just such a massive plus of being here. Like, it was the reason why I applied in the first place in that, like, I went around on the open days and I went to a few colleges that were in the centre, um, purely, purely out of convenience, because <laughs> they're all close together. But I remember going to Hartford and it just looked so homely. And like, I just talked to someone on the open day that just like really sold it to me because she was so friendly and everyone there was so open. And like, it's, it's you know, it's followed through with my experience of being here. Like everyone is so open and like, it never feels like there's anyone you can't talk to. There's no sense of like social hierarchy where there's like people that you can't talk to and everything. Like everyone is friendly. Um, between years you can have friendships and like you know talk to your tutors and everything and everyone is just open and accepting and it's just it's a lovely environment to to live in and to study in as well. There's also um, a huge sense of college pride which I wasn't quite expecting when I came here but in terms of like everyone at Hartford is very much proud to be from Hartford. I mean you know we we, we do kind of lead a bit of the way with um, uh, state school uh, cohort and everything and in terms of trying to diversify as much as possible so we are quite good with that but also in terms of just general college spirit and everything we have our own mascot we have a, a deer which sometimes makes appearances at uh, sporting events and things and you know we have little slogans like fear the deer and things like that and it's just it almost makes it seem like it's some kind of American college at some time when you know we have our mascot and we have like this huge pride in our own college which is quite nice that I haven't really experienced that from other colleges that I've been to or friends at other colleges um, I'm just very very supportive of Hartford I've got my poster there anyway so <laughs> <laughs> I was really expecting that to be a dig about the the deer tattoo that I got at the end of my second year it's completely unrelated but I got so much kind of banter about too much pride <laughs> but I was going to say there's a, there's a sound bite of the same movie from the last time we did the virtual open day but the the best thing by far about college is Simpkins and like it's something everyone loves the most is this lovely really grumpy cat that kind of just wandered around and just pops up out of nowhere um but the worst thing about about college is that the cat hates me and most things um and he's like there's like there's a handful of people that he's friends with and i swear they must bring like cat treats um <laughs> but like kind of being friends with simkin is like aspirational in hartford um because no matter how much you try he will hate you and everything <laughs> 
So if you're one of those people that can make friends with him, like I aspire to be. <laughs> he loves to walk all over your work in the library, which is quite annoying. <laughs> yeah, he stole my, my chair when I was revising for an exam uh, really late on in the morning because I had work to finish and I came back and it was like the lowest of the low of my first year, like trying to revise for the exam, walking back from the toilet and of all the chairs in the room that he could have sat on, he's just sat there asleep. It's like, please, I just need to do this. <laughs> oh <laughs> no I think our new principal described him very well as a very temperamental cat um but you know he's a lovely lovely thing Caleb yeah I was gonna say I don't really go near Simpkins anymore I kind of I, I keep my distance um but I'll, I'll just echo what you guys were all saying about Hartford I think a good thing about it for me was I knew that it had a really big year size but also a really small kind of like geographical size, which means that like you can be walking across the quad and you're, you're just bound to bump into someone. And I really enjoyed that. And I think for me that that sold it for me because you go to other colleges and they have these big grand, like space, like spacious colleges, but it's almost, you can walk through it and it almost feels a bit like a ghost town. Whereas in Hartford, because it's, we have so many students on such a small site, which other people would see as like a downside. I saw it as like, as like an advantage in that like it's a lot more intimate than other colleges and I think that that has then led to led to the fact that we have a lot more college pride like Ian was saying and we, we generally do have a lot more college pride and like we're, we're proud of like our college whereas for other colleges it's sort of like the college is just where you go to like rest your head or whatever whereas it's, it's not like that at Hartford it's a bit more than that. Yeah you can get puffer jackets with the um the college crests on and I have to say Hartford is the most common one I tend to see when walking around Oxford. You do see occasional ones from like Jesus College or like, uh, I don't know, Merton or whatever, but like Hartford is always dominating with that because everyone's just too proud of it. So, <laughs> it's and they're good. very comfy as well. Yeah, they so. are lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I can confirm Ian also owns literally every piece of Hartford stash you can buy from scarf to mug to joggers to t-shirts and jumpers. He has everything. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful so our next question kind of leads on from stash um so it's about college uh, sport at the university so first one is what sport like in oxford generally and the other one is how do you manage sport as well as academic so who would like to start slightly more sportier than i people um i'll go so um there's kind of two levels of sport in Oxford. So you have college sport, which is kind of internal. And I think that's something that Harvard's really well known for, uh, especially for football, Harvard's quite good. And netball, I think is also really strong in Harvard. Um, and um, uh, the men's rugby side of Harvard's really good as well. We have really tried to start a women's team, but it's kind of falling through every year <laughs> um, as we, we can't get enough girls. Um, but you can choose to kind of have the chill side of sport and play for your college. And we do what's called cuppers, which is like inter-college tournaments. Um, or more seriously, it's the uni sport. And within uni sport, you don't have to take it particularly seriously. Um, but there are levels of you can kind of go once a week and it's a laugh, all the way up to kind of blues. It's like varsity level playing against Cambridge sport. And it just depends on kind of how good you are, the team, how much effort, how much commitment you want to give to it. Um, I play rugby kind of quite chill for the, the uni team. It's like training once a week. Um, well, not the uni team, the like development team. Um, and I also powerlift as well. So um, kind of any sport you can think of, whatever level you're, you're at, there is probably a society for it. Um, trying to think what else. There's also a really strong sense of like community with the sports, at, especially at college level. I think Caleb might talk a little bit about the football team. Yeah, so like with the football team and with other sports like the rugby, because they play on the weekends, they often get like big audiences. So like even if you're if you're not into like playing sport, we have loads of people who come along to like rugby matches on the weekend or even like in the middle of the week if there's a football match. We'll have loads of people who come along like consistently just because they, they just want to be there and watching and be watching their friends. But um a good thing about college sports is in terms of like fitting it into your timetable is often with like a lot of the team sports, they'll only ever schedule matches when they know everyone can make it. So like if there's a football match or a rugby match, 
it will be put out to the whole of the team, you know, who can make these times. And there's usually a, a really long discussion before a match is ever settled. So it's never like with like uh, college football or rugby or any other team sport, it's never like the match time gets given and you're panicking because it's right before a tutorial or anything. It's always discussed quite a bit and then they find a time that works best for everyone and then you play the sports. So there's no, there's never any pressure with college sports. I think it might be a, di- a bit different with uni sports because it's a bit more regimented and, and more serious. But with college sports, it's always, it's always like really flexible in terms of when you play and fitting it into everyone's timetable. I can comment on the, um, the uni sports side. I think it also depends with um, the subjects you do as well, because some subjects have much more sort of like routine timetables. Chemistry is incredibly timetabled. Um, and that can make your free time a lot less, a, mo- a lot more confined to one sort of, sort of time. And um, I was, I did the university um, climbing, I was in the climbing club for a bit and I competed in the university sport, uh, the competitions in Hillary term last year, which is the second term of the year. Um, but this year I couldn't um, manage that sort of, timetable with because they decided they wanted to start putting training in I think three evenings a week or whatever uh, and I just couldn't balance that with chemistry I think if it was a college level system like you're saying Caleb I would have been able to do that a lot better I did try to start a, a college climbing club but that didn't really um, work out in the end <laughs> um, the actual university wide one was a lot more difficult to balance in so I guess it really depends on subject and the sport you're doing uh, and also the sacrifices you have to make in order to be able to do that sort of thing I think the kind of probably one of the strongest messages in terms of sport and balancing it is that you can kind of be at the level that you think is comfortable to manage. Like I'm, I'm sure Antonio will go on to talk about rowing because uh, I know rowing has like this big kind of intense like atmosphere around it. And I know as being outside of the rowers, like it's scary. Like they get up super early, they train super regularly. And like, I couldn't commit to something that regimented one of the nice things about powerlifting is that you can kind of like rock up for the the comps rock up for the weekly training session if you fancy it if not you can go to your own gym or the Hartford gym or like whatever but you just you just come to the the comps and it's like a nice chill like you don't need to work as a team kind of thing so there's like really low level commitment and you can like you can vary your your kind of commitment to it depending on what you can give Wonderful. Do you want to just talk a little bit about um, rowing and then we'll move on to the next question, Antonia? Yeah, I was just going to say um, a good thing about sport at Oxford is that you can kind of enter it at any level and at a level of commitment that suits you. So, um, for example, I row with college and last year I like I trained with W1, the first team, and they like they train quite a lot. Like um, we train maybe like six sessions a week and sometimes that was a morning session and an evening session. Um, so it meant that it meant that we had a lot of early mornings because people had to be finished in time for lectures and a lot of a lot of people who do rowing do for some reason a lot of them do like medicine and very contact heavy contact hour heavy um, subjects but like I know that I enjoyed the training schedule because I quite like routine so it's quite nice to know these are blocks when I have to do these things Um, and it's also it's it's manageable time-wise because you kind of figure out things that work for you and you figure out how to switch out other things and use the time that you do have productively. And yeah, it's, it's very, yeah, it's very doable to manage sport and your degree at the same time. Wonderful. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's quite good having like the times that you go, I find anyway, I like sort of routine um, for when I'm working, but I think the key message is it's, how you manage your time um, and what your degree allows. So like, there's no one blanket rule, but I think a key thing to remember is it is good to have things like sport or other societies that allow you a little bit of time and distance away from your degree. So whether that's sport, whether that's writing for the newspaper, whether that's being part of a languages society or dance or whatever, it's just quite good to have a little bit of time for yourself when you're not in the library or <laughs> doing things. So it's, definitely a good thing to like take a bit of time out of your studies and do something else because as well as it being a really fun thing for you to do it's something that you know later down the line you might ever end up talking about in you know interviews and 
can you imagine a time when you did this actually oh I'm going to do it in the climbing society I did that or you know that kind of thing is just quite helpful for down the line as well but probably cool. just we have one more Sorry. thing as well is that if you kind of join the the YG uni teams it's one of the really like, easiest way to make friends outside of college so I know that's something I really struggled with in my first year was to find people and meet people that weren't like either in my course or or in my college um because you, you just you just don't if you don't join societies like you just don't see people um because especially in first year and especially I guess in law most of our tutorials where you're paired with your your college course mates and like you go to lectures as, as a college group and it wasn't until second year that I kind of really started to meet people outside of college because I started to take up societies outside of sort of just the college societies so if kind of getting to know more people outside of your college kind of friendship group is something you're interested in like university sport and university societies are the easiest way to do that yeah I would totally echo that um whatever society you join it's likely that there'll be people from other colleges and it's just really nice because you know the college is a wonderful community but it's nice to sort of be part of a wider Oxford one too but no let's go on to the next question so it is do people care about state versus independent schools at Hartford I mean we're all shaking our heads. The basic answer is no. <laughs> I mean, at least from my own personal experience, I went to a state comp in York and honestly, I've got friends who went to very different types of schools to me, both grammar and private, but it honestly doesn't matter once you're here. And is it 80% of students at Hartford this year are state school educated? I think that's the statistic. I think it's something high like that, yeah. It's just over 80%, yeah. Um, Wonderful. Does anyone want to talk about, like, the general things? Because obviously there's a lot of media um, presumptions that are perhaps untrue or we haven't experienced it. Like, Oxford's a very posh place, but should we just talk about, um, you know, that and private school versus state school? Or is it even a verse? <laughs> Well, yeah, um, I think that Hartford specifically is one of the best colleges for kind of feeling completely comfortable if kind of the pretentiousness of, of Oxford is what you're you're anxious about. I know that uh, the high school I went to and the area I live in is one of the, the poorest in the country and we get so few people into Oxbridge that on the, the they, they make like these big reports uh, every couple of years like how many people go into higher education the year like the year surrounding when I went in it got rounded down to zero <laughs> because I was so small a percentage um but I came to Hartford and it's never been an issue it's never been a competition um my college wife so like you, you we have this college family system we so it's hard to explain that one it's just um traditions where you have like kind of friendship bonds and like people in the year above that look after you that like your college parents and like I, we went on to look after kids in the year below which like our college children but my college wife went into one of the well she came from one of the like leading private schools in the country and I came from like the poorest <laughs> and it was this kind of it's never been a discussion point it's never been like and we've never even noticed it um until we, we were talking about it the other day um so, so it's not it's not the kind of thing that the conversations yeah. don't start with which school did you go to um I've never ever come across that I mean you might at other colleges I don't know uh, there are definitely colleges that have the big schools pumping into them I think Brazenos has a lot of people coming from St Paul's and, and things like that and they, there are colleges that tend to just push people in a certain uh that tend to grab people from a certain place but Hartford is pretty um I've, I've never had anyone ask me what school you went to as like an opening like hi <laughs> no. and frankly it doesn't matter I mean if you've been accepted by Oxford you are definitely definitely worthy to be here and you know if you can get the required grades and you're even thinking about it just apply because you never know like if we'd only applied if we were like sure we'd get in no one would be here like or very few people would so I'd say just go for it but We've got a thing about, um, can I relax and party in Oxford? Um, how do you guys have fun? Apart from studying, which is obviously fun in itself, um, you know. Antonia? Yes, you can. <laughs> um, it's very much doable. <laughs> 
Uh, you just have to manage your time effectively um, and maximize on your productivity so that you can leave yourself free time in order to relax and party. Um, so yeah, in I'd say that in first year, in the first term, I found it harder than I do now to relax and party because I was figuring things out, figuring out how um, my timetabling was going to work, figuring out times that work for me. And so I didn't manage to go out as much as I probably would at home. But then after first term by second term, I was, you know, <laughs> much better at managing my time. And I was able to go out a lot more um, and do things that I liked and do lots of society events and balance the, the stuff of societies as well as managing to go out and also managing to do work for my degree and also managing to you know leave Oxford to visit people for weekends and stuff like it's all doable it's just a matter of getting used to the workload that you have and finding ways to to deal with it that are you know suitable for you I mean yeah but don't believe Antonio because she rose for fun <laughs> but she is right though the it's kind of a learn like you learn what works for you and I think that like um you kind of learn how to balance what you need both ways in terms of how much time you need to study and how much time you need to like party and relax and I think that kind of as I've gotten like as I've gone further into to my degree you kind of prioritize the nights out and the like work that mean the most to you so I know that like a lot of people will never miss a bop um, bops are like these college parties that we have um, that are like just members of the college that we used to book out a nightclub. I'm not sure if it'll be the same uh, the next couple of years, given everything that's going on at the moment. But they are like the best nights because it's just people that you know. And like, it's not like a nightclub. It's like a, a party, like a college party. Um, and it, it's great. But you learn to prioritise those over like just standard clubbing nights and then maybe more relaxing, chill nights in the bar over like going out, out because you've got to work the next day. So sometimes you have to make compromises, but there are always ways to fit it in um, if you get up at 5 a.m. and row. <laughs> um, anyone else want to talk about ways of relaxing and the such? Caleb? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's definitely like a work hard, play hard lifestyle in that we do probably probably a lot more work than other unis. But if you want to, you can go out just as much as students at other unis would. Um, but like Natasha was saying, it's not you might not always get a chance to go out like clubbing every night. But because there's so much going on, like there might be some nights where you actually didn't have anything planned. And then you'll just like find out last minute that there's like a bop at another college that's on. Or you'll find out last minute that like a bunch of your friends are going to like a certain society thing. And so there's a lot of like spontaneous stuff that happens as well that you might not expect to happen. So I'd say we do, you do end up doing a lot in terms of relaxing, but it's just not always as centralized around clubbing as probably other unions. Yeah. I'd agree with that, especially like with society things, you know, there's so many different types, everything from the sports we were talking about earlier to newspapers to like politics, societies, all the different parties represented, um, you know, anything like that, foreign language films, stuff like that. So there's lots of societies do things like film screenings and it's just quite a fun way of seeing other colleges. You know, you can pop to Merton because they've got like they're often host. Well, in the, back in the day, they used to host quite a lot of film screenings, and it's just quite a nice way of getting it to feel what other colleges are about. And as you said, meet new people. I'd say it's quite important to remember you are allowed to socialise, and it is highly encouraged because I think earlier in the day I mentioned it's just you know although you're here to work, you need to be in a situation where you're happy and healthy to work and having a group of friends and other things going on in your life than just your laptop or your textbooks is also very important so we would stress it is important to make sure you try and balance it out a little bit but yeah so we have a question about relationships do many people have relationships in Oxford is it hard to maintain a long work um, I like to go? sure I think so um having a relationship and maintaining a relationship while you're at uni is a really kind of personal thing and if it works for you it works for you if it doesn't it doesn't um 
I think most people probably don't just start with just while they get themselves settled um um but kind of moving on into like towards the middle of your year towards like second and third year and then do your degree a lot of people well not a lot of people some people do tend to to kind of settle down to more secure relationships it's definitely manageable and if you're coming to uni with a like a long-term relationship as well that's definitely manageable um like it's not that you won't have the time to be in a relationship at all um and I think again it's just a where your priorities sit so I think a lot of people come to uni and kind of realize that okay relationship they're in it all of a sudden is the priority against like meeting new people having new friends and like vice versa so I think it like people do but not everyone does and it's not a most people either way I don't know <laughs> I don't know if anyone else yeah. has I, I came to uni I was actually fortunate enough to come to uni uh, already in a relationship um, and, and my girlfriend at the time came to Oxford as well so that was it was already set up as like a thing for me there so that was um quite easy um and we we did manage to find time uh, for each other and stuff so it, it wasn't there is always time in the week to you know see friends socialize maybe go out obviously do all your work uh, and then maybe do a club as well it's just you find that you squeeze a lot more time out of a day at Oxford than you're capable of doing at home I think we've all probably struggled over the last few months to work as hard as we would at Oxford at home. Um, and, but Oxford just has this amazing way of getting you to get as much out of a day as possible. So you do have time for relationships and things. In terms of cross country relationships or long distance ones, I'm not too sure. Uh, I, I can't really comment on that, um, but there are, there's ranges in everything. Some people really manage it well, some people probably don't, um, but yeah. Um. I was just going to say that I came to uni, I came to uni in a relationship and my girlfriend's at Leeds um, and uh, yeah it was, <laughs> we've, been, we've been fine like we managed to make it work and like see each other especially because like we're we were together from home so it means that when we're at home like you know we can see each other every day or whatever um, so at uni it's just a matter of managing time and finding time to like go see each other. Um, and I like I'll be honest and say like in first term like we did struggle because I wasn't very good at managing my time yet so I found that days literally just disappeared and like I didn't even notice time was passing there's like a thing called like the Oxford bubble where people kind of say like you get sucked in because you're doing so much and then you don't realize and you get like trapped in in everything um but like it's it's easy to rectify like you just have to be like you just you know you get made aware of it and then in second term I was much better at managing my time and I was able to go see her a few times during term and stuff so it's doable and a lot of people do manage to make relationships work it's really just a matter of what you prioritize and whether yeah so a lot of the time there was a you know a battle off between going to see her or you know seeing my seeing my parents um so it's just a matter of you know like what you think is important and you know who you need to see most often and everything wonderful I really so, feel I think... that I, I definitely feel like sometimes uh if you're in a like, long distance relationship or you're really close with your like long distance friends uh and you're kind of in a place where you know you can get this weekend free to go out of Oxford and like it's like there's one weekend in the term that you know you can get free it's kind of debating do I go see my parents or do I go back and back and see my friends at another uni shall I just tell my parents I'm busy <laughs> and I was really guilty for that especially in my first year um for not seeing my parents I think as I've gone on I'm a bit more like oh, I want to go home <laughs> mom please <laughs> but but yeah it's just a, a question of priorities I think Completely. So we're unfortunately nearing the end of our guys' session of answering your questions. We'll be back later in the day. Um, but just to remind you, there's a group coming on after us who are also wonderful and they will be continuing to answer your questions. So please just keep sending them in through Slido, which is on the University uh, Open Day website under the Hartford page. And also a reminder that we have loads of really cool videos um like a virtual tour of the college from our lovely ambassadors uh who are here today um there's also things like meet the tutors and mock tutorials and things like that which are super helpful to watch and i wish i'd had them when i was applying because they're honestly really good um even whilst you're here uh, but yeah i would totally recommend that but yeah so 
in the next minute or two we will have a new set of people come over but continue asking questions we really enjoyed answering them for you and also there are more meet the tutor sessions or if not there's like chat boxes that you can send questions to specific members of staff and all this information that we will be saying when it comes to stats and stuff is all on the Hartford website so if you're in any doubt that is where the most up-to-date information will be and it is regularly updated and checked on so don't worry about that but thank you so much for having us cool so we are the next group of students. We will be shortly joined by some more people, I think, hopefully. Um, but in the meantime, you can submit loads of questions to us. Um, whatever you want to ask about, or you can ask about Hartford, or you can ask about Oxford in general, or you can ask about like our societies, clubs, stuff like that, or our courses that we're doing, literally anything. Um, we've all been in Oxford for a while now, so we can answer any questions. If you go to the Hartford College page on the Oxford University Open Date website, you can submit questions there. Um, or if you go to tiny.cc forward slash ask Hartford, then you can, that will take you there as well to submit questions. Cool. Um, we'll get started introducing ourselves and then hopefully Charlotte will turn up later. Um, I'm Karina, I'm going into third year and I'm doing geography. So yeah. Hi, I'm Saida. I do English and I'm also going to my third year. Uh, George? Hello, I'm George. I'm going in, into my second year studying Spanish and Portuguese. Hi, I'm Jay. I'm going into my third year studying engineering. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, we had someone uh, just asking a question for Ian about chemistry. Ian will be back at 3.40. Um, between 3.40 and 4.20. If you come back then, you can ask him specific questions about chemistry. I'm afraid none of us really get able to answer that. Or you can go to the tutor chat, Ask the Tutors, which is also on the Hartford College page on a, the Oxford Open Day website, and you can ask the chemistry tutor there, um, which is on the Meet Our Tutors tab in Slido. Cool. So... We'll get started with questions then. Um, the first question we've got is, what would you say would be the most important thing to know about the admissions process? So, so we we'll have there, I suppose it could be about the, what's the best thing to include in your application or while you guys are thinking, we can get Charlotte to introduce herself, hopefully. Hello, they, they wouldn't let me join as an ambassador, so I was just like chilling watching you all. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I'm Charlotte. Uh, I'm just going into my third year um, studying biochemistry at Hartford. Um, and yeah, I love, love the college. What can I say? <laughs> cool, thanks. So does anyone have, what's the most important thing to know about the admissions process? I think one thing from an organisational point of view is simply keep keeping track of all the dates and all of the, the uh, deadlines for things because obviously in the in the Oxford uh, admissions process there are several extra steps that that, that that most people don't have to do so simply keeping a track on like when to send things in by like written work and and I think applying things well well in advance is definitely be a beneficial um, because that will help you in the long run to like um, like well from my experience like sending in um you know knowing the 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 deadlines for things is is really beneficial um i would say um making sure that you don't stress yourself out too much especially during the whole process in terms of like there are lots of stages as george says you know and there can be a lot of things to keep track of and yes stay organized yes you know kind of keep up to date with things but don't let it take over like your entire life um i know that, that can be really really easy because teachers are kind of you know being like oh remember this remember this and you, you know you might be um getting a little bit stressed about it um but it's not the be all and end all and also you know going through the admissions process in terms of interviews and things like that um it's just an experience you know it's a i would say look at it as it's it's a 
you know it's a great uh, opportunity to learn about yourself about your subject um but it's not the be all and end all and you know wherever you end up uh, if you're studying the subject that you love you'll be absolutely fine um, i think also oh sorry um i think just being yourself is also really important because um i think lots of people in their personal statements and, and also interview try to kind of um speak about about certain elements of their course that they aren't really that interested in but they think that the tutors would be interested in it but i think simply just um simply writing and, and speaking about the things that 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 you're passionate about is really important because it will really give them insight into into how you think about things and also into how um how devoted you are to your subject sorry 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 there. Um, I was going to say that it's important to remember that there are loads of aspects to the Oxford admissions process. So at the end of it all, the tutors will look at your interviews, your personal statement, your teacher's reference, and maybe admissions test. So don't feel like if you felt like one of those aspects was weaker than something else, it doesn't mean that you didn't do well. All of these things feed into it. Like I know my admissions test, for example, wasn't that good at all, but I did okay in my interview. So they do look at all these different aspects. Um, I would add also like um, in the interviews, I think a lot of people think that they're just looking for like the smartest person who's going to be like 10 steps ahead of the tutor at every question. But really what they're looking for is someone who's going to be good in tutorials with someone who the tutors are going to enjoy spending the next um, you know, three or four years with and some someone that's going to enjoy spending the next three or four years learning in a tutorial session like in a tutorial setting so I think just kind of don't worry too much about impressing the tutors focus on what you're interested in um, and you can't really go wrong yeah cool I I think I'd also say just apply like don't I didn't really know if I wanted to come to Oxford but I just applied anyway and I'm glad I came here so if you're even just like a little bit if you're thinking oh maybe I go to Oxford then just apply don't you don't have to be convinced. It's not like you, you know, you don't have to be dreaming of going to Oxford since you were five or whatever. Just apply anyway, even if you think you're not quite sure about it, because then you keep your options open. And also, um, if you apply to interview, and obviously after after this video, you all select Hartford College as your choice. <laughs> Um, no, obviously, whichever college is best for you is great because um, essentially, if you get pulled. It's not that that college doesn't want you. It's it's just the way the system works, and there's no way of gauging it. I applied to Hartford, and I only interviewed at Hartford, and that's just how it was. I know friends who who applied at Hartford and um, and were, were 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 interviewed by several other colleges, but still ended up at Hartford. So um, there's no way of like second guessing the process or like working out which college you'll be at because essentially um, they they try to get the best people. For the course and then that often that can mean distributing people out but um yeah there's no way we can second guess it or, or kind of read into it really and also every college has its perks um um i love hartford because it, it's my college and for several other reasons which i'm i'm sure many people have spoken about but um well yeah every college has its perks um so yeah um whatever college you are you will you will end up loving it and um and loving the community there cool thanks guys um we've now got a question which is is the transition into hartford simple for international students charlotte do you want to speak on maddie's behalf again or do you want to consult maddie about this we can come back to you in a minute i can, I can definitely consult her i think she might be actually uh on the phone to ian at the minute but okay. um uh no i know from speaking from her, her perspective um, who is one of the international students at Hartford who's currently quarantining with me before we go back to university um, and I know that for her she found it incredibly easy to transition to Hartford life um, first of all because um, during the interview process she was lucky enough to come over and, and do her interview in person um, and so she got to know the city a little bit before she came um, and got to know a few people um, both staff and students that ended up obviously being um, at Hartford um, and uh, from uh, several of us uh, on here were also involved in um, running the Freshers Week for George actually <laughs> for George's year and we had a full 
um, kind of like four or five days before the home students arrived um, just with the international students um, and so we had events and things like that um, we had an international kind of uh, information booklet for international freshers specifically so you know that that Jay uh, actually compiled uh, with Maddie um, and it was basically just outlining all the bits of jargon and um, things that are kind of useful to know come in from an outside perspective into the city um, and just all of those kinds of things we have a lot of support so you'll have an international rep as a freshers um, from from the freshers side of it as you arrive um, and so there's there's always points of contact not only in whoever's welcoming you um, as an international but also in the college um, helping up with with bank uh, you know uh, setting up bank accounts and things like that the freshers fair have designated um uh, people that will um kind of direct you as to like how to do that what uh, information you need um and and the full process so obviously at hartford specifically um it's down to each and every person but i would say from my experience work like working with the incoming freshers um that were all internationals they all said how much they loved uh, the kind of feel and and the the welcome at Hartford and the same goes for home oh. students. I think everyone gets a warm welcome from all members of the college community and um, staff included. Cool, thank you. Um, so remember to keep submitting your questions. You can go to the Hartford College page on the Oxford University Open Day website and you can submit your questions there through Slido and we'll try and answer them. Um, but the next one we've got is one for Saida. How is English at Hartford? Uh, yeah, it's really good. I mean, I really love my course. Um, our tutors are really great. You really get to know them because you have things like formals with them and subject dinners and they're just really open and yeah, I, they're all very supportive. They have their individual interests, which makes for a very like diverse course and you feel like you balance out like different periods and different types of texts that you do. Um, obviously, the English course is like managed by the faculty, but each college um, tutor has like their own sort of reading list. So um, that could vary across colleges, but I really enjoyed the stuff that I studied. Um, and they do give you flexibility as well, especially like in your second and third year as well as to what text you get to do. Um, but yeah, and also because I think for English, you, I don't know, it's up to individuals, but I don't really know other people from other colleges who do English that well. But um, I know like I knew the year above quite well and I know the year below so there's that community as well within your subject um, at Hartford so yeah English is great. <laughs> oh thank you. Um, um, so we have the next question which is with applying to a college is there any flexibility for changing colleges throughout your course or is there the option to change under circumstance, certain circumstances? I feel like probably it's not very common that if anyone has any I know idea. like the the odd occasional person who's changed college but it's been for quite like extenuating reasons um for instance it could be for an accessibility reason if your college can't provide you with like a disabled toilet in your block or something then you might you might move college but it would really be for quite extenuating reasons. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that if you, know, if you get your college and it's not Hartford, boo, you know. <laughs> you know, people, people do have friends from, from other colleges. In fact, like, I think the longer you're at Oxford, the more friends from different colleges you kind of, you kind of gain. Like, I think the nice thing about starting at Hartford is that you just have such a good like home base of people. Um, but yeah, um, very extenuating circumstances. Um, but again, if it was something like that, then normally they can be quite accommodating. Yeah, and, sorry, Sean. Sorry. No, I think it's, um, it might be more common, say, if you were um, changing subject. So I know a couple of people who have changed subject um, and because of college uh, capacity for a certain subject um, isn't, uh, you know, uh, doesn't allow them to change and stay at their own college. Um, I know of one example where they changed subjects and then they were placed at another college um, just because their college currently couldn't provide them with a place in that subject. And so they moved colleges. But as Jay said, it would be very, very extenuating circumstances um, for that to happen. It's not really something where you kind of chop and change just because your accommodations kind of tied in with, you know, the college that you're at. Um, and so uh, it, it becomes a little bit more complicated then. 
And if you um, are, you know, unsure about which college to apply for, you're therefore hesitant about applying to a college because you don't know if it's going to be the right one, you can also do an open application where you don't have to pick and you just apply to Oxford and then they assign you a college. So then you don't have to worry about the college aspect. Um, we've got someone asking about what are the specialities of the, I think that's computer science tutors at Hartford, which I'm afraid I don't think any of us will be able to answer. But if you go, I think the Ask the Tutors might still be going on, it might have just finished. Um, but I'm sure you'll be able to get in touch with the Hartford College admissions people or the Hartford College computer science people. Um, it should be on the website, uh, on Hartford College website, I think. Um, you can kind of find the tutors and then you can just kind of um, do a little bit of a read yeah. of what, they, what they're studying or what, what their research is in. Yeah, Google them. Um, okay, next question is, what are modern languages like at Hartford? George. So, um, modern languages are great. Um, to begin with. So um, at Hartford, I know that we definitely do, of obviously, Spanish. Um, Spanish, German, French. And other than that, I, I can't think of any other languages off the top of my head. But, um, but um, there are loads of languages you can study um, as part of the modern languages course. Like, like you can do like a modern Greek and all sorts uh, at other colleges. Um, but in, in terms of Hartford, it's, um, it, it's actually... It's great. Um, the there's a really nice community within like the 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 linguists, and so like last year, lots of like second years spoke to us about like our, like, our text and like and like we we um yeah we all get on really well as as linguists within Hartford. Um, so um, I also do Portuguese, which isn't offered at Hartford. So I had to do quite a lot of um, college hopping last year, um, as is the case with 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 other kind of smaller languages um, in 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 university terms. Um, but yeah, languages are great. Um, the first year course is quite prescribed um, because essentially they want to give you a snippet of of every of every type of text and every time period. Um, and then your course is also divided 50% language, 50% literature. So that's really nice because you get to um, improve kind of like the 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 um, uh, grammar bits if you like that. Although that's not always necessarily that um, um, that um, mandatory, we'll say. And then and then after that, you also got 50% um, literature. So I personally really like that split because I'm 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 quite a big grammar nerd. But then I also really love um, literature as well. So having that kind of division between the two is, is, is great. Not that you have to necessarily love grammar to do the course. Um, as I meant to say earlier, like it's um, like loving grammar is not like a requirement, but obviously like the desire to like improve your language and to, and to really communicate effectively is, um, is obviously a good, a, a good thing to have. Um, but yeah, a language is great at Hartford and at Oxford in general. Yeah, and Hartford also offers um, parts of the Oriental languages. Uh, so I think you can do Japanese and Mandarin and things like that alongside um, the languages that George mentioned. Um, so yeah, please keep submitting your questions. If you go to tiny.cc forward slash ask Hartford, then you can submit questions for us. You can literally ask about anything. No such thing as a stupid question. Um, or if you go to through the Oxford University Open Day at the website. Um, we currently are, don't have any more questions, pending questions. Um, so I think maybe if we just go around, everyone can say what their what favorite thing about Hartford is. That's always a good one. Um, and then, because obviously Hartford is great, that will take lots of time. <laughs> so Jay, do you wanna go first? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think this is quite an easy one for me, but I think it's the people. I think she said this on the last open day, but I'm just going to say it again because it's definitely the people. Um, I think like when people are looking at colleges, they get kind of so wrapped up in like whether they have an ensuite and stuff like that. Um, and you can have an ensuite at Hartford, um, but like it's the people which really make the college. And I think Hartford has such an inclusive and such a warm and friendly environment that I just I haven't seen anywhere else 
Um, and I think if you're like a bit worried about going to university like I was, the fact that you can kind of come here and it does kind of feel like a big family kind of welcoming you in. Like I had great college parents. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I think the people make it. Anyone else? I feel like this is going to be a bit of an all rounder for everyone. Um, mm. I think, you know, everyone here will say the people I would imagine. Um, and just just the kind of not just students and the, the the student community which is great at Hartford but also the staff you know we have some of the nicest college staff um from the scouts who will come in and kind of like clean your room or empty your bins things like that um to like catering staff and our catering manager and you know all of the welfare team um and, and our dean literally everyone I think knows all of our college staff the librarian our chaplain it's just there's so many personal relationships like with other students in the in the community and with members of staff that you genuinely really feel like you're just part of a proper proper community you know I don't feel like I could go and talk to anyone in college and feel uncomfortable or awkward and just kind of having a conversation or asking them for help on something which is something that's really valuable because you know without doubt you probably will go through periods if you're if you're studying um, at Hartford or at Oxford in general where you are feeling stressed or you are feeling a little bit under the weather it happens it happens to people at other universities and there you know are sometimes busier weeks than others where it might just be kind of getting on top of you a bit and inevitably you are going to probably have to ask for help or, or just have a bit of a vent at some point and I think having that real close and personal relationships with the rest of the community and with members of staff in the college is a really really good thing and a really valuable and unique thing to Hartford. One thing that I'd like to mention just um, just just um, adding on to what Charlotte said was that um, Hartford has an academic skills advisor. I'm not sure if 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 other colleges have that specifically, but we have like a designated person called Catherine Sloan, who if we have any 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 kind of like um, stresses with like academic work, we can go we can go and speak to her to find solutions and to and to try and like um, create like more kind of scheduled uh, work times so that. As, so that you can kind of like improve your routine. So I was finding in Hillary term, so a second term uh, of last year, um, I was quite stressed for for a certain period of it. And um, I went and spoke to Catherine Sloan, and like we 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 managed to kind of like um, work through like the the uh, troubles I was having with like um, you know with with so I'm a bit of a perfectionist so essentially like I spend too long on every piece of work so essentially I went to um to, to Catherine and said right I'm spending too long on the work what can I do and uh, essentially you know we worked out a way to put timers on my work so that I didn't have to you know spend too long on each thing which obviously adds up towards the end of the week so um so yeah I think that's also quite u unique to Hartford from from knowing people at other colleges um, and the reason why why I, I picked Hartford initially was because I found it was like quite a calm and tranquil oasis, like amidst the hustle and bustle of Oxford. And um, I really like that because, you know, um, old quad is, is, um, is OB quad is really pretty and, and really beautiful. We've got a chapel, we've got um, a, a really nice dining hall. For me, it was a nice little oasis in the centre um, of, of quite a busy city. So you don't anything to add? Yeah, um, I uh, I didn't actually initially apply to Hartford. I applied to a completely different college, but this is where I was invited for my interviews. And I honestly cannot see myself anywhere else. I just love how like down to earth and friendly our college is. Um, and it's just sort of like all those stereotypes that you get to hear about Oxford. Like, I just don't think that's true for Hartford at all. Like everyone is always so approachable and everyone is, as I said, down to earth. And yeah, as George mentioned, we have probably the best location in all of Oxford, in my opinion. So yeah, just really love Hartford. Yeah, I think I can only echo what other people have said, really. The reasons I applied to Hartford, were, it was sort of the location, it was the fact that everyone was really friendly. And also there were quite a lot of people doing geography, which was in each year. So that's nice because it's a big community. Um, so the next question we've got is how are the sports teams or clubs that are college specific? So the Hartford sports teams, Charlotte, I think you're a bit involved with those. Yeah, 
Yeah, so um, obviously the way things work generally on like a kind of macro scale is like you have like uni sport and then college sport and it tends to be less uh, less commitment than say like something that's quite serious or like a university sport. Um, and so you can kind of choose how seriously you want to take it. Um, in terms of at Hartford, we have a rugby team, both men's and women's. We have a football uh, team, both men's and women's. Um, and our women's team last year got to the Cuppers final. So the, um, the competitions, Cuppers is just competition between colleges. Um, and we got to the final and like the whole college went down um, uh, to support them and everything. We've got rounders. We even had a croquet team that just did it for a laugh last year, um, just to kind of learn something new and have fun. Um, we've had darts teams. There are there's tons and tons of different sports that you can get um, involved with at the college level, where it's a little bit more kind of beginner friendly, and you know it's more of a bit of a you know I would say like akin to like a kickabout rather than you know something that's taken really really seriously. Um, I think the rugby team maybe take it, take it and, and the first team for the football take it a little bit more seriously um, but you can kind of get involved with whatever you want and if there's something that isn't um, uh, we've got netball as well that's also mixed but um, yeah if you want to get involved in it or there's something that you want to uh, kind of put on that isn't already a team at Hartford um, I know that there's whisperings of setting up a basketball team um, that we didn't have previously. And so it's just one of those things where you can literally just go, OK, I'm going to go and speak to the sports officer or whatever and kind of get this implemented. Um, it's a very flexible college and most people will will be uh, kind of willing to get involved. Like if you're like, oh, I'm trying to organise this. Like, do you want to come along? Do you want to kind of try it out? People are really, really welcoming. So um in terms of if you've never played a sport before or, or if there's something that you really want to try definitely get involved at, at college level and there'll be people around that can um kind of signpost you or direct you to um the uni teams if it's something that you want to take a little bit more seriously cool thanks charlotte um we've got a question which is asking is this one of the more popular colleges in terms of number of applications i'm not quite sure if we are or not um but it doesn't really matter because the number of applications that a college receives um, doesn't make a difference to the number, like it doesn't affect your chances of getting in. If you apply to a college and they've got more people than that they think deserve an Oxford place than they have space for, then they will, you'll be sent to another college. Um, so the amount of people applying to a college doesn't affect your chances of getting in just as the amount of spaces for that subject at your college do, uh, for your subject at that college also doesn't affect your chances of getting in um because they sort of all sort it out so that it's fair to everyone i believe the way that it works and don't quote me on this um but i believe the way that it works is that at your interviews whether you've been interviewed at one place or, or several colleges um or had several interviews or just the one um they kind of not grade your um, your interviews, but they will have like a, a system, uh, like a graded system um, in which they kind of put you, uh, kind of grade you on, on how well you did in the interview and then take that into consideration with your whole application and then look at that uh, graded system across the board. And so if say a college has so many places um, and they have, let's say they had hypothetically like six spaces but they had seven people who were good enough for a place at Oxford they would say okay this seventh person is going to be pulled um, and so this uh, the pooling is essentially where um, students who are good enough to have a place but have not been able to be placed at the college that they so wanted um, or people who have done an open application that have uh, have been good enough to, to have a place at Oxford will be pulled and then colleges that have um, spaces for those subjects in those uh, that, that year um, will uh, take on those students from the pool and it's on that kind of graded system so even if Hartford um, is oversubscribed as Karina said you would be placed in this pool and then um, you would be placed at another college depending on where uh, where has spaces and I, yeah I believe that's how it works so cool, thanks um so the next question we've got is what is biology like at this college and do lots of people have apply for biology here Charlotte I know you're doing biochemistry but maybe you could talk a bit about biology as well do we just do biology 
Yes, we do do biology, yeah. um, and uh, there are quite a few biologists. Um, I think there's more biologists than there are biochemists, um, but uh, we share um, a life science division with you, so uh, a lot of the freshest stuff um, is shared between biochemistry, biology, and the uh, human sciences, um, which Hartford also offers. And um, there's a lot of shared lectures, especially in the first year, um, and kind of overlapping of content. Um, it is, as I say, bigger than biochemistry and biochemistry, I, I believe at Harvard is quite big now. We have uh, generally around six um, uh, biochemists per year. And for my year, it was only four, but um, the, we have increased the intake. And I think it's roughly the same for biology now. Um, and so, yeah, there is a, definitely a big community. Um, we have something every year called Darwin Dinner, um, which is really, really nice. Um, it's all the life sciences. So as I say, biology, biochemistry and human sciences. And we get together and have a bit of a dinner um, and have like speakers come in um, and talk about uh, different bits and bits and pieces on research and things like that. And there's a big community in terms of um, uh, the societies so the subject societies um that are like uni-wide um as well you can kind of get involved with and usually i've been to those kinds of events with other people in biochemistry or in biology just so that you've got someone from hartford to kind of go along with you um and so yeah i would definitely say it's um it's a big subject at, at hartford um and even if there aren't um, people directly in your subjects that um, you say really gel with or that you're really comfortable around you will share lectures with as I say, both the biochemists and the human sciences. And so there's a, an even bigger kind of cohort from, from Hartford that are involved in, in, um, in the lectures and the content. Cool. Um, so we've had a couple of questions about accommodation, which is do first years have an ensuite suite and do all the rooms have um, sinks? So yes, all the rooms have sinks. First year accommodation, there aren't, I don't think, there generally is an ensuite, um, but it's all shared bathrooms really. Um, because we have other questions to answer, we'll not go into any more detail on those, but if you want to learn more about the accommodation at Hartford, that we've got a video recorded by some of the students, which you can see on the Food and Accommodation tab on the Hartford College page on the Oxford University Open Days website, um, or you can go on the Hartford College YouTube channel and see it there as well. Um, so now we sort of, okay, the next question we've got is what is this college known for? And we talked quite a lot before about friendly people. So I feel like we don't need to go into that again, really. Basically Harvard is the friendly college, um, but I feel like there are other things that Harvard is known for as well, if anyone wants to comment on those. I'm thinking the bridge basically, and the Simkin. Yeah, I suppose the bridge. But um, well, in terms of like things that are going on, we do have uh, one. We have a bit of a reputation for being quite sporty. So a lot of people at, at Hartford are involved in sports, um, and it's um, a big kind of part of college life. Um, even if it's not really taken seriously, people like to be involved in sport. Um, and we're also known for being like a bit of a party college, not like you know crazy, but you know we are known to enjoy going out and like to enjoy socialising a lot and like you know again comes in with the friendly side of things I think but you know there is um I was worried before coming to Hartford um about like the nightlife and about whether I was gonna have uh you know one time to go out and and you know party or whatever um and two whether there was going to be kind of like a demand for it or other people who wanted to do it and I would say that at Hartford if you want to find those people you definitely can we'll put it that way um but you also aren't you don't have to if you don't want to I think Hartford is also known for its access so I'm not quite sure about the figures I think it's about 80% state schools that, um, have been admitted this year, I think. Um, I'm sure I'll get a message from the admissions people saying that it's something different, but I, th I think it's about 80%. 80% state school and 60% of the new freshers are, around 60% of the new freshers have some form of educational or socioeconomic disadvantage. So half the test. <laughs> So I think we're known for, for quite a lot of kind of good accessy stuff. I think also we were the f one of the first colleges to admit women, which is awesome. Um, and I think generally quite inclusive, quite progressive. Um, yeah, I've, I guess I guess still under the umbrella, umbrella of friendly, I guess. But yeah, inclusive, progressive. Um, and we have a cat. 
I know it's, it's so important. <laughs> yeah, I think that's definitely a really good point that Half has got a good reputation for access and outreach. Um, so I did you want to add something? I just wanted to say that if you're into music, Hartford is really good for that. We have like a non-auditioning orchestra, which is quite big um, in the university as a whole. There's a non-auditioning choir, a jazz band. I have a lot of friends who are involved in music, so I know all about this. But yeah, if you're really keen and like, if you just like want to try it out, it's really a great college for like music related stuff. So yeah. Essentially everything. Hartford is great at everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and we have the bridge, the Bridge of Sighs, which no one knows belongs to Hartford, but it does. And you can only go in it if you're a Hartford member. So that's a good enough reason to apply for Hartford in itself, to be honest. Um, okay. What is the social life like here compared to other colleges? Um, Charlotte, you touched a bit on that before, so does anyone else want to add anything about what they think about social life at Hartford, what they do to, as, to socialise maybe? George, do you want to? Yeah, sure. So um, every college has something called BOPS, which is which I found out the other week stands for Big Organised Party or, or something along those lines. And, no, uh, I'm quite sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so so yeah, every college has one of those. Most colleges do them in college, so so they will find a room to do them in. Um, but Hartford doesn't have anywhere big enough to house all of all of the Hartford students, so we just rent out a nightclub instead. So that's um, so our box are generally really really good. Um, obviously, th this year I'm not sure what form they'll take. However, hopefully in the future. Um, should you apply and then sh should you come to Hartford you'll, you'll get to experience um, a bop in somewhere like Fever or, the, or, or that kind of thing um, and also at bops there's like no obligation to like drink or anything like people do whatever they want and, and, and everyone has a good time so yeah yeah um, Saida do you want to talk about what sort of social, social stuff you do yeah, I mean, there's always so much going on in Oxford and Hartford as a general, like you can go to like events and stuff, um, see speakers. Um, I do enjoy a good bop as well. Um, but there's also a lot of like relaxed stuff that you can just do with friends. Like our bar is also a cafe during the day. So you can like go down there and just like study with your friends or um, go for a coffee somewhere else in town. Because Hartford is so central in your first year, it's so easy to just pop to one of the many nice independent coffee shops that we have in Oxford so yeah there's just a lot of like stuff that you can do whatever you are interested in so there's no obligation to drink as George said um but there is a good nightlife um and you can also do a lot of like other very relaxed things with your friends yeah. Jay anything to add yeah um I think because Hartford is kind of like kind of like George was saying a little kind of oasis in the middle of the middle of Oxford you're always kind of bumping into people so I think like socializing wise you're kind of sport for choice um because there's just everything is is so kind of nearby and you know people are so friendly so yeah um I don't know that you guys you guys have smashed it I mean yeah I think there's it's a good there's a good combination of organized events like bops which are organized by the entertainment reps who are students um and then there's just general chilling out having tea like <laughs> just chilling which is really nice um and everyone so as previously mentioned everyone's really friendly so you can do social things with those people um so we've got a kind of specific question which is do the netball team compete outside the college tournaments i.e. cuppers or is it then the university-wide team if you want to do other competitions Does anyone know <laughs> um i believe don't quote me on this um i believe that they do um they have like their own kind of like league division thing and i can't remember whether that is just between colleges but i don't think it is but as i say yeah there's definitely options in terms of um uh, when you're when you do it at university level it is a bit more serious and they definitely do they compete with other universities and other like teams um generally speaking though they usually do it through like backs so like 
the um, the university league rather than like local teams. Um, but I know from like uh, from playing rugby, like I got involved in the local team as well, and most of it is kind of like an overlap. So because most of the people playing for the local team were also playing for like the college team or the the um, university team they did both like training was just kind of like you, you did both matches you did like backs like university v university matches as well as like um kind of the local teams or local city teams um and so that might be the same thing for netball i'm not sure how it works on like a local side of things in netball but yeah i think if you do want to get involved in university sport there are lots of there's different levels you know you don't have to be like blue standard blues being like top top um, you you can be like a lower standard. You don't have to be super pro, um, I'd, and I'd there'll be different some, levels. Of six times maybe, uh, and I went to the <laughs> preseason and then did training for like three weeks before you like before the year started when I was a fresher, and then just kind of got into it through that. Um, and so yeah, as Karina says, you definitely definitely don't have to be like blue standard straight away but if it's something that you're interested in like making it more serious but you're not quite there yet that's absolutely fine most sports have development teams or have like third or second teams depending on how many people are kind of getting involved um so yeah definitely even if you want to get rid of uh, in, like get involved at university level you don't have to be like tip top and if you are then good for you you can go and play blue sport very exciting i do not i'm not blue standard in anything um Okay, well, keep, please keep submitting your questions. Um, we'll be finishing soon, but then the next lot of people will be coming on, which, wait, is it the admissions people? Um, yeah, so after us at 2.30, there'll be, uh, the admissions team um, will be online, so you have, can ask all your admissions specific questions to them. Um, and if you go to the Hartford College page on the University of Oxford Open Day website, then you can submit questions there through the same uh, chat box thing as submitting questions to us. Uh, you can also get to that if you go to tiny.cc forward slash ask Hartford. Um, for the person asking how many students were deferred this year, I think that's better answered by the admissions team. So come back at 2.30 in three minutes and they can answer that for you. Um, Cool. Well, we have no more questions. Oh, okay. Here we go. We have a question. Is it easy to get to know people at other colleges? Who wants to go? Oh, I'm happy to take this. Yeah. Um, I think definitely, but it just kind of, it depends on how much time you want to spend kind of on like clubs and societies and sports. Cause I think that's probably the easiest way to meet other people at like different college, different colleges. Um, but if you're someone who really likes, you know, your team sports, you really like getting involved in kind of like your hobbies then meeting people from other colleges will be a piece of cake um I think I've every society I've joined I've found kind of like I've been so I felt really like welcomed so yeah I, I think rel relatively easy but you do need to kind of be doing stuff which would would mean that you'd meet other people from different colleges um because I engineering is a bit of an odd one in that you you do actually get to meet people from different colleges in engineering because it's quite kind of like we have labs together um but I know not every subject's like that so yeah yeah I would definitely say like if you're a, maybe a scientist or you've got quite a few contact hours I know like in first year we had like three hours a day of lectures that would always start at nine o'clock um and so um everyone would just be kind of like coming into lectures moaning to each other like oh my god it's so early like oh god and we just kind of got to know each other through that basically um, and we had like some shared classes so we got to know people from like um teddy hall or like um you know a couple of other colleges as well and so yeah it depends on how many contact hours you have that involve people from other colleges as well definitely you can get to know people about uh, lectures if you just kind of go up and strike a conversation especially in first year people are like really happy to speak to each other because they're all like oh I didn't understand that or like oh god it's so early or whatever so yeah you can even if you don't do extracurriculars you'll probably be able to meet people from other colleges just through your subject anyway also, um, because not every college offers every language, in languages, um, sometimes like two two colleges will combine to like create one tutorial group. So, for instance, for Spanish like, last year, two of our tutorial partners were were from 
St Peter's College, so there you you get to meet people from from other colleges, and that's also definitely the case with, with Portuguese, where I, I'm I'm the, I'm the only Hotford Portuguese student in my year, so um, everyone that that I know from Portuguese is is from from elsewhere. Um, yeah, I think um, geography is good for meeting people from other colleges because you go on this field trip in your third week of the first term and they just put you in random groups with people from other colleges you've never seen before and then you have to just talk to them, which is great because it means you meet loads of people. Um, and obviously everyone, no one, none of them know anyone either, so it's not super awkward. Um, so that's, yeah, like there's opportunities for your course and there's certainly opportunities to do extracurricular activities as well. I've, through the clubs that I've done, I've met people from different colleges and I've also met people from just general Oxford residents who go to these clubs and then also people from Oxford Brooks, which is really nice as well. So you get to meet like a big mix of people, which is cool. Um, but I think now we will hand over to the admissions team. So thank you very much for watching and for asking more questions. We'll be back at 4.20 if you have any questions for us. But now, goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks, Karina, and all the rest of the students for handling some questions very nicely there. My name is Catherine. I am the STEM Outreach Officer at Hartford, which means that I um, help run some of our schoolwork. And in particular, I focus on sciences, STEM subjects. Um, so we have got a half an hour session now of Ask Admissions. Uh, and I'm joined by a panel of excellent um, admissions experts who are here to take your questions. So if you have questions for us, please do put them in the Slido. If you go to um, the university webpage, then you can find the Slido on the right-hand side. Uh, do put your questions in and we will see if we can get to all of them in the next half hour. Um, and if you need the webpage for the university site, that is tiny.cc slash askhartford tiny.cc slash ask Hartford to find all of the places to put questions and we're there as well of course. So uh, without further ado I think we should have some brief introductions. Shall we start with David? Hi so my name is David Hopkin. I'm a historian. I teach history at uh, Hartford uh, and in the university but I'm also the senior tutor at Hartford and that means I've got kind of general oversight about all the academic provision and what's happening in terms of our recruitment of students uh, and uh, that's why I'm here. Lynn do you want to go next? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I'm Lynn Featherstone. I'm the Director of Admissions here at Hartford. Um, so that means that I work with the admissions team on the logistics of the application and um, admissions process, um, which you may know um, for Oxford includes interviews. Um, I'm also the Registrar of the College, so I work um, in supporting current students um, in relation to their academic studies and teaching. Um, and I'm also a member of the, um, the College Welfare Team. Thank you. And finally, last but by no means least, Nathan. Hi, I'm Nathan Stazica. I'm the Outreach and Communications Officer at Hartford. Uh, so I work with lots of different schools and colleges and students who are thinking about applying to, to Oxford and giving them the information, advice and guidance that they might need. And this is your panel. So first things first, we, we have got a question in already. Here we go. Um, this question is about student deferrals. Uh, ask specifically how many students were deferred this year, but perhaps you want to say a word or two about um, what that me might mean for, for next year. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't have that figure off the top of my head, but it wasn't a very large one. And bear in mind that we always have deferrals anyway. So this isn't, uh, although uh, in when we were, thinking about this this particular summer, we worried whether there was going to be a kind of surge of deferrals in practice that hasn't occurred. Uh, and although the college is very full now, um, in consequence, we do not, we're not really thinking that there's going to be a major impact on the coming year. Um, yeah, the, the, in, there may be one or two deferrals out of this process but uh, no significant numbers no not a kind of major uh, bump compared with any other year so the so the 
the the numbers applying to Oxford or to a particular college in any particular subject are likely to look very similar next year as they did this year. Um, and so the same kind of calculations of uh, number of applicants per place will um, still apply. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, we have got a question here from uh, future student, cross his fingers, um, who says, hello admissions, I am curious, what are specific things that you have read in personal statements that made you want to accept a student? Are there any particular funny things that you have read in personal statements? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how much I can say about the personal statements of other people. Um, so I probably won't give it a, uh, any specifics. I mean, I've read a lot of personal statements in the last 15, 20 years. So it's a, um, and some of them do stand out. Um, some of them stand out for wrong things as well as for, for right things. Um, uh, it's one of the most important messages I would want to get across when I'm talking to people about uh, personal statements is definitely only say stuff that is true about yourself. Um, uh, but if you, if you say I'm, hugely interested in uh, French cycling or something like that, it's possible you might meet a tutor on in the interview who's also very keen on cycling and therefore you might be quizzed about that. So it has to be something which you, you want to talk about and you can talk about. Um, but people, you know, I'm once constantly impressed actually by the kind of activities which students engage in. Uh, uh, m many things which um, uh, activities, uh, I mean, one which does stick with me is the, uh, uh, an applicant who was indeed awarded a place, um, who was involved in making replica medieval uh, uh, dress uh, for um, uh, kind of reenactment societies and stuff like that. I, I should say that is you know, there's definitely not the reason that she was admitted, but it was a very interesting conversation about how fashion has changed, how the very kind of clothes which people wear affect the way their bodies move uh, and how that should make us think about previous centuries and how people interacted with each other in previous centuries. So it kind of it was a very good illustration of a point which um, I've probably made a few times on these calls today, which is that we want to see what you're doing, but we also want to see how you're thinking about the things which you're doing. How does that lead you to reflect on the subject that you want to study? So it's not just about working in a museum or even just going to a museum. I'm not talking here as a historian. Uh, it's about um, yeah, what, what did that experience lead you to think about the subject that you want to engage in? I know it's kind of obvious, but that what David has just said leads, leads us to realise that a personal statement is personal. Okay, so you're probably not going to... Maybe you do make medieval dresses, I don't know, but you probably don't. But that was personal to that person. Um, so... You know, if you're writing something in your personal statement, that's why it's called a personal statement. We want to find out about why you are enthusiastic about the subject and what you've done to demonstrate that. And if you have some kind of quirky story that you want to tell us about it, then that's great. But if you don't, you shouldn't feel pressured to make up a quirky story um, or something funny, because I'm sure David has got better things to do than read up, read made up um, quirky stories. So it's personal. It's, it's about you. That's what's important. Feels like some very good advice there. Um, let's go for, uh, let's stick on the subject of personal statements actually. Um, from Anonymous, I was wondering about, since COVID-19 has restricted the work experience or placements available, where, uh, where it wouldn't have been able to, uh, where you couldn't have put that in a personal statement anymore. Are there any tips you could give? So we're looking for tips for, I guess, stuff that you could do that is COVID safe. Okay, I mean, Nathan will probably have uh, a range of suggestions here. 
yeah, we, we realize that COVID-19 has made a difference to people's uh, experience and lots of things which people had planned or had hoped to achieve just won't have taken place. And that will be true of practically all our applicants. Um, the, but uh, that doesn't stop one engaging with the subject um, above and beyond the curriculum, because one of the things which has happened in this uh, period is that an awful lot of stuff has moved online. Um, that's happening in the university, but it's happening elsewhere, museums, uh, uh, royal societies, um, uh, just about anyone who's involved in trying to uh, advance knowledge uh, or, or um, promote culture has been putting material online in order to kind of reach out. Um, so actually, in some ways, there's more opportunities for people to to learn stuff through uh, podcasts uh, uh, and online lectures and there probably has been a, b before. I mean, the, I, there's a lot which has been very tedious about this whole period. I'm sure that's true for everyone who's listening. But there are some kind of, I mean, you could hardly call them silver linings, but yeah, there have been things we it has forced us all to kind of think about how we can the things which we want to do that's true of universities as much as anyone else how we can reach a wider audience using online uh material so yeah there should be things which one could do it won't be a work experience type scenario but it will be uh it will demonstrate uh your willingness to kind of uh seek out sources of knowledge uh engage in uh uh your subject beyond the strict school curriculum. Nathan, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, so I, if you were listening before, we mentioned that work experience as a thing is only you know, really relevant at Oxford for medicine, if you get it in some kind of medical or caring setting. Um, other subjects, you know, if you're doing history, or maths or whatever it might be, then you know, work experience is a useful thing that you might do, but as David says, it might be listening to a recorded lecture or reading a book and, and reflecting on it. Um, and you can find lots of ideas on our website um, at hartford.ox.ac.uk forward slash challenge. Uh, and that link to us, what we call super curricular challenge is also on the right hand side of our uh, open days page on the university website. Um, so there is loads of, loads of stuff um, out there. If, I give you one recommendation of somewhere to go. It's Gresham College, which is an organization in London that record loads of lectures on all sorts of different topics with leading academics um, and other very clever people. Um, so that is a good place to go. And I know that one of Catherine's favorite places is the Zooniverse, um, which is a website where you can take part in uh, kind of actual research that's happening. So if you want a, a substitute for work experience, then go over to the, the Zooniverse and you can take part in a, an academic research project uh, and that is just as good. Yeah absolutely. Okay we've got a quick fire question on GCSE grades here. Um, are GCSE grades eight and nine weighted equally? Yeah I'll take, yeah, I'll take this one. Um, yeah so we do look at GCSEs as part of the application and as things currently stand um, in the last few years there's been the transition from the um the grades of letters to the grades of numbers um and eights and nines are considered to be very high um you know indicated high, high performance and equivalent to an a star so as things stand where there might be um be kind of any kind of um assessment of of, of grades um in the in the kind of the, the aggregate then then yeah they're considered to be the same um that said, GCSEs are only one part of what we're looking for um, and looking at as part of the application process. Um, and we also look at um, performance at school in the context in which it's been realised. Um, and so we will be looking um, for you know, at, at students' performance in the in the kind of the context of the school, which means um, uh, whether or not students have outperformed. Um, their peers, because um, that's very important to us. We're also looking for um, potential, academic potential, as it's yeah, um, as we can identify it through the mechanisms we have to assess students in our application process. So GCCs are important, but actually we're looking at a trajectory for students um, 
as much as anything else. Excellent. Right, we've got a question here from Jenny. It's specific to history, but I suspect it applies more broadly as well. Um, will there be fewer places for history in 2021 due to the need to accept more and defer more students following the, and I'm quoting here, failure of the algorithm? Um, across the university, the answer that's no. Uh, uh, I think the numbers will be almost exactly the same um, in the coming year. Uh, there, there are always tiny variations between colleges to, do, due to staffing, which are unrelated to the pandemic. It's just a, you know, that's how things work. But there will, so there might be some shift according to uh, how many tutors are employed X, Y, or Z college. But that's not. Uh, it won't make any difference to the overall numbers. Okay, excellent. We have got a couple of questions here on the specifics of some ideas in English literature. Um, if we don't fancy taking those, we could maybe uh, suggest that one of the students a little bit later on has a look at those. Doesn't sound like anyone wants to jump in on English literature stuff right now. So we have got some more student Q&A sessions running um, later today, and we've got some English students there. So feel free to, to pick their brains um, and see what ideas they can come up with um, on that. So, uh, in fact, there will be an English student at 1540. So if you want to um, come back to that point, then they can have a go at taking your questions. Okay, what else have we got here then? Um, okay, how do predicted grades work for international students? Hmm. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> interesting. Good question. <clears throat> so for international students, as for uh, domestic students, there are a set of expectations. So I can't, I can't off the top of my head remember what they are in every single uh, national education system. But there is an agreed set of basic uh, norms which will translate into offers. So if you're coming from the Italian or the French or the German system, there is an offer which is not specific to the college. It's not like the college has decided that this is where the bar will be. It will be across the entire university. This is so. So, so this is we've been advised by people with greater depth of knowledge about particular educational backgrounds. Um, in relation to uh, um, predicted grades, then, um, you should bear in mind that we're not using those predicted grades as in any way a kind of determinant. Uh, we are, you know, we obviously hope that um, where your teachers predict where you are um, is accurate. But we're also aware that many things can change, uh, both positively and sadly negatively uh, in uh, these predictions. So we know that they don't have a huge amount of evidential value. Um, they, they are useful because if, if uh, someone was suggesting that someone was clearly very far below where our minimum offer would be, then we would want to explore the reasons for that. But beyond that, um, we have our own mechanisms for making up our minds. So we have, we may see written work that you've done. We may see uh, a, a test, an admissions test that you've done. We will have information from your school in a, um, uh, or from a, some kind of referee uh, in a referee's, re in a reference. Uh, we will have uh, your personal statement we will see you in interview. So there's a, you know, an awful lot of information that we have available to us um, beyond predicted grades. So I'm not sure that they're particularly important. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a question now about um, joint degrees and writing personal statements for them. Um, so it runs thus. For a history and politics personal statement, should you discuss the two disciplines separately or make links between the two? 
this goes back to a comment uh, which Nathan made a little while ago, which is uh, a personal statement should be personal. So if you're interested in history and you're also completely separately interested in politics, then they would appear as quite separate things on the page. Um, but if, uh, if the two in your mind intimately connect and the one is reinforcing the other, then that's probably the thing which you, you should emphasize. Um, it's, uh, uh, so, I mean, they, so that, that, yeah, that seems to me the, uh, probably the best advice there. Um, if, bear in mind, of course, that the personal statement which you're writing for us on your UCAS form is also the one which is going to be seen by other universities. Uh, so you have to think here, you know, if you're applying, um, for history and politics at Oxford, but for straight history or straight politics at another institution, you need to be aware that that might look a little bit strange. I guess maybe to add to that as a general point, um, because we have many other indicators um, as part of our admissions process, um, the, the personal statement, whilst personal and important, and we do read, um, isn't um, as, important um, in, in the sense that we have other, other ways of assessing your um, ability, potential and interest in our course. Um, and so if you're finding that the courses choices that you have at other universities are quite different to, the, to, to what you're wanting to apply for, you're applying for at Oxford, then you shouldn't worry too much about that. So to give an example of our PPE course, philosophy, politics, economics, there's a lot in there. Um, students will you know, you know, be applying for maybe economics or maybe philosophy or maybe politics or maybe a combination of two, but not three at other places. And it's absolutely fine for your personal statement to be focused more on those other institutions um, because actually those institutions have less information about you than we will be able to ascertain through our process. All right, very nice. So, um, actually, we're going to stick with personal statements. That seems to be the theme of this afternoon. Um, but this one is a little more long term looking, perhaps. Um, so, from a student who has just started in year 12 and who would like to study medicine, um, what things should they be doing throughout this year to make their application as successful as possible? Okay, well, I mean, none of us on this call are medics. Uh, I should start out by saying, and it, it would be very sensible to look at what is there on the medicine website. Um, uh, and also, if there are any medics later in the student, no, there's no medics coming on later, so we, you won't have that opportunity. Um, but it's, it, there, there will be a video, won't there, from uh, the medics on the Hartford College website, but also from uh, uh, other colleges will also have similar types of resource, so you can ask specifically. However, I can say that um, medicine is obviously a very academic subject. Uh, and so they're very keen that the people who apply are extremely good in, uh, as scientists. Um, but that is not all that is expected of a future medic, that it's also partly about human qualities because they are going to be treating or interacting uh, with humans uh, that will also form part of their training uh, um, uh, when they get on to the clinical stage. So they also will be looking for evidence of that through um, uh, work experience or volunteering uh, in a caring or a curative center of some kind. Yeah, so there's a, so they, there would be some expectation that you can demonstrate uh, that you have those interests uh, and capabilities to um, uh, be an effective medic through your interactions with other with other people. That's a long-winded way of saying things, but uh, um, uh, I'm just uh, still trying to think about a, a snappier way. But you you have to be empathetic, but also you have to be able to demonstrate that you have that quality of empathy, which is quite hard. I would guess a good thing to do if, if you're at the start of year 12, as you said, is to treat yourself to a new notebook and then you can write down all the things that you do and think 
this year, whether it's to do with your work experience or to do with some lectures you watch online or some article that you've read, um, write it down, write down what you think about it when you read it or do it. And then when you come to write your personal statement, maybe this time next year um, or a little bit earlier, then you've got a, a ready-made list of things that you can you can put in there. Um, if you're gonna, if you're committed that you're gonna start early, then you may as well write it down so you can remember. Huge advice there, I think. Um, okay, so uh, university is obviously kind of different to school. What kind of support does Hartford offer to its students to help them adjust to studying at university level? Okay, uh, well, this is quite, you know, uh, this is an answer which I could be fuller on now than maybe uh, a year or so ago, um, because um, you know, there, there's some general answers there, but there's also one very specific answer, which is particular to Hartford. Uh, we, in a sense, recognizing this as an issue, uh, employed uh, a tutor for study skills. Um, her name is Dr. Catherine Sloan. She is, as it happens, a historian, uh, but she works for the college um, uh, not on subject specific stuff so much as to think about how can students study uh, and work most effectively. And in particular, she's thinking about that precise point, the transition between school and university. Um, and in fact, it's been doing a lot uh, with our current uh, group of freshers, uh, producing guides for them, producing little videos for them, um, uh, which will uh, hopefully help them make that transition, uh, which is going to be particularly hard this year. So because you know, most of them haven't been at school since March um, to make that transition successfully. Uh, so that's a kind of particular uh, a new thing uh, at Hartford. Uh, in general, though, I mean, there is a quite a lot of support around uh, in a college environment, um, some of which comes from the people on the call, like uh, Lynn, um, some of which comes from the student body itself. So students, as they arrive, are brought into subject family groups, so they have a kind of a formal relationship with uh, students in other years. So there's a kind of, you know, a, a kind of, men, you couldn't call it mentoring, if, uh, but it has, a, it has some equivalence to that. So that people can tell students what to expect um, and uh, guide them through, you know, particularly those first weeks, which might be you know, difficult weeks of adjustment. Just to add that Catherine Sloan and Alice, our librarian, have got a video talking a bit more about that. If you go to the Our Support tab on our Open Day page, and there's another video introducing our welfare and wellbeing support as well, if you want to find out some more. Lovely stuff. And it's a really nice video. Do go check it out. Um, so we have got, by my clock, three minutes remaining. Um, so we will take one final question. And that is going to be... How can I be successful in interview? All right. Um, I mean, so, so I mean, there's uh, it, interviews do vary from subject to subject. They're not the same in, uh, in in every single subject. So you need to look at what's being said by the tutors in a particular subject. Or for Hartford, all of every subject's got a, a little video available which you can look at to see what uh, specific advice is given. But as a very general comment, what people are interested in, to see in an interview is how do you think? Um, so they want you to be open. Uh, if they ask you a question, even if it's a question you don't know the answer to, you, you can definitely say, I don't know what the answer is, but what would you imagine? What would, you, what would be the steps which you needed to take which would enable you to answer this question? Um, it's not really about finding right answers. It's about the processes which uh, you can engage in. Uh, we want people to be what's well, called flexible, which is that if you're, as quite often happens in an interview, if someone presents you with a new piece of knowledge, if you've said, oh, I think, X 
Um, but the, the tutor says, ah, but if I told you that this other factor, would that change the way you think? What we want to see is what you do with that new knowledge. Uh, does it make a difference to what you think? I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that you change your opinion, but it might. But why wouldn't you? What's what's uh, why is this new information not actually changing your original position? So it's about that kind of flexibility, that ability to to work through conversation with academics, because. That is precisely how the teaching works, and that's the crucial point. With the, if if you if you can engage in that kind of discussion in, uh, in an interview situation, then that's going to be a, a very good indication of how you'll flourish with the particular teaching method which we employ in this institution. Lynn or Nathan, would you like to add anything? No. Oh, go for it. Maybe a general point, just that interviews at Oxford are, well, yeah, so hopefully you, you've kind of learned that academic. Um, so there might be some kind of frills around the edges to kind of set you at your ease. Um, but yeah, they're usually kind of 20, 30 minutes. Um, you know, there are variations, but it's all about your subject. Um, and just in the way that David said, but hopefully by the end of it, um, they might be challenging, um, they require you to think um, and in, in one sense or another show you're working. Um, so that could be, um, you know, maybe in a, in a mathematical subject kind of sharing um, a formulae and kind of, you know, doing things non-verbally in something like history, it's going to be articulating your thought processes as much as it is just coming up with an answer. Um, and hopefully by the end of it, I mean, students do come out of their interviews um, and, you know, in, on one level, they've enjoyed it. If they, they enjoy engaging with their subject, that's kind of what the interviews are all about. Um, so yeah, they're not something to be to be feared, but, but actually to kind of attack really. Um, and yeah, kind of think, well, I enjoy my subject. This is this is what it's all about. This is going to be fun. I would just break the rules that we have to talk about all things Hartford and say that if you want to find out more, our friends at Wadham College, which if you were here in person is just next door, um, have a very nice video called Six Ways um, Tutorials or like Oxford Interviews or the other way around. Um, but that kind of gives you a, a, an insight into the tutorial teaching system, but also how that reflects the kind of questions and ideas you'd be talking about in an interview, as David said. And we also have some mock tutorials of our own, don't we, Nathan? We do. Yes. I forgot about those. <laughs> <laughs> we have so many resources. <laughs> <laughs> so wh wh where are they, Nathan? They are on our <laughs> mock tutorials tab <laughs> on the open day page. <laughs> yeah. There you go then. I'm oh, sorry, Nathan, do you have something else to say? No, okay, there we go then. Check out the website, there's loads of stuff there, far more stuff than we can possibly mention in a mere 30 minute chat about admissions. Uh, so that's us signing off for today. Thank you for all of your admissions based questions. It's been lovely to um, thrash out some of the ideas and give you some answers where we can. Um, I think we're going to hand back over to the students now um, and I'm sure you will give them just as difficult questions as you've been giving us. Uh, good luck to them um, and if you ever have any questions then find our website, read our website and then you can always get in touch with us if you still have any questions after that. So maybe we will hear from you again in the future um, but if not thank you and goodbye. Bye. Good luck. Hi, so we're the um, students that are taking over for the next 40 minutes. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, you can see our, um, we'll introduce ourselves, what subjects we do, and then you can ask either subject specific or college specific questions. And yeah, we'll try and answer as many as possible. Um, so if you're watching this on the Oxford website, you can just answer questions by scrolling down to the bottom of the page. There's a little questions bar, and then it kind of shows what questions have already been asked. You can vote them up if you want. Um, or if you're on YouTube, go onto the university main page, the Oxford University main page, and then live virtual open days, and then to the Hartford tab and everything will be there. We're here um, on YouTube and on that website. So yeah, we can just introduce ourselves. I'm Rebecca, I'm a, well, I'm going into my third year to do geography, Anoop. Hi, I'm Anoop, and I'm going into my third year studying physics. Imogen. 
Hi, I'm Imogen and I'm going into my fourth year studying Japanese. Lizzie? Hi, I'm Lizzie. I'm a history and French student going into my second year. I'm finally Freya. Hi, I'm Freya. I'm just about to start my second year studying maths. I've just been informed that there's a quick link if you want to ask a question. So it's tiny, T-I-N-Y dot C-C forward slash ask Hartford. So yeah, we can um, wait a few minutes for some questions to come through. Um, there's one that's been asked, but it's quite specific to English. And I think in the next session, so in 40 minutes, Saida will be joining and she's an English student, so she might be able to ask, answer that. Um, but yeah, we just wait for a few questions to come through. Um, does everyone want to say why they chose Hartford, um, Anoop? Why not? Um, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just chose Hartford because, well, this this is a story that I say all the time, so it must be boring if you've been here for like eight hours or whatever. Um, but like I went on chooseoxfordcolleges.com or something very similar to that. Um, if you just type it in on Google and then you can just put your preferences in, put your subject in. And then, yeah, Hartford came up on the list. I was like, yeah, it looks pretty nice logo as well. Perfect. So as you've just got a question through saying, what's the vibe at Hartford? So everyone else incorporate your own description of the vibe of Hartford. So Lizzie, do you want to get, do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, so I picked Hartford, you know, partly on the logo, you know, you've got to have a, a nice sort of logo to, because you wear lots of like jumpers and coats and stuff with the college crest on it. So you've got to get a good, good crest. Um, but also it was just a really lovely atmosphere the porters seem so set friendly. I turned up on a random day and they just let me in. They let me walk around, they gave me lots of information. Um, and uh, yeah, the vibe at Hartford is just, it's very relaxed. It's very, you know, it's not confrontational or argumentative at all. It's really just very chilled, very friendly. Um, you know, there are, it's a really nice community feel to it. Um, Imogen, do you want to go next? Yeah, I, um, there aren't that many colleges that offer Japanese and then uh, Hartford is particularly strong in the subject. They've got kind of well-stocked library and kind of a well-established subject here, I think. So I, I like that about it from in terms of my subject. Um, and then also it was actually the only college I visited in, in person. Um, like I went to a kind of department open day, which wasn't the same time as the main open day. Um, and then I kind of thought I might, before I went home, have a quick look, I uh, went in Hartford and I thought this is a nice atmosphere. So I didn't actually bother to go look at any others after that. I thought, yeah, seems good to run with that. And then Freya? I think similar to what Lizzie said, I kind of felt, I kind of met a few Hartford students. It wasn't on the open day, it was during a summer school. Um, and they're all just really, really friendly and really, really enthusiastic about their college. And I think kind of that, that was something that I really took on board and made me quite excited about the college. Um, and I particularly liked kind of, it had some quite old buildings and it looks very beautiful, but it also kind of doesn't have an intimidating, um, kind of vibe to go with that so I quite liked that it felt quite friendly and open and it very quickly felt like a place that I could call kind of home um, but it still was very like beautiful and right in the centre of Oxford so I felt I kind of got the best of both worlds there. Yeah perfect I'd agree with all of them um, yeah Hartford's definitely I think Hartford the main vibe is no one takes themselves too seriously so we kind of everyone's just very like as people have said very friendly you kind of if you take yourself seriously, it's just, I know you kind of as much, I don't know, kind of as much fun, but yeah, that's definitely the vibe of Hartford. Um, so another one saying, would you, why would you, okay, why would you recommend Hartford compared to other colleges? So I suppose, as we said, like the vibe's very friendly. Um, why would I recommend Hartford over other colleges? I don't actually know because I haven't been to many colleges. Like, I didn't visit any colleges when I was choosing mine, where I wanted to apply, but does anyone have any straight answers to why we would recommend it over others? I think having accommodation guaranteed for all your years in Oxford is definitely a plus. Most Oxford colleges do do that, but it's by no means all. So I think that that's definitely a strong feature of Hartford. And then it's a bit more niche, but I think the pay as you go system for food is really like, just gives you a lot of flexibility. I have friends at Pembroke and in first year, you have to 
um, eat well you have to pay basically for all the food there so if you then don't go you kind of feel like you're wasting money and there's also a lot of compulsory formals at some colleges which you know maybe that suits you but it can be a bit restrictive so I like the kind of flexibility to go to formal there's two formals twice a week normally um, at Hartford so you've got that option but it, it's not something you have to plan into your week if you're not really into that. Perfect, thank you. Okay, next question. So is is like university a lot harder than school? So is Oxford a lot harder than school? Um, I'd say I'd say yes in terms of the kind of lifestyle you have to, it's a big change from going from sitting through like however many hours of like six hours of lessons a day to then suddenly having all this free time and then also having to do quite a bit, like a bit of work. Maybe it's a um, essay week or something. Um, so it is harder in a sense that you have to learn how to organize yourself in a way that you've never had to organize yourself before but that means it's a steep learning curve but once you've kind of gotten over that it's manageable but like it does I don't know some universities you can because Oxford is quite intense with their workload if your friends go to different unis you can kind of look back and be like wow they haven't had a deadline in like three weeks whereas we maybe have a deadline every week or twice a week or something so in comparison sometimes you can get a bit like oh why is Oxford so hard but as I said, it's not harder continuously. It's kind of like the beginning learning curve and then it settles into being more manageable. Um, anyone want to add anything to that? No? Okay, perfect. So was having the Bodleian Library close? Um, so was having the Bodleian Library close what made you choose Hartford? Anouk, do you want to answer that? Um, personally, I didn't know what the Bodleian Library was when I applied. I was just like, oh, this is a nice building. And then as a fresher, when I was like, I can actually go in here, I can actually get, I can literally walk out my room in my pajamas and just go into this library. Great. Fantastic. I'll do it. Um, yeah. So it was so convenient during like first year exams. And um, yeah, it was like, it was, it's, they've got really nice reading rooms. So there's like lower, lower reading rooms and upper reading rooms. I'm not sure what it's going to be like with um, COVID, etc. But um, hopefully, like, they'll be accessible because, I don't know, it wasn't the main reason why I chose Hartford, but it was a big plus. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Lizzie, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, again. Um, because I'm a history student and the history library is right next door, that was definitely a win. Um, but I think because I do use the college library a lot more often than say the Bodleian library, just because I find it less stressful. Um, so even if you um, like, just if you do apply to a different college far further away from the main sort of libraries, um, unless it's your subject library, it doesn't necessarily, it's not the end of the world if you get pulled to sort of St Hilda's, which is sort of 20 minute walk out of town, because there are libraries, there are work, facilities to work in all the colleges. Um, Hartford is very good for being right in the middle and having lots of the libraries very nearby. Okay, just a quick clarification point. Someone's asked, what is a college? Um, because they're an international student. So basically the way Oxford and Cambridge are laid out is very, is different. And I think York University as well. We basically set up into colleges. So I, I'd call it like, univer the University of Oxford is kind of like the brand name, but then we're kind of, we're separated into different like schools so you go to your like I don't know there can be like a school of I don't know how to explain it yeah so there's different colleges and you kind of have your whole university experience in the colleges and there's three years per college um but all of your lectures are department based you go through university through your college so it's kind of like I don't sometimes I think that I don't go to Oxford University I go to Hartford College because that's your experience that's where you do everything your tutorials where you meet loads of people where you kind of go and eat dinner um and yeah yeah that's basically where you base yourself and then either going to your department for lectures but um yes yeah, so you have your whole experience with your college um is there anything else I've missed off that people want to add about what is a college I just quickly add that it does slightly vary between subjects my course is almost entirely taught in the department um so I, I have very little teaching at college um but as a whole it is so that for me it sort of feels more like where I live and then my study is based externally but it so varies a little bit but that's yeah what Rebecca said more or less is yeah perfect okay um okay just a quick one in for a noob hi is there anything about Hartford that makes it good for physics um 
Yeah, so um, I answered this question earlier. So a lot of physicists over here, which is great. Um, so we've got a physics society called Tanner Society. So um, it's really nice to see all the years that do physics and we can really help out each other, which is really nice. Like I've helped people in the year below and they've helped people in the year below, et cetera, which is um, quite good. And um, also we've got loads of um, physics tutors that like go over a broad range um, of like broad if, as in like different areas of physics so um, it's really great to like have like industry professionals just like at your fingertips like constantly and um yeah so that's why i'd say go for go for harvard perfect okay another quick clarification question so someone said which college are you all from um don't know if you already mentioned it i just joined so we're all students from hartford college and the video you're watching is kind of our live q a about what Hartford is like and kind of how what our subjects are like and how we experience them through Hartford so if you're interested in like going to see other colleges maybe they're doing their own virtual Q&A's you can kind of like flip through the different but we're all based in Hartford and ask, answering any questions about Hartford as a college or I know our subjects in general and um, if you want some more information about Hartford uh, on the page that you're on if you're on the main university website and um, you can click through and we have some interactive videos some more information you go to our website have a look at that um, yeah, so we're all from Hartford. Okay, next question. What sort of things do you do for fun? Freya, do you want to take this one? So um, one of the nice things about Oxford is just like the number of kind of societies, both in the college and outside of the college. So I um, started doing college rowing, which I'm not particularly sporty. It was a bit of a rogue move from me, um, but it was actually really fun. So that's kind of one like something more like kind of active to get to do but then also the rowing society and a lot of the other sports societies have a lot of like socials that they'll do so it'll be stuff where we can go DTB which stands for stands for like down the bar because the Hartford bar is like underground so we can like go down there kind of Friday night or um, have kind of formals in the hall which was really nice um, and then I also kind of got involved in other societies so for example LGBT society do like a lot of events that cover like a really broad range of things so it's quite nice if you want to like um, like nights out and like kind of more relaxed kind of like just in the day kind of I think we did like pumpkin carving and that sort of thing so there's like a kind of wide range of things that I got to do. Amazing. Does anyone else want to add what they do for fun? Um, I'd just like to say like normal student things as well. Like I feel like we have a lot of pressure to like do all these extracurricular activities, which are lots of sports, but also just like going out for just, just like going out for a drink or whatever, or just like spending some time with your friends. I think like there's a perception that, oh, I've got to fill in every single hour of my day. You don't necessarily have to if you like timetable your work. And you can just have some free time as well just to chill that's what i do yeah i'd, I'd agree <laughs> you can either you can make your day as busy or as relaxed as possible especially with the humanity students because our work is so kind of it's left to us it's very independent it's kind of like get this essay in by thursday at five and off you go go to a few lectures whereas i know a lot of science students they have their timetables jam-packed during the week throughout the week doing going to labs and things like that um so yeah, it can be, you can just kind of organize your day however you want. So um, another person just asked, are there many foreign students? I don't know actual statistics, if I'm honest, but I'd say there's quite a good community of foreign students at Hartford um, and it, there's no segregation. So it's not like all the foreign students stay in like this one building that's away from all the domestic students and that's what they call like home UK students. That's very well integrated, meaning we can all make friends and I don't know. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. Um, that's what I feel. I find all good. Okay. So another one just came in saying, "How was the application? How was the application system like? Was it hard?" Um, I'm guessing this is interviews. So did people find their application process hard? Like, did people find their interviews hard or writing their personal statement? Anyone want to take this one, Freya? I I think I found it quite stressful, but it actually wasn't as hard as I was worried it was going to be particularly the interview I was absolutely terrified about um and I think it like it was scary but after I kind of walked out of my first interview I was like okay yeah all right that was that was okay like that was fine um so I think it's kind of everyone I've, 
it's kind of a like it's a stressful thing but there are hopefully lots of resources for you um and i think particularly with interviews the tutors want you to do your best um they don't really want to scare you or have you be very stressed they want you to kind of show them they don't Oh, I think we've lost Freya. Oh, she's back. <laughs> so I got booted out of Zoom. Um, yeah, I think it's just, a, um, I've forgotten what the question is now. <laughs> I'm lost. Application system, was it hard? Yeah, um, so I was talking about the interviews. I think they are difficult, but it's all supposed to be stuff that you can do with the knowledge that you already have with your year 12 and a little bit of year 13 that you've done. Um, or the kind of equivalents. So it's not going to be something completely impossible. Um, yeah. Perfect. Lizzie, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, I think because I was doing joint honours and I had more things to do in my application that did sometimes, like, that did sometimes get a bit difficult. Um, so I had to do two, um, two tests and I had to send in three essays and I had to obviously like have the interview I was in Oxford for five days to do the interviews um so it was quite a long process and I think the most tricky part was just getting my head around what I had to do and when I had to do it by but I think all that information is is online and is quite you know, there are big sort of flowcharts and everything explaining the process so you, there are definitely resources to help you with that and I think once you've worked out okay I've got to do these things on this day and I've got to send these essays in and I've got to do all of this, then it, it gets a lot easier. Um, and the interviews, yeah, like they they want to push you and they're going to use maybe A-level stuff as a building block and then they want to see how you can put different bits of information together and work on what you know to expand on your knowledge and stuff and they want to see how you think. So, I mean, it's tricky, but um, it's quite interesting and it can be really quite fun if you just are really interested in your subject um yeah perfect thank you so there's another question here saying i hope this isn't just indiscreet but how competitive is hartford how do you rates of admission and such compare to the average oxford college um if i'm completely honest i don't know i don't know how to we're, we're not behind the scenes so we don't know what kind of the admissions and everything is i'm sure there's statistics on the website if you want to look into that and find out but um we don't really know, and I'm not really sure how to define a, a college as competitive. I suppose there's the colleges that are well-known, so like Christchurch, that's a big name. So people might think, oh, apply to a college, let's go Christchurch. But it just depends on the subject, depends on the college, even depends on like the people that apply that year. Maybe everyone suddenly wants to go to Wadham. So I think it's, yeah, it's something you'd probably have to look into yourself. But <laughs> um, yeah, I think... I, I, yeah, can I just add, um, they because they have this pool system where um, if you make an application to one college and they can't fit you in there, but they do think they want you to come to Oxford, then they kind of group everyone so that they can then be reassigned a different college and interview there and you could go and not uh, getting a place at that college. They, the admissions team do tend to say that whichever college you apply to doesn't actually affect the chance of getting in, even if a college is sort of more or less competitive than another, um, I think it shouldn't really affect how you stand the chance of getting in, I think. Yeah, no, definitely that's, I agree. So um, another one, do people usually make friends from other colleges? Um, yeah, I, mean, I can take this one. So yeah, people do, it depends. Like you can just choose basically, if you want to make all your friends in college, you can put all your efforts into being really involved with college, like going for the college sports, the college societies, like just trying to put all your effort into that and you can make like the best friends, the best friends you ever had, like your years are pretty big so you can find your people within that. Or if you want to go outside of college, you can and like you can join like the main university societies, like journalism doing that or going to talks or like going to the uni, the uni wide sports teams. So that's when you kind of go just, not Hartford based or like college based you can go the next level above and I think that's how a lot of people meet their friends because when you go to those uni level sports it's quite a lot of training but that doesn't mean that you have to choose between them you can just spread yourself out evenly and it's just kind of like you don't have to make any sacrifices just whatever you want to do and like you will 
make friends outside of college or inside it doesn't really matter and the good thing is is, is through some courses you make friends out of your course mates so for geography every in first year we go on a field trip in like third week of our first term and that's when you're put with everyone from the different colleges in your year for geography and you're kind of put into different groups and meet friends through that sometimes at lectures people meet their friends and like and then you, yeah it's just all it's kind of like Oxford isn't designed for you to not make friends friends are kind of like you can find them anywhere um so yeah another one's saying okay this is what's the worst thing about your college um and you want to take that what's the worst thing about Hartford <laughs> That's quite brutal, really. Um. Yeah, I think our lack of kitchens is, is definitely something that Hartford are working on and they are renovating the buildings, but I think that got quite frustrating. And also something that I do, like I look at other colleges and I go, oh, I wish we had that, is sort of open space, gardens and everything. We have one teeny tiny little patch of grass in our college and that's it. And you know, in the summer we can sit there and it's lovely. But um, sometimes I do look at the bigger colleges, which have little gardens and everything. And I would quite like to have that um, space in Hartford. But I, mean, I think, to be honest, that's quite a minor issue, especially because there are loads of other green spaces in Oxford, you know, the University Parks, the Christchurch Meadows. Um, but yeah, I think kitchens and gardens are the two things that Hartford doesn't have. Um, I'd agree with Lizzie there in like saying like um, although like we do have like a small amount of grass um, there's so much like green there's so many green spaces in Oxford like it is so good in the summer term so like yeah and um, I also oh, I can't remember what I was going to say now I literally had something um, oh it was something about green spaces it was something about oh I literally can't remember I'm so sorry <laughs> It'll come back to me. No worries, that happens to the best. When it comes back to you, just let us know and we can hand you the mic. Um, okay, my worst thing. I, to be honest, I had something as well. Um, yeah. Okay, we can move on. <laughs> maybe, okay, maybe in, fa in first year, everyone's on main site and the rooms vary in size and none of the rooms have en suites. So if you are looking for an en suite in your first year room, that's your... I mean, I suppose they can... They said earlier that they can make... If you want... If you need an ensuite for specific, specific reasons, um, Hartford can quite, kind of change that by having a shared bathroom, but like exclude it for your use only. If that, if you need that, which is they try and like accommodate you as much as possible. But the general gist is that there are no ensuites in your first year. But there, there can be in second and third year if you go to Folly Bridge, which is our quite a modern um, building in the south of Oxford. So you still be around all your friends and get an ensuite with a kitchen. Um, so yeah, Anoop, does it come back to you or? come back oh it has come back to me um so basically um after normally what happens um it was a bit different this year because of um covid but um you have like first year exams and so you you wake up and you're like yes i'm gonna go to the library and you just want to you just want to be left alone i'm like quite like i need to be zen to revise and, and and you walk out of like your accommodation or whatever and you can either go through the bridge of size and avoid all the tourists, or sometimes you just need some air. So you go outside and there's like 50 million tourists outside. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in my pajamas. I've literally, I'm going to be tagged in like 50 Facebook posts. I hope the algorithm doesn't get me because like, I don't want to be tagged in this. Um, so it's literally, that was like my one, that was like my one thing that I was just like, oh yeah. Um, it's just like, it was just like walking through Cat Street, which is the street outside, um, Hartford can be a bit annoying especially when you're walking back from lectures but it's such a minor thing like that shouldn't annoy me at all that is not something I should get upset about um, but yeah that's what I was going to say. Amazing yeah because the bridge of size is great but if you think about it you can either walk on just like leave college walk on the ground and around or to go over the bridge of size you have to go up like three like two flights of stairs across and down three flights of stairs and sometimes it's quicker just to pop across but also you get in the background of quite a few tourist photos. Okay, so here's another one. Is food at Hartford expensive? Um, I mean, in terms of formal, I know some colleges, they subsidise their formal, so you can get like a meal at a formal for like four pounds or something. So Hartford isn't that subsidised, but I wouldn't say it's bad, like it's majorly expensive. How does, does anyone want to add to that? 
um i basically like live off jacket potatoes so it's so cheap for me um but like um i think i what i like is that there's loads of veggie options as well like there's always vegetables they're just obsessed with them i swear like literally like um they'll just be like this massive tray of just vegetables waiting for you if you look like if you're back from or something like sometimes my lecture is finished until like one I'd come back starving I'd just be like can I just have loads of vegetables as well and they'd just be like yeah sure so um, and this, the catering staff are so lovely like I don't Gemma's probably not here but she's like the loveliest person ever but yeah I don't think it's much more expensive than like if you eat out every day it will be about the same like if not more um, so I think meals up anywhere between sort of two pounds to five pounds if you get pudding and the meat option and everything. So it's it's not expensive, but at the same time, you know, you are paying for the food and the staff and you know all the time that it takes to cook the food. You know, so it's very nice food and it's very convenient food. So I think it's very good value. But um, and there's always you know there is self catering. There are kitchens that you can cook which I did I very rarely ate in the hall um apart from for brunch uh so it's not like oh I'm gonna have to spend like 10 pounds a day on food in the hall because there are lots and lots of other options uh, and also 10 pounds a day on food isn't the end of the world perfect thank you okay so moving on to the next question how do you get accepted into a college when do you apply to one um okay so how do you get accepted? So when, I think this is probably an international student, so I'm not sure how it works from an international perspective. Maybe you have to get a UCAS account. Um, basically when you, the deadline for applying to Oxford is in October, I think like the 14th or 15th, I can have a look. Um, yeah, so 15th of October. Um, yeah, so you have to go onto UCAS and make your own UCAS account and then the deadline for it is on 15th of October. I'm probably not the best person to advise and the five of us probably aren't, but um, you basically go onto UCAS, you have to write a personal statement and apply to Oxford and choose a specific college and and then you kind of take it off, you have to have a teacher's reference as well um, and then take some exams and then if some subjects need exams to potentially get an interview, so you take the exams maybe in yeah and then we interview in like January time but it might change with a, over a couple of days um depending on on corona because they're now all online and rem done remote they're going to be done remotely this year so yeah 15th of October is the deadline you don't want to miss it because then you'll have to wait another year to apply to Oxford um and yeah and then you get accepted around January time yeah yeah and then so yeah interviews in December and then accepted around January time um yeah so that was a bit waffly so another question is, what place at Hartford is the most beautiful slash famous? Freya, do you want to take this one? I mean, I feel like the, the bridge is kind of like the poster, the kind of poster bit of Hartford. So that's the bit where you'll see a lot of tourists outside of it. Um, it you feel very cool when you get to walk over it. Um, cause um, I think my family didn't realize that I'd be able to like go on the bridge of size and I was like no like I can walk across it um, so I think that's the one that's like quite exciting but honestly I really love the staircase up into our hall because our hall is like on the first floor and they have this like big spiral staircase with these big windows and it's in our like um, OB quad which is like the older quad which is where we have our one patch of grass and our one tree um, and so that that kind of area is really like pretty um, we ended up like taking pictures there when we like matriculated so became like official members of the college um, and I just I always like walking into that quad so that's quite a nice bonus bit as well of the bridge of size. Yeah Anik did you have something to say? Uh, well, actually, this is kind of like off topic, actually. Um, Freya mentioned that we had one tree. But um, if you do ever go like visit, don't revise under that tree because I had my laptop and there was like this. I don't know if it was like tree breeding season or something. I don't know what was going on, but there was like a sap all over my laptop. And I was like, what is going on? And it was like furring up. So like if you do ever come, just like sit under the tree for a bit. But like, you know, don't take your laptop because something weird happens. But, yeah. Nice, nice little nugget of information there. I've never actually revised under that tree, so I'll keep that in mind for this summer. Um, yeah, also what I really love about Hartford is that where you 
So if you kind of go into heart from there's the quad, if you go into the very far corner, like the left corner and then turn around, there's literally like the rad cam is just in front of you. And it's kind of shaped really nice, like the trees there and the rad comes behind you. And it's just so surreal being able to, um, that's like the, the rad cam's a circular building. And it's so nice to be able to just like look up from your college and like this little oasis of calm and then just see this amazing building. Um, yeah, it is, it's really cool. And then also in the, in the main hall, when it's kind of winter time, and you're kind of at dinner or at formal it's so nice being able to look out of the windows in the back of hall onto the rad cam and like see all the streets lit up and everything it's very like like hogwarts i'd say a lot of people that have asked about it and you do get your kind of hogwarts moments where you're like wow this looks pretty like as the question said beautiful um okay so does hartford have any college traditions we are we answered this earlier but we can answer this again um imogen do you want to take this one yeah, what did we go for? We went for Pancake Day. On Pancake Day, we have a kind of race where you have to run around that quad. We were just talking about while flipping pancakes. On May morning, which is quite a big thing in Oxford anyway, um, the choir give a kind of performance from the bridge while there's sort of music and dance events going on. A um, couple of Pacific Hartford ones. Then there's sort of general Oxford traditions Christmas formal um, halfway hall for second or sort of third years, depending on how long your course is, where it's sort of halfway through your degree. Um, what else did we say? Can't think. Um, anyone else want to chip in? I can't think of anyone. Um, so I've just remembered another one. Um, Carol's in the quad. So just before obviously Oxford's terms they kind of finish at the beginning of December so it's very it's bizarre because you're kind of like trying to celebrate Christmas at uni at the beginning of December um but we have carols in the quad where the choir comes out and they set up a marquee on the in the in our main quad so OB on the little patch of grass <laughs> set up a choir I can kind of like even like a band come and play some carols you can get a glass or a cup of um mulled wine and a mince pie and just kind of stand around with your mates and it's open to the public as well so everyone's allowed in and just kind of sing carols in the quad as the title says suggests and it's quite nice because at that time there's a Christmas fair normally happening I'm not sure what's going to happen with this year but obviously people watching aren't going to be at Oxford this year um but so it's nice to make an evening out of it go on on Broad Street go to like the Christmas market come in have a mince pie and yeah it's just it is really like cozy I don't know yeah and it, were you going to say something also, I was just going to say, like, the patch of grass isn't tiny. It will fit more than five people. Like, it's actually quite big. When I when I first went, I was like, oh, this is a nice bit of grass. But um, apparently everyone thinks it's tiny. But it's like, you can fit a fair few people in there. Like, it would fit like, oh, I don't want to give a random number now. But, like, it'd fit a lot of people. Like, when we get our photo, we all, like, we're all, like, on the patch of grass. And, like, you know, like a school photo, you get a photo, like, at the beginning of the year. And, like, we could fit, like... I don't know, plenty of them across. So like there is space. Yeah, it is nice. And I think we're one of the we're one of the only colleges that um, allow people to actually walk on the grass in summer. And I know for this year, um, college are trying to get a marquee put on the quad so we can kind of like socially distance, um, socialise or things like that. Um, yeah, so it is a it is a decent patch of grass. Um, okay, so we've got three minutes left. Um, there's a question here saying what do you do in your summer holidays so in Oxford because the times are so short our holidays are very long and um, so it's kind of like you spend eight weeks nine weeks in Oxford and then six weeks and then summer is three months so the really good thing about Oxford is it's got its own like career service and within that career service they loads of companies come and they advertise internships you can do micro internships internships or longer internships over summer you can do research internships over summer it's kind of they there's a lot of freedom to do a lot of a lot of stuff and like sometimes you can um for me personally over my second year summer I need to write my disc so I need to get on with that but so like in my first year summer I did an internship through Oxford um, and it to be honest it you have international ones and UK ones I managed to go to India which was really cool um so yeah you can do internships is there anything else that people can think of I oh, do you want to say something new? Uh, I was gonna say um Hartford has an international program um, so this is like a sort of English language program for university students from Japan, China, Taiwan, I think. And as part of that, they have they hire students to sort of be like guides, I guess, for those students on the English program. Um, so that's like a great chance to get some paid work, um, spend time in Oxford and sort of 
meet a lot of students from other countries as well, which is really fun. Um, and the Hartford also runs some uh, research kind of internship kind of thing where um, I think it's like up to six weeks, you get to conduct your own research that's not to do with your course, but to do, I guess to do with your subject. And you get the accommodation and food and like a sort of living allowance provided by college. And then you get to make use of all the research facilities in Oxford for that. So I think that's another opportunity at Hartford for the summer. Yeah, I've just got, I've got the stats here. So it's, yeah, a vacation research studentship. It's called a studentship. Um, lasting up to six weeks, you get free food accommodation and a weekly living allowance of £75. Yeah, sorry, Anouk, what were you going to say? Um, I was, what was that? This always happens. Um, I always forget as soon as someone else starts talking. Um, okay, it was... It was, it was, it was, it was. Does someone else want to say something until I remember what I was about to say? <laughs> I can I can say something that was very similar to Imogen's one is this summer, I also helped out on a summer school that's like uni-wide. So you might've heard of it before some of you might've been on it. Um, the Unique Summer School, which is like helping um, students from kind of uh, schools that generally get lower grades or from areas that kind of have a low, or like a, um, a kind of lower rating for like social economic um, stuff uh, kind of helping them and supporting them and kind of doing a summer school there so that's another thing where you can work for the university and get paid um, and this year it was not um, it was all online but normally you get to like spend a week or two back in Oxford again which is amazing okay so that's our slot finished and so we're going, we're going to be passing over to the next group of students um, to take over the Q&A. Um, we also got another question saying, thank you for a great Q&A. So <laughs> I'm glad we, gla we're, we are glad you enjoyed it. Um, it's been great fun. And yeah, we'll pass over to the next students. And thank, yeah, thank you for asking, asking your questions. If there's anything we had unanswered, there'll be this group and another group. So find, you'll have plenty of time to ask ask the questions that weren't answered. So yeah, we're going to pass over to Imogen and yeah, thank you everyone and goodbye. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. Um, we're taking over the next set of Q and A's. Um, there's one more after us for the students uh, for this open day, but it will be on YouTube for a while um, through the live stream thing. So we will briefly introduce ourselves um, before starting off the questions, just a quick reminder to keep sending in your questions through Slido, which is available through the university website at the open day page for Hartford. So just send any questions you have for us, we're happy to answer both on our subject and general life. And hopefully we know people who are, you know, doing other things too. So great, let's introduce ourselves quickly. So I am Imogen, I am a third year English student so I'm going into my final year and I've been here for, God, three years now. So next on to Tash. Hi, I'm Tash. I'm just going into my third and final year of my law degree. Antonia? Hi, I'm Antonia and I'm a second year geography student. Ian? Hi, I'm Ian. I am just going into my third year of chemistry at Hartford. And Caleb. Hi, I'm Caleb and I'm a second year biologist. Wonderful. So we're here to answer questions until 20 plus and then there'll be another group um, during the final session of the day. So let's see. Ooh, we've got a question about interviews. So what is the best way to prepare for a science interview? Ian or Caleb, do you want to start that? Uh, I'm happy to, to start this. I think it'll be probably quite different between chemistry and biology, um, but the science interviews, I mean, most interviews at Oxford, they are just heavily academic. Um, best way to prepare is practice uh, very early on with chemistry. There's a lot of um, things you're told at A-level, which you're just told to accept. Uh, start questioning that from early on, because that's the sort of thing that they will ask in interviews. Um, I don't know, so why, I don't know, one reaction might occur, but a different one doesn't. Um, it won't get too complicated, but do start thinking about the things that you're just told to accept. Um, because you can't really do that at uni. Well, kind of you can, but like <laughs> generally you can't. Um, yeah, and they're just going to be very academic. So practice questioning and answering things and explaining things. 
Yeah, so I would say um, I'd say I'd, I'd definitely agree with Ian in that um, they will make you kind of question things that you kind of just took as fact at school. Um, I'd say obviously read over your personal statement for any books and stuff that you've read, any like theories that you've talked about that you said you were interested in. Um, read over that. Other than that, I'd say really kind of practice learning how to like sort of think out loud because with like a lot of like science interviews they'll like present you with a problem and then they'll like work you through it and then anytime you get stuck they'll kind of help you to move along on it but they want to see they basically want to see your thought process so you've got to kind of really like when I, I had a practice interview my um, sixth form my head of sixth form and it wasn't related to biology it was related to something completely different but we did it just because we we're trying to like draw that out of me and trying to draw out the habit of um thinking out loud and really showing your thought process because that's all they're looking for they're just looking for academic potential and so i'd say for science that's an important one is really think out loud don't just kind of give them like one word answers if you're gonna give them an answer show them how you've got to that answer and like articulate it to them some really good advice that was uh, given by my head tutor was um explain some chemistry or something to i don't know a grandparent or your parents or something and often they're very good at um questioning things that you've just taken for granted because they will see they will pick the holes out of of your logic because you just you know assume that everyone can understand that and then it's like oh i've got to explain something which you know i've never had to explain before um and that's really good practice in terms of thinking out loud showing people and teaching them kind of what you're going through and also just getting making those foundations as solid as you can make them uh, which is what they want to test at interviews that's probably really good advice to carry over into any of the interviews um probably most subjects your tutor's looking for academic potential really and if you're just jumping to an answer they don't know how you think and how you kind of like how you've come to the answer so even in law it was one of the things I really struggled with going into my interview was like explaining how I'd got to the outcome and like talking through step by step and that that's what more or less most interviewer like most um tutors when they're interviewing you they want to know how you think and how your brain works um so learning to to talk through your solutions in any interview is probably a really good tip um, I was just going to say that something to note is that often they'll ask you in interviews specifically about things that you don't know about because they're trying to work, they're trying to figure out your thought process and the way that you go through through things to see if you have the potential in order to do that in your degree because a lot of what we do is, you know, learning stuff that we don't know. So they'll ask you about a problem um, and then if you just give an answer, they'll, they will yeah, like Tash said, they'll ask you how you got to it. Or well, they'll try and ask you about something that you don't know so that they can make you completely think on your th on your feet and they can see your whole thought process. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would totally agree with all that. Like for whatever subject you do, they want to see how you think, whether they think that you're like open to ideas as well, because, you know, they might suggest something which may or may not be correct, but, you know, you need to be able to have an open mind going in. You want to defend your, like I was told, you want to defend your point, but, you don't want to like if you you want to be open to other interpretations as well also you know even in english where there is never technically such thing as a wrong answer um it is fine to sort of go back and reevaluate given new information so if you know especially with the poetry that you may or may not get i don't know what they're doing this year with the online interviews that will all be on the page and stuff when interviews are coming closer to the time but for example, in my interview, I had one of them was on poetry and there were poems that I'd never seen before. They're probably not going to be ones that you've ever heard of. The point is it's supposed to be new for you and everyone else. Um, but I, you know, I didn't get the type of poem first go, but instead of like groveling and complaining for the solid five minutes, I was like, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so now this means this. And actually showing that you can, like talking through that process out loud, as these guys have all said, I think is probably one of the most important things you can do. And just also, I know they're horribly stressful, but or can be, but I'd say interviews should be interesting. And if you just go into it as a thing, as an experience where you want to try and get the most out of it, as in you're talking to someone who knows a lot about your subject, which is something that you think is really cool and you want to do more of, they want to get that vibe from you as well. So I'd say just 
go into it and think of it more of as a conversation than a test because they want it to be two way. They, they don't want to monologue at you. And at least in English, they don't want you to exclusively monologue with them. So yeah, that would be a bit of general advice from me. Maybe just one yeah. extra thing while we're on interviews is that never be afraid to tell your interviewer you don't know something. Mm -hmm. um, at least for law anyway I'm not sure how well this translates but um I think one of the best things I did in my interview was just admit that I didn't know the answer because you're asking me about a law it never come into it's contact with I did I just didn't know um and take your time the interviewer isn't going to judge you if you take 10 15 seconds a minute to just take a step back and like process your thoughts they want you to calm down and to be your best so they want you to to really think things through and not just jump to to kind of say the first thing that comes to your head um because if you say i'm sorry i don't know they're just going to ask another probing question they want you to be able to admit that you don't know all the, all the answers because imagine how difficult it would be to teach someone who thought they had all the right answers all the time very likely that if you said i don't know the answer to that but like this is this is where I'm at with my thinking. They'll probably just correct you and point you in the right direction, or ask you another probing question, or you know, change the direction of the interview. Because they're not the interviewers aren't trying to trip you up. It's not a test, like Imogen said. It's a conversation. They want to get to know you and how you think, rather than like see if you hit a standard. If that makes sense. If you do get something wrong as well, it's not the end of the world. I remember um in my one of my interviews, I was literally told the answer by one of the interviewers and um, still continued to state for about a minute the uh, the wrong answer until I really stepped back and thought, ah, wait, no, they told me that. So, you know, it's fine. You'll be fine. Yeah, I, I also agree. Don't be afraid of being wrong. Just try and take it all in your stride as much as you can. But yeah, um, there's just what I've seen here, which is kind of about an English personal statement. And I'd say that so it says, will my employment of loads of different un unconventional approaches analysis in different literary works reduce my chances for an offer compared to just one? I mean, there's a meet the tutors uh, chat bar as well. So that would be a helpful thing to consult. But I think the thing for me about English, I mean, personally, is that it's very broad and it's about looking at the world in different ways. So if you want to use different ways of looking at things, that's great. I mean, I did for my personal statement I can still remember it somehow. Many different things. So I looked at some of them from a very textual part. Some of them I looked at through, like, you know, feminist lens. Some of them I looked through through like a class and social perspective. And they quite like that. So they're like, okay, so you're thinking in this way about this, this way about that. And then see if you can apply it to other things as well. Because I mean, I think at least for me, the thing is with English, there's so many different ways that you can look at them. Um, and the text that you do, the, the more the merrier. I mean, that said, it's worth going into enough detail to show that you know what you're talking about. Um, don't just throw a hundred terms in because they sound fancy. They'd rather you actually have a point that you're making in your personal statement, I think. I mean, I'm not a tutor, so I can't say that for sure, but you know, don't just give a list of books and say this, this perspective, that, that perspective say why you found it interesting and why you decided that perspective or something um something like that because then they have something to really ask you about or not instead of just like so you read this book so you thought this about this book and then how did you get from there to there is probably a more interesting way of looking at it but I'm sorry that was quite a specific one but yeah great so the next question is a lot more general what is Hartford's reputation who would like to start um, I would start by saying that a lot of other people at other colleges don't like, or uh, at other colleges maybe not, but outside of Oxford don't really know that much about Hartford. Um, but it's like we, as Hartford people, we had there's a very clear sense of what Hartford is. It's just like a very open and friendly community, um, and a place that's very accepting, and everyone is really friendly and always open for conversation. Um, it's it's just like we have a lot of undergrads in a very small space so everyone kind of knows each other and you always feel like if you bump into someone you can talk to them and there's no one that you can't talk to and everyone is always going to be receptive to you and yeah it's just a really friendly community and that was the vibe that I got 
on the open day when I went to go visit um, and I had just some really lovely people talk to me and that convinced me to apply um, and I've been very happy with my choice. Yeah, I'd probably build on that to say that um, even within Oxford, I think a lot of people kind of forget about Hartford because we're physically quite small. Um, I remember I think last year or the year before the, the kind of open day campaign was like the one with the bridge um, which I love that because everyone remembers the bridge but no one remembers the college um, but once you kind of get to know Hartford it's like this lovely little friendly like really close-knit community on the inside um, but I think more than that is the fact that it doesn't really have like a big external reputation in Oxford so I know that some of the colleges, especially at the moment, have got this kind of little bit of a stigma attached to them. Um, whether that be good or bad, so like Teddy Hall is quite well known for sport in a positive way. Um, Harvard doesn't have that. Um, and I think that's a really nice thing because it's just so diverse that there isn't one big kind of like thing your college is known for. Um, I don't know, I think it just demonstrates how kind of diverse our student body is. I think, I think it's quite nice, really. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I don't think that we really have like a a big, you know, like stereotype that gets lumped on us. I think we're quite a, like a, a mixed bag in terms of the people that go here. Um, but one thing that we do have a good reputation for uh, on, on like an, an academic front is um, our state school admissions. We've always been like quite leading in terms of that. So like this year, we had just over 80% state, state school cohort for the freshers coming in in October. And I think for the past few years now, we've been up there amongst like the, the top colleges in terms, of, um, in, in terms of our state school percentage, which is obviously great on the access front. Absolutely, uh, it's completely right. And I think it also reflects the diversity of our student body because, you know, everyone who gets here and it gets an offer deserves to be here and just being surrounded by lots of friendly like-minded people is just really nice and I think just the whole welcoming aspect in an earlier session even Kelly was talking, was talking about the porters and you know it just sets the tone of a college and they're really friendly they've got the cat college cat Simpkins who lives with them and he's he can be friendly he can be a bit more um hard to make friends with if that's the right way of putting it um but you know it's a very friendly open college and I think that that's reflected in the staff attitude as well because I mean I don't know about you guys but if I saw my tutor like bumped into my tutor in the street I could like I've had conversations like hey how are you and they genuinely care about you as people they are people themselves and there's just less of that student teacher barrier that you're, you're people who are interested in the same things and you're working towards something together which is something I really like um yeah we've got some questions about food and accommodation so first of all what's accommodation like will i share a room will i get a bathroom do i get three years accommodation and also whilst we're on that front we might as well talk about food so do you eat in the canteen much and if not why not so would someone first like to explain the accommodation system and then we'll talk a bit about food Ian, do you want to yeah, talk yeah, about I'll, I'll, I'll take a comment. Yeah, um, so first years always live in college uh, on the main site, uh, which is, if you haven't had a chance to ever see it, it's lovely. Um, and then after that, you there's a housing ballot system, which is basically you choose a group of friends that you want to live with, um, and then you group yourself together on this kind of uh, randomised list Um and then the people at the top of the list uh, get to choose their rooms first from the remaining buildings. Um, the buildings aren't in the main college site. They are distributed between some in North Oxford, um, which is only a, a three houses, did you say earlier, Remington? Uh, at least three or four up in North. Yeah, and then yeah. there's like two really big uh, buildings uh, in South Oxford and some smaller houses and things. So most people in their second and third years uh, and maybe even fourth years live in Hartford accommodation uh, and Hartford does provide accommodation for all your years of study for undergrad and four years if you're doing a master's um, and yeah so you just get put in this list and you get to choose where you live so it's, it's a fair system uh, and everyone pay, pays the same price uh, no matter what room they're in 
uh, which other colleges don't do that. So, you know, everyone has an equal chance to have a really nice room. And none of the rooms are terrible. I lived in one of the, the probably what people would say was one of the worst rooms in college in first year. It was, it was like a cupboard. Um, but it was really cozy and I loved it and it was in the best building. And yeah, so it was fine. Um, I've had no issues with accommodation. Yeah, um, I love the way that Harper does this accommodation, like an accommodation raffle. Um, it's always made me smile a bit. Um, but in terms of sharing rooms, you won't have to share a room. Uh, all of the, the Harper rooms are single rooms. Um, depending on where you live, depends on whether or not you'll have your own bathroom. So in first year, everyone shares a bathroom. Um, it tends to be maybe like two bathrooms and one shower between like seven people-ish, give or take. Um, in second year and third year, you get your chance to move outside of the main site, which means you get the option to live in grad center, which does have its own ensuite bathrooms. And then if you're living in a house, you'll have shared bathrooms, but shared only with like the four or five other people in your house. Um, but yeah, the accommodation is really good. And given how cheap it is, it's really worth staying in college for the three years. Yeah, it's also worth mentioning it's a flat rate for all students. So everybody pays the same no matter what room you have, which I find really nice because it means when you're choosing your house, you don't have to, where you're living, you don't have to choose it based on what you think you can afford or you can afford it at whatever time. And it means that there's no sort of social barriers when it comes to where you live, which I just think is really nice. So you don't need to worry, you just need to find somewhere with your friends. Antonio, what are you going to say? Sorry. Um, I was just going to say about first year accommodation about the sharing bathrooms and kitchens um, in that it might look like a lot of people that sharing like one bar like one shower or two toilets or whatever but you end up not like you don't really have to bump into people that often especially in the mornings with showers because you often have different timetables so it means that I like I've never had to wait for a shower um, on my floor and there were six of us and we had one shower um, and we had two toilets and I never had to like wait for a toilet or anything um, and kitchens wise is a bit different but I know in, like in on main site they've recently redone quite a lot of the kitchens um because in in my first year we only had a few very small kitchens but um a lot of people eat in hall anyway so I was one of the people who cooked for themselves and I found that like I it wasn't too inconvenient because I happened to live really close to one of the kitchens but I was like able to cook for myself for dinner nearly every day and I didn't have a problem with it um and yeah, there was nothing particularly wrong with like whole food. Um, I was just one of those people that I just, I like cooking for myself. Um, so yeah, I would say it's easy to do either in first year and then in second year you get much more bigger kitchens and between fewer people and yeah. Yeah, it's also worth mentioning that South Oxford, where a lot of second and third years live and fourth years, there is also a sort of hall down there. So there is something called usually Walnut Kitchen. So you can get your breakfast and dinner there usually. Um, and that's really good food. Um, but also something on the food front, I'm veggie and I, you know, veggie food can be a bit hit and miss wherever you go. But actually Hartford does really well in providing both veggie and vegan food, which is actually really nice. Um, you know, and I, I often go because if you want to cook lots of nice healthy veggie food, it's actually just as cheap to go to hall sometimes as it is to like buy enough food and to create as varied meals as you get, which is really nice. They don't just use tofu every single day, which is lovely. So but there's also if you um like they're really good with dietary. So I've got a friend who's quite allergic to various types of nuts and it's completely fine and they're very very good at dietary and they also have halal meat and things like that so just to let you know but yeah um the next thing is about music so is there a music society would anyone like to take that I'm happy to because it's quiet but anyone else can go uh, there is a music society to Harford um I'm not actually a member of it but I'm friends with quite a few people who are so I will do my best with this one but no promises on and how good it's going to be. Um, so the Harvard Music Society is really strong. Um, it's a non, or it's one of Oxford's only non-auditioning orchestras. Yes, yeah. I'm nodding. And choir um, as well. Yeah. 
We have a jazz band, the choir is really good as well, I mentioned as part of that. So music in Hartford is quite, quite strong, quite good. Um, they also put on events. Um, so if you're a member of the Music Society, they do regular termly formals um, and they do like their own social events. They also put on like external events for the rest of college. So jazz and drinks is one of my favorite events of the term. Um, where the jazz band will set up in, in our hall and play and it's kind of like a slightly more formal like classy kind of chill night and um, it's like kind of like a night out but not a night out it's great um what else do they do they do carols in the quad that's more choir i guess um but music and harp is really strong and no matter what kind of stage you're at, they take anywhere between like from beginner to, to expert. It's good. I think that's the nice thing about it. Yeah. Cause as you say, Tash, it's a really friendly, welcoming community. So, and the fact it is non auditioning compared to lots of kind of colleges, it means that it feels like a nice, fun, chill thing to do. So it's, um, you know, it's not too stressful to balance it alongside other things. And it's nice because lots of people from other colleges come to. So I have people, friends in the choir who go to Keeble, go to Exeter, go to all kinds of colleges. And it's just really lovely to see them. Um, but also you can join other ones too, but Hartford is particularly strong. I think it's the largest um, college music society out of all the colleges, which considering our size is actually really <laughs> impressive. But they're just a really enthusiastic bunch. You create lots of good music. Oh, also they have termly um, concerts, concerts, don't they? Yeah. yeah. So, and they're really good, they're really good. But yeah, like, yeah, the, let's the move on to box. <laughs> are usually held at University Church, um, which is just like opposite Hartford. And it's really big and it's really grand and it's the, the concerts are always so lovely and they're free to go and watch as well. Like, it's a really, really lovely kind of society and the events they put on are always really good. Yeah, and they do great music society dinners. Um, so we usually have a nice formal at the end of each term, which is often dressing up, which is, you know, dressing up formally, but also with a bit of saloonness, which is quite fun. But anyway, let's keep on the theme of dressing up, and we're going to talk about box. So, what are box like? And if in non-coronavirus situations, how many do you normally have per term? I think we should clarify what a bop is. Um, so, bops are big college parties that um, everyone tends to love to go to. I don't really know many people that don't love a good bop. Um, different colleges do them differently. So um, most colleges I know actually host these parties within their own grounds and everything. And because Hartford's quite small, it means that um, we actually end up going to a nightclub instead because we can't actually, um, there's no way that the college will allow us to actually host a big party for three different years of undergrad students. But that actually has its advantages over other colleges because we actually end up getting a whole nightclub for an entire night, which most colleges don't. Most of them will end at like, I don't know, 11, 12-ish sort of time and they have to get shut down. And then they'll go out and, and go to clubs or whatever. But Hartford basically gets a full-on evening at one of the, the good clubs in Oxford. So, And then you can bring guests along and everything. And it's just a really fun environment. It's like any normal sort of clubbing night, but... Um, I mean, I guess you feel a lot more friendly to everyone that you're there with because you know everyone, because you know everyone in Hartford. Um, and it's just an amazing feeling and lots of college spirit that everyone really loves. So, I mean, I am biased because I am at Hartford, but they are the best bops that I've been to. So, Yeah, to build on that. So what Imogen was kind of alluding to is that our bops tend to have a theme too. So it's not mandatory, but it's usually well advised that you dress up in accordance with a the theme. Um, and these can be anything from um, Christmas themed, like Halloween themed. I ended up dressed as a donkey at one point when we tried to make a nativity scene. Um, they are, what was our, fr our freshest bop was like what you wanted to be when you grow up. And we had everything from people in full like barrister get ups to like mad scientists. And I think I was there as a mermaid. Like um, they are just a really kind of just chill nice kind of night out but not as as heavy i think and um, we tend to have about three a term i don't know what that's going to look like post corona um but 
hopefully it's something we can kind of look to start again in the future or maybe remodel and have kind of a smaller version of it that doesn't involve quite so much drinking in nightclubs but they are definitely the best night of the, the term. Nice. Does anyone want to talk about non-drinking um, events as well? Because whilst everyone else gives party, um, there are lots of ways to have fun without alcohol in Oxford, um, if that's not your theme. Yeah, sure. So um, the, <laughs> the guys that, that organise the BOP, so you, you, we elect people within the, the student body to, to organise these things. It's all student-led. Um, they also organise kind of non-drinking events like karma chill board game nights. I know that in our year at least the lads always used to put on a poker night um, up in one of the rooms, the, the communal rooms in college, which was lovely. Um, what else? We, we do a film night and stuff in Freshers. Um, we have welfare teas quite often. So welfare tea is basically where your college reps will just go and buy a whole bunch of food and stuff from the local Tesco and put it in the JCR and you get to go and eat and chill and catch up with people. It's always really lovely. Um, what else? There are also, sorry, sorry, Caleb. Oh, I was just going to say, I had, um, we often do like quizzes and stuff in the, in the college bar which obviously there, sometimes there'll be people drinking there, but most of the time, like it's not like a heavy drinking thing. Like you'll go down like with your friends, you'll all get in a team. Um, you'll usually have like one team that's like ridiculously big. There'll be like 15 people on one team and they'll always win. But yeah, they're always really fun, the, uh, the bar quizzes. There's some interesting team names. There are always um, people as well who, I mean, we know quite a lot of <clears throat> in our year who, don't drink and but they, they still can really enjoy college bops and things i mean there's normally uh pre-bop parties that go down um in the bar in the college bar but there's like no pressure to drink there or anything it's just it's such a good communal spirit that um that's more what people get all the fun and enjoyment out of i think um it's just a lot of fun uh and yeah there's no pressure to drink and people still do have fun without doing that yeah i've worked a couple of the bops behind the college bar and then been working a little bit too late to catch up with the drinking and had to do bops kind of sober. And they're still amazing. And they're still like the like this really lovely kind of mental community spirit. And it's like going clubbing, but seeing like going into a club and everyone you know in that club being your friends um, and like people you already know. So it's not bumping into strangers or like rammed because it's, like limited in terms of people because it's only our student body there it's not like brand mental club it's, it's a really good night um yeah i was just gonna say again for people who don't drink going to bops you can also um they, they you can also volunteer volunteer to be what we call like a well fairy um where you have like an hour shift where you're kind of tasked with like looking after people who um might need looking after but if you do that you also get free entry so i know for a lot of people who don't drink you can just sign up to do that for like one hour of the night and then you've got the rest of the night open to you to enjoy the bop and i have a lot of friends who don't drink and they still very much enjoy them again like it's just such a lovely environment because you know everyone and everyone is friendly and it's like yeah being at a club but everyone is your friend <laughs> yeah it's a really fun really like chill and safe club night and it just it feels like a proper community spirit as everyone said so we've got a couple of questions about um personal statements so one is it's hard to get work experience this year because of coronavirus what else can i put on my personal statement and then another person has said how many books is too much for my personal statement so because we've got quite a range of subjects it might be helpful for each of each do like a little quick overview of what kind of things often people put in but remember a personal statement is called personal for a reason it's about you and what you find interesting not what you think tutors will necessarily find what they really want it's what they want to know you through that so I'd say that's a key piece of advice but Caleb would you like to start especially because you know practical work might be more helpful for a science than say an English degree yeah so um so with like obviously the lack of like getting like physical work experience I'd say like you can always do like online university courses so like there's MOOC courses um, which people do I did one of them they're really helpful and they're free for everyone um, and I think given that like 
this the pandemic's affected everyone i think they're going to understand slightly more next year that um that people are, will have struggled to get work experience so if you can't get work experience i wouldn't worry about it too much because they are going to understand the context behind why like why a lot of students are going to struggle to secure any um in terms of like personal statements and what you put on there i i was saying earlier um that like for biology it's quite a, a mixed bag so like i put like two or three books on my personal statement whereas other biologists didn't put any books on theirs and theirs was more based around work experience and practical experiences so it's all in it's all like on a bit of a broad spectrum for biology but i wouldn't say there's like a number of books that's too many um i think probably write maybe a couple of books because then if you have just a couple like two or three you can write you can write about them in more detail whereas you don't want to have like six books on there but you've only written a sentence on each so that would be my advice um i was just going to say for geography in terms of work experience and books what because the subject is so broad and people would have studied very different things um they and they also don't want to disadvantage people who haven't had the experience like haven't had the opportunities to get all the experience or have the resources to go traveling and stuff they look more for you to apply your passion and geographical thinking to kind of what you've already done um and i know especially for me like i didn't do a lot of geography related work experience and stuff beforehand because i kind of changed what subject i wanted to study very late so i was kind of able to apply like work experience I'd done for physics and stuff but use kind of the thinking of the subject and my passion for the subject to write about it um, and then also similarly with books they just want you to show that you're interested so I wouldn't go out and try and read loads of books that you don't like just so you can write about them I'd say the most important thing is reading about things that you're interested in um, so that you can talk about so that you can write in your personal statement but also in case you get you get asked about something similar in an interview you can also apply what you've read and that shows that you're really interested in the subject which is the number one thing that they're looking for work experience with chemistry doesn't seem to be as big of a deal uh, i was told by my school at a level that i had to write in my personal statement about all the things i learned from my work experience and you know how it changed me as a person as a chemist and i, I actually asked the head of department when i came up um, and he was like what is the point just show that you're passionate um and that's the the most crucial thing in chemistry it does also seem to follow on in later years that relatively few chemists actually go and get uh internships in the summer uh in the first two years of study it seems to be a kind of like third year to fourth year transition thing or after fourth year uh whereas in other sciences i think engineering they're like or, or law you're like fighting from day one to get on that kind of internship ladder um but it doesn't really seem to be a problem with chemistry. As for books, um, if you're going to read it as ever, uh, read it if you're going to put it on, because uh, they could ask you about it. It's relatively unlikely. They're more likely to want to just ask you some general questions. But um, yeah, don't put something on your personal statement unless you're going to read it, because it could come back to bite you. And that's not what you want in the interviews. So. Um, in terms of law, so there's never one kind of thing that gets you an interview there's never one thing to put in your personal statement and I think something important to remember especially for law is that your personal statement is always taken kind of as part of an overview of you and um, so they are going to look at your LNAT scores they are going to look at your predicted grades and stuff as well so don't don't worry too much about one individual component of that just try and do your best overall I think in terms of specific advice for it um don't put like 10 15 books on there at all kind of think Read as much as you can and as much as is interesting to you, but pick one or two or an area of law or a type of law that you have a specific interest in and talk about that and talk about why and talk about how that interest is kind of reflected, I guess, in the rest of the things you've done. So I was in a really odd position where I hadn't done any kind of legal work experience at all because I had a, like a, a real part-time job at the time um, because I needed the money to pay for my boss to college. Um, so I, I had like shop work and retail work, but what I did have was my college debating society. So I linked that into law and I linked um, those kind of like little extracurricular things. And even if it's stuff you've done in like high school, you can link it back to that. And um, what is really important is that you're not trying to fit some sort of like 
tutor like criteria they aren't looking for a person there isn't like a, a checklist that they go through and say well they've read this book or like they've had this experience or they've had this what they're looking for is to get a feel for who you are and what you're interested in and how you think as well um so i think that the kind of best advice we can give is find a bit of your subject that you're actually really genuinely passionate about and show that you're passionate about it don't try and sell yourself as like the oxford type sell yourself as you and what you're interested yeah. in oxford would be really boring if everyone had to fit a formula so completely they don't want that. <laughs> i think especially hartford is against that you do it to please them you do it for you um just something for english obviously um there's millions of books published so actually what you put on your personal statement is perhaps more relevant interview wise than many other subjects because obviously they can't expect you to have read everything so if you put a book on there please be prepared to talk about it um i think what these guys have all been saying about you know actually write in depth uh, about the book rather than just a list they don't want a list of what you they don't want your library catalog they want to know what you think about stuff so admittedly, I wrote about way many books on my personal statement, like so many, but I had something to say about each of them. But some people I know did literally up to one or like two or three, and that's equally fine. Just find something to interest you. And also it doesn't always just have to be reading. It can be like a podcast. So actually listening to this in our time pack podcast on X made me think about X in a new way. And that kind of thing can be really helpful. Um, but also something with the ELAP um because some other people have been talking about admissions tests and i've got a question here about it what i did i mean personally was just do as many of them as i could i personally had a gap year so actually i hadn't done any kind of writing school work since you know june and then i had this exam in october so i just did as many practice papers as i could just look at the examples that they have things like that all the information that you need for them is on the website. I mean, the point of them is it's a skills test rather than a knowledge test. They're not expecting for you to have heard of what the extracts are. Just write about them in a way that you find interesting and hopefully that will be what it takes. I mean, all the information is there. So I'd just say, make sure you try and read all the information available to you. Um, but very much, especially with your personal statement and interview, just stay true to yourself because as the other guys have all been saying, they want to know about you as a person. You know, if you've got through the interview, if you've got through the personal statement, the predicted grades and the, um, you know, admissions test, they evidently think you're pretty good. Like you're really doing something right. And it's kind of a, it's a two way thing. Do you want to work with them? Do they want to work with you? don't take it personally either either way but you know it's just a good way of finding out you as a person and I think the thing the guys have all said is passion uh, don't use the word passion as someone said earlier too many times it loses a bit of meaning but they want to uh, someone said to me once the two words you want to have are interesting and interested so you want to be interested in your subject but also be interesting when you're talking about it um so yeah but I just think that's our time up. Quick thing before we head off, actually. Uh, Imogen was just talking about admissions tests. Um, I don't know how well this translates into other subjects, but very recently I've seen things like uh, admissions tests, like guides um, being published and these courses you can take, and like, like a guaranteed pass and an admissions test. Don't invest your money in that. It's really not worth it. Um, there is no guarantee that getting that book will pass you the admissions test. The, the admissions tests serve a really good purpose and as stressful as they are at the time, you're better off demonstrating like how you think through your test than trying to pass it. They're meant to be really difficult. As far as the LNET is, it's a critical thinking test. It's meant to be really challenging. Um, and I think don't like spend money and time going through a guide to pass it just do the practice tests that they put on the LNET website um, that's your best preparation for it really great well thank you so much guys uh, and thank you all for sending in your questions and continue to do so because we've got another set of wonderful student um, ambassadors ready to answer your next questions keep 
uh, clicking on Slido and asking any more questions you want to know. It's been really nice meeting you. And remember to check out the videos on like the college tours, the mock interviews, meet the tutors, all those kind of things too. But really nice to meet you, uh, even virtually. Have a great time. Bye. Cool. Thanks to Imogen and the rest of the students in that group. Um, we are the students that are taking over for the last slot. This is your last chance to ask a question to the us Hartford students. Um, we'll be here until five o'clock. So please do ask those questions. Um, you can go to the Hartford College page on the Oxford Open Day website and uh, submit questions through Slido there. You can also get to that by going to tiny.cc forward slash ask Hartford. And do ask us questions about literally anything, life in Oxford, life at Hartford, our courses, anything basically. Um, so first off, we will introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm Karina, I am going to third year and I'm doing geography. Uh, George, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm George. Um, I'm going into my second year doing Spanish and Portuguese. Hi, I'm Charlotte. Um, I'm just going into my third year of biochemistry at Hartford. Hi, I'm Jay. I'm just going into my third year um, doing engineering at Hartford. Hi, I'm Sada. I'm also going to my third year and I do English. Cool. Um, so you can, yeah, those are our courses and they're also like on our names. So if you have any questions about those, do ask. Um, we've had a couple of questions, questions about accommodation that I'm going to assume weren't answered by the previous group. Um, um, maybe we can just talk a bit about accommodation in general to answer all these questions. So it's how is the accommodation? Is it on site for all years? And what are the self-catering facilities? Um, George, you've just been in the freshest accommodation do you, more recently than the rest of us. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, so last year, the situation was different to this year in that um, I believe that that some new kitchens have been like made and and um, all and well, lots of the rooms have been renovated. So um, that would be great for you guys. Um, so last year, there are only two kitchens, but I'm pretty sure there are more this year. But in in terms of self catering provision, um, as far as I know, there's no uh, there aren't any en suites for first years. As far as I know. Uh, but I would definitely check that out on the accommodations tab on the website. Um, and then, so Hartford does guarantee accommodation for, for all three or four years of your course. So um, so now into second year, I'm moving into um, uh, another building, essentially 15 minutes from the centre. So um, like it, it's still like super um, convenient and like really, um, and like still a really nice place to live. Um, but yeah, Hartford does guarantee for three years, which when I applied, I didn't really consider as like a, a, a really big factor. But now like I'm moving into second year and I know that I should be with my friends and and um, and I didn't have to sort a house out in like in like the third week when I barely knew anyone. Like knowing that now is like now is is really comforting because. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um Saida, you said you had been cooking in, I didn't do much cooking last year, but do you want to talk a bit about the second year accommodation, second, third and fourth year accommodation yeah. and the kitchens there as well? Okay, so yeah, so um, for second and third year, we have like accommodation in South Oxford and North Oxford. There's a mixture of still like um, sort of blocks of buildings similar to what you get in college but there are also houses so um you get to ballot for um for certain rooms with a group of friends so if you prefer to live in a house there are those options um one of our buildings in the south in south oxford has on suites so if you're really keen on that you can try to get a room there um, we also have a, like, a catering facility in south oxford as well which makes it really convenient if you um, if you don't want to go to Hall all the way in college, you can just go to um, the catering facility in South Oxford. Um, but yeah, as George said, like it's still really convenient. Um, it only takes me like five minutes on a bike to get to college or the centre of Oxford. And um, so that's great. And the kitchens are much better in second and third year. So if you're more, if you're keen on cooking, you can do. Um, but I also cooked a fair bit in my first year as well. Um, and there are facilities for it. So yeah, there is a lot of flexibility. 
Cool. Um, and if you want to find out anything more about the food and accommodation situation at Hartford, you can find that either there's information on the website and also if you go to the Hartford page on the Oxford Open Days website, there's a food and accommodation tab at the top. And if you click on that, then there's lots of information about food and accommodation. Um, cool. So next question is, how did you choose Hartford? Who wants to go first? Um, so I went on an access and outreach day with my school. So I went to, I actually went to two of them. Um, the first one was at Brasenose College and um, the second one, no, the first one was at Oriel and the second one was at Brasenose. Um, and I remember I went on the first one and I just wasn't really jazzed about the whole uni. I was just like, oh my God, no, it's big, it's scary. Mm -hmm. The people seem quite intimidating. And like, I just feel like, it's not really for me and I came back like no no it's off the table my mom was like what I thought you really really liked the idea I was like yeah no it's off the table and then by chance I like went on another one the year uh, like a year later and it was at Brasenose and they happened to take us over to Hartford and we did most of the, the academic stuff at Hartford and I was like this is really nice the the students that were all like knocking about were just really really friendly and they were like just chatting to us we, we had lunch there and they were just like chatting to us in the queue like yeah so like what are you like what are you here for and like we're just like talking to us and I was like oh my god they all seem so friendly and that's when I was just like right I'll go to Oxford but I'm only if it's Hartford <laughs> <laughs> hence then I would like just applied there I was like if I don't get Hartford I don't want to go and that was it <laughs> George, did you apply to Hartford? Yeah, I also applied to Hartford because when I was in Oxford in year 12 on the unique summer school, um, I uh, so we visited Hartford because my ambassador was at Hartford at the time. Um, and I really liked it because it felt like a really like peaceful and tranquil oasis, like amidst the like hustle and bustle of Oxford. So for me, it was really nice to be in a place that was calm and and, and welcoming and friendly but still right in, in in the middle of things you know as a, a lounger student it's perfect because it's it, it's a, a a five five minute walk from the library five minute walk from lectures um it you know there are libraries all around and like cafes and like so it, it is a great place to be in terms of location but also it's really like tranquil and um, in the midst of um of all of the uh, busy aspects of oxford as well Thanks. So I'll talk a bit about why I chose Oxford and then we can hear from Jay and Slade, why I chose Hartford even, and then Jay and Slade, they can talk about why they think Hartford's the best place despite having not applied. <laughs> um, I chose Hartford, so I went on a geography open day, not the Oxford open day, it was like geography specific open day, where they had talks in the geography department and then you got shipped off to a college for lunch. Um, and I went to Hartford with a load of other people. Um, and it was really nice um all people were really friendly um but I was like okay yeah it seems they have a good they had a good reputation for geography as well because there's quite a lot of geographers in each year um so I didn't I never actually looked around any of the other colleges but I was like you know what this will do half looks nice I'll apply there um and also I mean it was also because it met um quite a lot of the criteria that I was looking for in a college which was stuff like uh being pretty central as George said and not being super huge like we have quite a lot of students but the actual space that the college covers is not super huge so it's nice because it's sort of small and friendly um and yeah that kind of thing was so I had like a couple of various different criteria and half the team to meet all of them so that was why I chose those um Jay or Saida do you want to talk a bit about your experiences you don't have to <laughs> but I mean I feel like you kind of covered it with kind of ticking all the boxes I honestly wish I'd put more thought into my application um into like which college I was gonna end up at and I feel like I've just kind of hit the jackpot with Hartford because it really does kind of tick every box from like the fact that the accommodation is like on site in first year and then super close to you know the center for the rest of the years um a lot of colleges even bigger ones don't have the kind of that kind of location accommodation wise um and the fact that it has a cat um is very close to my heart because I have a cat at home so that's really nice um and again like it's just the people at Hartford the people are wonderful um 
I think Charlotte was saying earlier as well, but like the staff are really, are really great. Um, they're just, they're just so kind and caring. Um, and the welfare support Hartford offers is fantastic. So yeah, super glad that I lucked <laughs> out and ended up here. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I applied to a completely different college. Um, and then when I was invited for my interviews, I think the college that I applied to was oversubscribed. So I did my interviews at Hartford and I stayed at Hartford uh, for my interviews. And I didn't really know anything about the college, but it's where I got my offer from. And now I literally can't see myself anywhere else. And uh, similar to what Jay was saying, there are things that I just didn't consider when I was choosing a college and things that I just love about Hartford, like the down to earth community and how friendly it is and how central it is. All of these things are so important to me and I didn't think about them when I was choosing a college. So honestly, I couldn't be more glad to be at Hartford right now. Um, yeah, I just really like it. Um, yeah, it's a great college. Um, so yeah, like do have a, like, have a browse of different colleges, but I think most people do love the college they end up in at the end, so, yeah. I remembered another of my criteria, which is that I wanted, coming from a state school, I wanted to go to a college that had quite a lot of people from state schools. So Hartford has always had a really good reputation for that. And in the incoming freshers, there's over 80% of them are from state schools. So Hartford's really good on access and stuff like that, which I liked. Um, okay, next question is, What's inside the bridge? This is like top secret half of information. Does anyone want to talk about the really disappointing inside of the bridge? <laughs> what do you mean, Karina? It's, it's, it's great inside. We love the bridge. Um, steps. This is... uh, steps which are very safe because they've, they've painted like yellow high-vis lines on them. Um, a portrait. Uh, <laughs> Some nice, uh, some nice beans, some nice like Tudor beans in the middle, but yeah, it's basically- I know that there's, oh, sorry, I didn't interrupt you. I know that there's a photo of the inside of the bridge on the Hartford Instagram. Um, <laughs> so check out the Hartford Instagram for we'll just the behind apply the scenes. To Hartford. If you apply to Hartford, then you can come and see the bridge for yourself because it's only open to Hartford members, which is- And then you get to photobomb all the tourists who are taking photos yeah. in front of the bridge. Exactly. Big perk. The first time I went there, like, I like drew impressions week, and I, I had to get someone. I was like, go, go, go down and take a picture of me, like hanging out the window. And so I'm like, <laughs> open the window. I was like, ha. Ah. <laughs> and it's like one of my favorite photos now because it's just great. <laughs> oh, basically the, the bridge is good. Um, so we've got a question about uh, sort of like extracurricular things. Um, saying, I know Hartford doesn't have a performance space. Can you go to other colleges and use theirs? Uh, as in, is there a central drama or performance society? Also just Hartford. So we'll, okay, we'll talk about drama first and then we'll do the second part of the question. Um, as far as I know, yes. So I think the way it works is most people will get involved with individual, like smaller student drama companies societies which all come under the Oxford University Drama Society and then you can put on your performance pretty much anywhere that will take you which includes other colleges performance spaces so for example Keeble has a theatre I think that you can um, do performances in there and then there's also like the Oxford Playhouse which is a, like Oxford Theatre and various other smaller commercial venues where students can put performances on as well. Um, Lots so of open air that. stuff as well in the summer, which is lovely. Yeah. Um, one of my close friends was in a, a in a a musical that we went to see in like the grounds of Queen's College, which was really really nice. Um, and they do a lot of like open air Shakespeare and things like that in the summer when it's nice weather. Um, and that can be a really really nice way to to spend an evening or spend an afternoon. The Hartford <laughs> performance of Mamma Mia, the parody of Mamma Mia, is still the best drama I've seen in Oxford. <laughs> so good it's so good you know i'm not gonna not to be dramatic but i actually cried at the end you know and they were like thank you for i was like oh my god this is so much <laughs> when charlotte was leaving i was like oh no <laughs> anyway sorry Jay, i interrupted you <laughs> no i was gonna make that point i was gonna say how good <laughs> mama mia was good amazing um so basically, if you want to get involved in drama, there's loads and loads of ways you can do that. Um, 
And so the second bit of their question was, also does Hartford have a newspaper or magazine that people can write for? Do we have that? Apart from <laughs> Simpkin? <laughs> yeah, we have like, um, we have like, Sim we have the Simpkin, which is the college cat. There's like a little, it's like a, it's probably more like a newsletter really, rather than like a proper magazine. But it's basically <laughs> just like college news, overheard, things that have been overheard in the college or like little bits and pieces some in jokes around the college community things like that um but then there is so many so many things that you can get involved with like writing for across like the uni so there's like Cherwell um Sage is probably the one to ask about this actually um no I don't actually write for any of the newspapers <laughs> but there are loads of newspapers at Oxford that you can write for like I know a lot of people who do editorial and stuff for that like that so if you're interested in journalism it's really good. Um, yeah. Sorry, Charlotte. <laughs> I've written um, a few articles this year for, for the trio well. And um, so they give you, so they post submissions on um, like ideas for like articles on Facebook. And then you can like take like a pitch if you like. And then you, 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 you pitch your idea to the editor and they say whether or not they, they're interested in featuring your your article but you can also think up some original ideas and then write articles based on that like I did I did a bit of like a biography on on Django Reinhardt and like you can really do whatever you want really and it's great because um because I think it gives you um a lot of like critical skills that I like, could really useful especially like in essay writing and stuff as well but it's also a generally enjoyable writing about 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 what you like but yeah there are loads of different uh, publications and there's also um one called the isis which is where um you can also submit um various kind of more artistic pieces and like poetry and that kind of thing and the chill also has a section called the source where you can also submit like any kind of original work and that kind of thing so articles and also other forms of writing are widely accepted and and are celebrated in oxford and on that note um, in terms of like creative stuff um hartford has its own kind of like um art <laughs> like um kind of blog kind of i don't really know how to describe it it basically essentially goes around in an email pardon yeah the yeah the the whatever it's called <laughs> essentially people just submit like all of their arty stuff that they've got up to um whether it be like creative writing or like actual like art or any kind of rendering um and that goes around like every month or so so that's something to get involved in as well Oh, so yeah, basically there's a million extracurricular opportunities you can get involved in at uni and you definitely should. Um, so, so just you've got, so, yeah. So, sorry, just as I know, I, I just wanted to mention that we've also got the um, um, the alternative prospectus, which involves, which which actually includes like many of these, of this kind of thing. Um, I believe it's on the website. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that's definitely worth a look if you're also interested in the extracurricular side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can find that on the Harvard website. Um, so please keep submitting your questions. You've got 18 minutes. Is that right, Matt? No, that's not very good. 18 minutes left to ask us any questions for the, it's the end of the open day. Um, and so do submit questions through the Harvard College page on the Oxford Open Day website, um, or you can go to tiny.cc forward slash ask Hartford and submit them at the same place. Um, Okay, we have a Simpkin related question. I heard the college cat is quite a character. Can you talk a little more about them? Who wants to take this one? <laughs> Jay, you, you I'll, I'll take. I'll take it. Um, he's wonderful. Once he's got his chair, like in the library, you, you really don't want to move him off that chair. You want to wheel yourself a new chair because um, he's not a fan of being picked up, but he likes gentle cuddles um he likes posing for photos um he's a bit of a scrappy cat but he's just he's so sweet oh, such a big cat person <laughs> once he sat once I spent like the entire day in the library and he sat asleep on a chair next to me for the whole time I was like that's the life that's what I want to be doing but <laughs> I've had him track mud over my cheat sheet so many times <laughs> He also loves the printer I've found. So like if ever you need to print anything off, 
he just sat there like, nope, not right now. Wait till later. <laughs> uh, yeah, Simkin is great. Simkin is, and some of the other colleges have cats, I think, but none of them are as good as Simkin, and he will fight you over that as well. I mean, it's an impression. It's an impressive lineage as well, isn't he? Like Simkin the sixth, fourth, fifth. Oh, I don't know. There we go. <laughs> it, yeah. It's still an impressive lineage. Mm, definitely. Um, okay, so we have we had a couple of questions, uh, like what's the best thing about Hartford, which we've kind of already touched on, so uh, probably won't go into too much detail again, but they were also asking what's the best part of Oxford, which I think means what's the best part about Oxford rather than part of Oxford, but if that's wrong, then please clarify whoever asked that question. Um, and another question saying, what's the best thing about being a student at Oxford? So if we can sort of combine those and maybe what they think's the best thing about studying here at Oxford rather than Hartford specifically. Saida, so or George, yeah? Go for it. Uh, for anyone. <laughs> um, okay, so what I love about being at Oxford, obviously you get um, sort of the leading academics in your field and that's such a privilege to be able to study with those people. Um, I also love the fact that we have so many different libraries. I love a bit of library hopping, um, so that's also <laughs> great. And just Oxford as a town, like I absolutely love it. Like it's such a pretty place to be in. And we have so many independent coffee shops, which I don't have around where I live. So all of those things just make it like an amazing city and university to be in for me. What I really enjoy about Oxford as a place is, is um, it's where kind of old and new kind of meet each other. So you'll be walking next to like really old buildings and like studying in like really old libraries. But then, you know, then you'll go from like the, the Radcam, which is like a really old, very traditional library, and then walk to, to the Social Sciences Library where it's all glass, and it's all modern, and, and like there's a really nice cafe and stuff. So I really like the fact that it's where old meets new and it's where kind of kind of like the old meets like invention and like and like new kind of research and that kind of thing. I really, I really like that that aspect about it. Um, but and I also think that that Oxford has a great a student body, a very proactive a student body that 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 really like in, enjoys and, and relishes in engaging in like a progressive um, in um, a progressive um, discourses and like and like really enjoys um, kind of that side of things. And also there's some amazing talks and the language faculty is 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 excellent. So that's what kind of swayed it for me. I think it's like um, uh, going off from what George says there, you know, uh, I would say the intensity and I would say that it's, it's a bit of a double edged sword because, um, you know, the best things about Oxford is probably the intensity and the <laughs> worst thing about Oxford is also probably the intensity. Um, but it's it's that thing of like, yes, OK, you have a lot of uh, deadlines or you have a lot of kind of, um, you know, academic yeah. stuff going on. But at the same time, you have so much going on socially in terms of extracurriculars, talks, seminars, things to get involved with. It's just a hub. And so everything always feels like, you know, all, all people who live in Oxford always say like, oh, as soon as the students leave, it's like, it just feels so strange like it's just a ghost town and I've been there um my sister happens to live there now and so when I've been outside of term time walking through the the like high street and not seeing it as you know it's just so strange and I think you know when every during term time everyone is doing everything you know people are doing sports people are doing academic things outside of their subject people are doing drama music all of these things that are going on you know the Bodleian and the university itself are putting on events and talks um and so yeah I would say you know it's a uh, as I say it's it's two two-sided but it's definitely the best thing Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with all of that. I think I'd also add like the amount of opportunities you get studying at Oxford to meet incredible people, to um, to kind of push yourself to your academic kind of limits. I mean, I, I know that I really benefit from kind of the environment where everyone's kind of passionate and super hardworking, because um, I think that also brings out the best in me. Um, 
and I think also the fact that the city is you know it's it's a proper kind of city like there's there's nightlife there's um great pubs and bars there's great um sports pitches and like it just it's kind of everything you want except in a very like kind of accessible kind of package um if that if that makes sense um and yeah I, I don't know I think probably the best thing about being a student at Oxford is like like Charlotte said the fact that it's it's intense academically but it's also like the friendships you build there end up being so strong because of that um and you know it pushes you so yeah, yeah. I would say as well the one thing the one thing that really sets it apart, I would say, from other universities, perhaps, is um, the support and the person, like the personable nature of the teaching. Um, obviously, you know, with Cambridge, it has a similar system in terms of their supervisions, um, and we have it with tutorials where you're having direct contact with your tutors. But that doesn't just, uh, you know, that extends beyond, um, you know, academic interaction. That you know extends to there's you know Oxford has its own counselling service which is incredibly um like uh, accessible you know it's not something that you would have to wait and wait and wait for it's something that they, that they place a lot of emphasis on and getting help you know GPs have uh you know GP surgeries have aligned colleges so I know that Hartford is aligned um with a um a GP surgery on on Beaumont Street and they set aside a couple of hours a week specifically to see students for you know health you know health um reasons and things like that we have you know college nurses across across oxford most colleges will have their own nurse um have their own welfare support and and you know people to talk to and that is something that i know when i speak to other people at, at different universities that is not something that they have you know the privilege of 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 accessing um, and it's something that's really really important i think um during during your studies yeah, I definitely think, I mean, I agree with what everyone said. I think for me, I really like the fact that everyone's kind of, you know, here to learn. Everyone's just interested in learning things like the students and the staff, really, um, the t teachers. Um, but like not in a weird, nerdy way and the way that everyone thinks Oxford is like, it's not like that. Everyone's actually very normal. They just like learning things. Um, so I like that. And I also have really enjoyed the extracurricular things that I've been able to do as a result of coming here. Um, so next question. We've got like quite a few questions to get through before the end of our session. So if everyone can keep their answers pretty short, then hopefully we can get through all of them. Um, so we'll go for what tips would you give for UCAS personal statements and the interview process as a whole? So everyone can give like their top tip for the application process. Yeah. Um, who wants to go first? Anyone? Uh, yeah, I'll write about or, and talk about things that you are actually passionate about, even if you don't think that that's something, it's really, like, it's something really academic. Like I always love giving this example. I wrote about young adult novels in my personal statement and talked about them with my um, tutor during the interview. And it was just such a great conversation. So things that you wouldn't, you think, oh, that's not really suited to an Oxford application write about them because it is about you and the application is very much personal to you and they want to see that. Um, I think for the, oh, sorry. Um, I think for the personal statement spe specifically is I suggest start early and just write everything. Like even, even like, um, even if uh, to begin with, it's like two and a half pages because you've like, you know, um, because you've you've waffled about 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 this one experience you had or, or that kind of thing, just write everything down to begin with, and then after that, start to refine it, start to make subtle changes that kind of create it, a, a kind of a transform it into into um, into a really succinct and a really passionate piece of writing. Um, I don't I don't think you necessarily have to you know have an amazing first liner or 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 like a brilliant end line. I think it's just about like. From my experience, from 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 doing it a couple of years ago, I just say write everything down and then fine tune it to pick the bits that you're most passionate about that you enjoy, 
you know, maybe mention a book or like a work experience you did or, or, or anything like that. And then, yeah, but start big and then like refine it until it is what it needs to be. Um, and start early. That, that's what I'd recommend. Yeah, when I was doing mine, I wrote a mind map of like all the things that I'd done. And then that was really helpful for planning and thinking about like everything that I could possibly include and then cutting it down. Jade, were you going to say something? I was just going to say for the interview, I, I know I said this earlier, but, um, you know, what the tutors aren't, they aren't looking for the most like smart person who knows everything before the tutorial. They're looking for people who are going to benefit from like a tutorial style learning environment. So if it's the kind of tutorial where like, you feel like you've gained a lot from it or kind of interview where you, you feel like you've gained a lot from it then that will probably reflect well on you as like maybe a student here so I think you know remember the fact that they are looking for people who are going to be good in tutorials and yeah that's kind of more what they're looking for than knowing everything off the gate. Yeah my, t my top tip would probably be if you think it in the interview just say it like as much as you possibly can you know as far as you possibly can try and leave your inhibitions at the door and just if you think it when they ask you something or when they say something just say it whether it be a question whether it be something that you you know have just has kind of popped into your head just say it they're not going to judge you they're not going to do anything other than encourage you more or answer the questions that you might have yeah my tip for that I always give people about the interviews is not to let yourself be put off by anything that the interviewers might do because in my interview they didn't give any indication of whether I'd like said the right thing or anything so I was just like giving them ideas and they were being like yes that's right or no that's wrong and I was like what does this mean but I had sort of been told to like be what you know aware that might happen and that they might like it's not that they're not trying to put you off it's just because they want to see what you're thinking you know um so you have to not let that get to you, basically, and be, know that that might happen before you go into the interview. And it's just a weird thing about the of interviews, I think. I also think um, when I when I was um, when my interview was approaching, I was um, I was searching online a fair bit about like you know what's it like, you know what's what's included and that kind of stuff. Just kind of get get a picture in my head what it was like before I went because um, in my school there was no kind of like mock interview or anything like that. So. I, I kind of really had to find it out for myself and um you hear loads of like horror stories online about like how someone like you know um you know said this or, or like or, like did this in an interview and and um I just wouldn't pay attention to them personally because they are like in the vast majority of cases like those things just don't happen and won't come up or and they all uh, also you tend to get people who kind of sensationalize certain like comments made or or like or like certain um or like um certain questions that that are out of context however within the context of the interview they would often make make a lot of sense in terms of like you know um like random questions you might hear like um so yeah um as they don't actually do that much online research apart from like sources like like the Hartford website or the or the oxford university website because there can be a lot of kind of um yeah of, of that kind of thing really where where people um kind of um kind of create like stories or like you know from 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 in interview scenarios so definitely use the you know trusted sources well cool. thanks everyone um so we've got a question about where do people prefer to prefer to work uh library or your room or wherever i just think i think i'll answer that really quickly um and then we can move on to like the last few questions um I'd say that it really depends and varies per person um, and so some people will work there's over 100 libraries in Oxford so if you want to work in a library you definitely can and you can vary it like every day if you want to um, that includes the Hartford College Library and also a bunch of other libraries that are right next to Hartford um, or you can work in your room or you can work you could like book out a room in college and work with your friends there or I do a lot of working in cafes because I can buy myself um, drinks as a reward when I I'm feeling sad so would recommend that as well um but basically you just got to find what works for you after like a the few weeks first few weeks I suppose um okay so now we're going to answer this question what was the hardest part of your first month or so at uni did it feel hard to break into a friendship group does anyone want to start 
I um, think that oh sorry um <laughs> I, I was just gonna say um I think that um like the nature of the college system means that you're constantly bumping bumping into the same people all the time whether you walk into a lecture or like you're 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 in the corridor or like down the bar or like anywhere like that so I think making friends wasn't too much of of an of an issue for me in, in that sense because you're always around a similar group, group of people um I think what 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 was hardest for me was adapting to the workload and kind of like managing and managing my time but I think everyone gets into into the swing of things after a few weeks and, and then everyone manages just to kind of like find a balance and find a routine that works for them there's no like quick fix or, or like like quick uh, adjustment I think it takes time for everybody really I think the, the hardest bit for me, um, obviously George has gone into the friend kind of side of it, but the hardest bit for me in terms of getting used to life academically down there was uh, pretty much just like learning how to organise shoot work. Like it's such a different way of learning, but they know that, you know, so like don't let it worry you if you say start um, at any university for that matter. I mean, but especially Oxford, if you start and you're like I don't really know what they want from me they've asked me this question or they've sent me this piece of work and I'm not really sure like it's okay to wing it like I've never really written massive scientific essays do you know what I mean like I've never had to do that really do you know what I mean I'm like essays science doesn't make sense but it's the first thing they ask you to do and you just learn super quickly and they will put you right if you're going wrong but most of the time if you just go with your gut they're going to be fine about it anyway Yeah, I think that um, it's definitely similar to what you said. You just, it can be weird, like hard to adjust to the new style of sort of university learning, um, but you definitely do. I know for geography, you kind of, people seem to either have done like lots of sciences or lots of humanities um, at A level before coming to geography. So I did lots of humanities and then I got here and I was like going to be doing statistics and I was like, oh my God, what? Um, but because I've done loads of humanities, I was so done, I was so okay with writing essays that I was like, yeah, I can do that. Um, and then for people who'd come from a more sciencey A level background, they had didn't, you know, weren't so fresh on how to write an essay, um, but they were better probably on the math stuff. So everyone's got their and like the geography department basically assumes that you don't have to do any of it, so they just teach you everything. Um, so it doesn't really matter where you're coming from you can still learn. And on the friends thing, um, I think that actually the college system at Oxford makes it really easy to make friends, potentially easier than at a non-collegiate university, um, because the college will organise loads of events for freshers, which basically force you to make friends with people. And, you know, you can, you're all living like on a corridor together or whatever, so it's really easy to make friends that way. Um, and if you go to extracurricular things, then you meet people who are like you and like some of the things. There's literally so many opportunities. And I mean, I was definitely apprehensive about it, but it wasn't an issue for me. Um, okay, so I think this is gonna be the last question that we answer because we're at the end of our time. So please don't submit any more questions. I'm really sorry, we won't be able to answer them. Um, this question is, are there many LGBTQ plus students at the college? I know there's a club um, for the whole university, but I was just wondering what it would be like at the actual college. Jay. <laughs> yes, I can tell you. Um, yeah, so I think on our like little like secret Facebook group, at the moment we have nearly 70 people and the college is about 600 people, so 10%. Um, engineering. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but yeah, so like every week um, events are kind of, we kind of do like weekly bar things like Charlotte um, and it is really involved in the bar. And like, so we have like LGBT specific nights run in the bar. Um, and then, so like, I think a year or two ago there was LGBT history month. So we had like lots of speakers come in. Um, Hartford also hosts the trans remembrance service every year which is um which is awesome in the chapel so yeah a good a good body of lgbt students at hartford and a good range of events so yeah top-notch community does anyone else really think they want to add no 
Cool. Well, that brings us to the end of our session and the end of the Q and A's today. I think. Um, I don't think there's another uh, admissions one. So, thank you very much to everyone who's come. If you have any more questions about um, Hartford, you can look on the Hartford College YouTube channel um, or the website there, and you can watch all the videos that have been put together by students and they will tell you so many things about accommodation and about all the different subjects and literally whatever. And you can also get in touch with the college directly to ask any questions. Um, you can talk to the admissions people and things like that. So if we haven't answered your question or you think of more questions, then do do that and go there and find out more. Um, and yeah, if you're gonna apply then good luck. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.